I'll just ask. Great. Great. Um, that when we start these um, when we start these presentations, we we uh, we're, they're planning on answering the questions at the end. And I know how you know we we like to ask questions, and I think it's a good thing. But we'll we'll save our questions I think to the end of each presentation. So if you got a piece of paper, jot your questions down and ask those at the end of each one of these. Um, presentations. I think that'll help move it forward uh, without uh, um, us going going down some some trails. So um, I guess with that said, does anybody have any changes? Make any changes? Okay. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Moved by uh, Representative Summers, seconded by uh, Tony to approve the agenda. Any discussion? Okay, hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion passes. So we're gonna we're gonna jump right into these, and 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 we're a little early. Everybody here, Cy? Yep. Okay. So we'll start right in with. Um, I'll, I'll just turn it over to you, Cy. Okay. We got the slideshow up top. Uh, we're in. Yeah. Uh, we're in the middle of the So the other thing I'm not also sure size, we may have to get you or, or whoever's going to speak might have to get a, a microphone so that folks online can hear. Um, okay, great. No, I think I, I think we all appreciated reading the, uh, the, the, the discussion. It was, it was a good discussion. All right, we're still pulling it up. They can see it online, they just you can't see it here yet. Okay. Or you send that back to my personal email. The link for <coughs> Thanks, Jennifer, for all the information we got on the uh, non-resident and resident license, uh, landowner license stuff. That was great, as usual. Uh, Pat, thanks a lot for all the defining of, of all the other stuff and the red line things that you worked through. Appreciate all that help. So. I did notice one change real quick on the, uh, I asked Jennifer, we only issue, and this is a bit B on the non-resident, or sorry, resident elk landowner licenses, isn't this one with the yellow on it? Carry 123, um, only issues a type one license every other year. And so in 2020, when there was a type one license, there were 84, there were 84 resident licenses and 17 of those went to landowners. So give that percentage. And 
The only other changes in that were area 116 in 2020, there were no landowner licenses issued. And in, in area 106, um, yeah, 106, there were, in 2020, there was, there was only, there was only one landowner issue bag resident. And uh, I was looking, well, we were, I was looking, um, so area 116, 2020, had a type one license, but there were no landowner tags. Welcome everybody. We're going to get started here. And our first speaker is going to be from New Mexico, uh, Carrie Romero, right after I'm going to give you a little preview. <laughs> so as this task force has progressed for the last almost a year, one of the things that keep coming up, and it, it's repeated in numerous uh, newsletters, electronic newsletters by uh, some resident sportsmen, it's been testified in front of this committee on multiple occasions. And all of our Western states, all of our neighbors issue their licenses on that 90-10 formula. And so we've, we've taken that patiently for the last year, nice and quiet. And today's our day to show you that that's not true. And so we wanted to bring this together today in, in conjunction with how the other states, our neighbors, treat their outfitting industry. And what kind of things have they done to make sure that that part of their tourism economy, which is a very important part of all of our Western states tourism economy, how they take care of the athlete industry in that particular state. It's all different. Everybody has a different formula. As we, we are going to ask that Wyoming take a look at a formula too, but it would be different than what, what they do in New Mexico or Montana or Idaho. So our, our presenters today are uh, members of what we call the Professional Outfitters and Guides Association. So we have a national umbrella organization called POGA, Professional Outfitters and Guides of America. Uh, and the states that have uh, outfitting industries are all members of this national organization. It's under the umbrella of Safari Club International. I'm the current chairman of that organization. And so we've built relationships with these states. They're all members of POGA. And therefore they were more than willing to come and help us explain how their states work. So with that, I'm going to have uh, Ms. Kerry Romero come up, who's the Executive Director for the New Mexico Council of Outfitters and Guides, to talk about the great state of New Mexico and how they do things. Kerry? Good morning. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the task force. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. So, Mike, sorry, sorry, I'm okay. over the mic. Um, it's not a surprise that, I mean, do we? Okay. Looks like maybe. Sorry. Sorry, ran it out of battery already. <laughs> There. Testing. There you go. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the task force. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Carrie Cox Romero. I'm the executive director and lead lobbyist for the New Mexico Council of Outfitters and Guides. I am a born and raised New Mexican, but I do have connections to Wyoming. My brother went to the University of Wyoming, spent three years in Laramie, and I do have family in Casper, so I feel very comfortable with you all. I find New Mexico and Wyoming to be similar in a lot of ways, uh, but then also different because of the mountains. Can you hear me without it? Yes. Okay. We, we can. We can. We can. The problem it comes when um, we're tr we have folks on the right. line, and so yeah. we'll we'll right. we'll get you a wireless here one. You can either put the headset on or um, hold it however you'd like. <laughs> 
does not go through my nerves. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> You're fine. You can eat a little bit before you can yeah. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. What I was going to say is that New Mexico and Wyoming are similar in a lot of ways land mass compared to population density, but it is far more green here. You have more water and your mountains are not on fire. So I am really enjoying being here today. Uh, like the other organizations that are here with me today, the New Mexico Council of Outfitters and Guides is a nonprofit association that advocates the outfitting industry in the state of New Mexico. We are also the only organization that advocates the rights of non-resident sportsmen to hunt and fish in the state of New Mexico. Do you want? me to just signal you to change the slides or that'll probably work. So go for it. You can move to the next one. New Mexico has a very diverse hunting industry. Our big game populations are not gigantic in terms of numbers. For example, we only have approximately 70,000 elk statewide and roughly 100,000 deer. But we have more variety here. Go to the next slide, actually. I think these two slides are flip-flopped. We have more variety of uh, huntable big game species than any other state in the lower 48. This is because we have three species of exotic big game that were introduced into our state in the 1960s as a way, as an experiment, basically, to um, see if other desert big game could survive in the United States if they were to be going extinct in other countries. So we have uh, African oryx or gemba gemsbok, African audad, and we call them Barbary sheep, and Persian ibex. And they are free ranging, just like our native species. And their populations are controlled by the Department of Game and Fish through uh, hunting, just like all of our native species. Um, go back to the last slide. New Mexico's hunting industry differs from Wyoming in terms of numbers of resident hunters compared to our overall state population. Our state is fifth largest in the U.S. for land mass, but, and we rank 46th in population density, but our uh, resident hunters consist of just 4.7% of the overall population. Our overall population is 2.1 million. But like Wyoming, our state agency is completely dependent on the sale of non-resident licenses to generate revenue to adequately fund wildlife conservation. Also similar to Wyoming is our land landowner status. New Mexico is approximately 50-50 when it comes to public and private land. Private landowners are the stewards of a very large amount of wildlife habitat. Private landowners are also responsible for maintaining many of the water resources for our wildlife. In New Mexico, our water sources are very, very scarce. So ranchers with livestock wells are vital to the survival of our big game. New Mexico simply would not have the wildlife disbursement that we currently have without the efforts of our private landowners. Our Department of Game and Fish recognizes this and uh, they facilitate partnership with the landowners for further conservation efforts through transferable hunting permits. You can go to the next slide. Next one, there you go. Okay, so New Mexico's hunting industry is broken into two basic segments, public land and private land. Public land hunting licenses are awarded through a straight lottery draw. We do not utilize a point system. Point systems really confuse me, uh, but we do have a resident non-resident quota that applies to all public draw hunts. The private land segment is essentially equal opportunity. Private land deer and elk, or deer and pronghorn, excuse me, are over the counter unlimited and elk licenses are authorized through transferable permits, which can be sold on the open market. Next slide. The public land hunting opportunities are available for all New Mexico big game species and public land hunts are only available for bighorn sheep and ibex. So bighorn sheep and ibex do not reside on private land basically at all. Like I mentioned previously, we have a quota that is applied to the public land draw hunts under the quota system. At least 84% of the hunts available in any hunt code go to a New Mexico resident hunter. 10% are reserved for hunters who are contracted with a certified outfitter, and these hunters can be resident or non-resident. 
10 percent or six the remaining six percent are awarded to non-resident hunters or diy do it yourself additionally by statute 100 percent of all of the public land cow elk permits are resident only and 100 percent of the wildlife management area permits are also resident only next slide so private land hunting opportunity does not operate under a quota system at all it's equal opportunity the opportunity is available for residents and non-residents equally the only thing that prevents a resident from purchasing a permit is just the cost of the permit deer pronghorn javelina turkey and predator hunting also a handful of orcs hunts are all available on private land and uh, but we are most well known for our transferable uh elk hunting license permit system which is referred to as e plus stands for elk private land use system it's been around for over 40 years and it has been extremely successful in providing private landowners with a way to recoup the costs associated with providing for wildlife without placing an additional financial burden on our state wildlife agency thank you this is perfect Um, New Mexico's constitution, we actually have an anti-donation clause and that prevents our game and fish from providing direct monetary compensation to landowners for dealing with wildlife damages. So E plus is our way of bridging this gap. Landowners must apply for the E plus program. They're awarded permits based on a matrix that establishes the benef beneficial use of their property. The matrix looks at critical aspects such as water, cover, forage, some folks have been critical of the E plus program, but the vast majority of people who understand how it works and why it functions recognize the mutual benefits of the system, uh, mutual benefits to hunters, outfitters, landowners, and especially wildlife. Most land, let's see, most landowner elk permits are restricted to the deeded acreage associated with the private land. We call those ranch only permits. However, about 15% of the E plus permits are issued as unit wide. Unit wide permits can be sold on the open market and can be used in any public land on any public land within the game management unit. The unit wide system gets a lot of criticism from individuals who don't understand its purpose and they feel that these permits are unfair. But you have to remember that the E plus system was originally established to facilitate partnership between wildlife agencies and private landowners, and it was created as a system to incentivize conservation. So unit wide permits are often given to landowners that have like critical calving grounds, but are void of elk during the hunting season or are very small properties providing essential water resources. Unit wide ranches are also required to open their deeded land to all public land elk hunters. Next slide. So, this slide is not the right slide. Okay, this slide gets to the nitty gritty of the public land and private land. I, I guess it, it kind of com combines both. Uh, I only illustrated the numbers for elk, deer, and pronghorn because it seemed like that was what you guys focus on here in Wyoming. So here you can see that on the public land side of the permit allocation process, New Mexico is basically a 90-10, which might seem confusing since earlier on, I said that our quota is 84-16 or 84-10-6 roughly. Um, but when you add back in the resident only cow elk permits and the resident only wildlife management area permits, and then you also have to account for any hunt code with less than 10 permits is going to go all to resident hunters and so there's about 25 percent of hunt codes that all go to resident hunters across all different species when you when you add that back in we are basically 90 10 on the public land side i do not advocate for a 90 10 split between residents and non-residents a 90 10 quota hamstrings, non-resident opportunity, and thus negatively impacts the outfitting industry. And the outfitting industry is an extremely important economic contribution to mostly rural communities within the state. The only reason that, a, that 
on our public land side, a 90-10 quota works in New Mexico is because we have a very well-established private land hunting segment, which is equal opportunity. Prices are set by the open market on the private land side. And for elk, that means the cost of the permit includes, uh, I'm sorry, for over-the-counter deer and pronghorn, you have to pay an additional trespass fee on the private land side. The elk E plus system encompasses that trespass fee. So the market sets the price for the permit. The permit includes the trespass fee to the private land. So basically what you can see by this slide is that we don't have a strictly 90-10 across the state. When you add back in the private land side and the public land side, you'll see that it varies by species. Um, for elk, we are roughly 70-30. For deer, it is roughly 90-10. But that is not because non-residents are prevented from purchasing permits on the private land side. It's simply because they don't. For whatever reason, non-residents don't seem to purchase landowner deer permits. On the pronghorn side, it's roughly 50-50. So it really just depends on the species. And then, and it's very important that you look at the overall, uh, the overall tag allocation between the public and the private land. Okay, next slide. Okay, so these slides I'm gonna go over rather quickly. They illustrate uh, kind of the economic side of the, of the previous slides that I was talking about. So we're gonna start here with elk. You can see on the left side that the number of uh, licenses that were issued in 2021 across both the public and the private land segment, as you can see, non-resident licenses uh, uh, compass roughly a third of the total elk licenses issued. But on the right, you can see the revenue generated by these licenses. In New Mexico, resident hunters pay less than $100 for a mature bull tag. Non-residents pay over 700. It's actually 773. So the revenue generated by non-residents is substantial. Nearly 80% of the total revenue generated in elk is derived from non-resident hunters. Next slide. Same with deer. The graphic on the right shows that even though 87% of deer licenses go to resident hunters, over 50% of the revenue is generated by non-residents. Next slide. Same with pronghorn. Even though 46% of the total licenses are issued to non-residents, over 80% of the total revenue generated is from non-residents. Did I say that right? 46% go to residents, 80% of the revenue from non-residents. Okay, next slide. Okay, here's the total. This slide illustrates licenses from all big game species, small game and predators. But it's clear that despite that the most of the hunting opportunity is allocated to New Mexico residents, the overwhelming majority of the revenue is generated by non-residents. To take away even a very small percentage of non-resident opportunity and give it back to the residents, would have a substantial negative impact on the Department of Game and Fish's ability to maintain their current level of conservation efforts. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this, I wish this slide had been more towards the front, but that's okay. So this, this slide is illustrating the economic contributions of transferable landowner permits. So I, I talked about how we have an anti-donation clause within our constitution that prevents the Department of Game and Fish from issuing monetary compensation to landowners who are dealing with wildlife damages. So the E plus program bridges that gap. Our private land and E plus opportunities are what allows the outfitting industry to thrive in New Mexico. Outfitted clientele are predominantly non-resident and the private land segment is what allows the outfitting industry to thrive. Uh, so E plus generates over about hundred million dollars annually in supplemental income to landowners and is typically generated within our very rural communities. It's uh, all, all of this is tourism dollars. New Mexico's 
big game hunting is second largest in terms of um, outdoor recreation gross. We're just slightly behind skiing. So it's incredibly important. And there are lots of counties within New Mexico where 100% of their tourism base is big game hunting. So transfer, transferable landowner permits facilitate that and they are extremely important to our outfitting economy. Next slide. So this was kind of a 30,000 foot overview of the hunting industry and how it operates in the state of New Mexico. Every state is, has a unique set of circumstances and what works in one state is not necessarily going to work in another state. And I firmly believe that because New Mexico always gets compared to other states and drives me crazy. So I can understand how maybe Wyoming would feel the same way. But I do think that New Mexico has found a good balance um, between the interests of resident and non-resident hunters, public and private land ownership, and then recreation and what's in the best interest of the conservation of the species. So I'd be glad to answer any questions if you have any. Yes, sir. Uh, you said earlier that you wouldn't recommend the 90 10 and the 90 10 split, uh, but on the public land, you know, use your public land ag. What impact would that have if it was 90 10 on public land? What impact would that have on, on the outfitting base and that, and that, that transferable license or anything like that? Would it have much impact on that? So, Mr. Chairman, cl clarify for me what. What's your meaning? If because we already kind of have a 90-10 on the public land, that's not how the calculation is broken down through the hunt codes. When licenses are distributed, they're distributed 84% to residents and then 10 outfitter pools, 6% DIY, but you got to add back in the resident only cow so, outfit. Oh, 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 sorry. I'll ask another question. How, how much of your land do you know the public land is non-accessible? You know, that is a good question. We do have checkerboard land, especially on the eastern side of the state. Um, I don't think it's as high as people think it is. And the unit wide transferable landowner permit system actually does allow it opens approximately 500,000 additional acres that would not be accessible without that uh, E plus program. And that does provide access to some of those um, <clears throat> public lands that are prevented from access. But I, I think in general, New Mexico has fairly decent access to public land. And then I guess as just a follow up on the year, are your guys' private property laws similar to Wyoming where you don't have a public easement to that, so it's not accessible? Mr. Chairman, I don't know much about Wyoming's public access laws, but I would assume they function similar based on your description just now. So yeah, there would have to be some type of an easement through private land in order to access public land. But I will say that the, the unit-wide program does allow that easement. It creates that easement through private land so to public you land. Are, you are So if you are a public land hunter and you draw a permit in that game management unit, you can access all of the private land that is enrolled in the unit wide program. And that might also provide you additional opportunity to inaccessible public land. If you purchase a unit wide landowner permit, then you can hunt the public land within the game management unit as well as the private land. If that makes sense. Sure. Um, I'm not sure exactly how formal to be. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Gillen. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so our we have a 10% outfitter pool on our public land draw side. And it can be resident or non-resident, but it is primarily non-resident because most residents, why would you apply in the 10% outfitter pool if you're odds are better in the 84% pool. So primarily non-residents apply in the outfitter draw. It's been around for 20 years since the late 90s. And um, it 
it helps to facilitate outfitting on public land. It was originally established as a, a business incentive, basically, for to incentivize hunters to book with New Mexico outfitters as you know, kind of a business incentive. And that's the way it's functioned for a really long time. One of the kind of recent things that has happened with the outfitter pool is that it has kind of gotten polluted by some of like the larger, um, I guess you call them tag brokers or not really tag brokers, but license, hunting fool and Cabela's tags, uh, they, they apply a lot of people into the draw. And so that kind of saturates that. So drawing in the outfitter pool has been become more difficult in the past, I would say five years. And so that, that is one thing that as you guys are establishing potentially an outfitter draw, you might want to think about. Um, but for the outfitters that operate on public land, the outfitting pool has been really beneficial over the past 20 years. What are the rules when somebody draws this tag? What's the rules? So the way it works is uh, an outfitter will, or a hunter, you can apply to, you know, if you're, if you're a hunter and you like to apply yourself, then you book with an outfitter. You have to have a contract in place prior to the draw. So they book with an outfitter and they utilize that outfitter's number in their hunting application. And then uh, if you're drawn, then you must go with that outfitter, basically. So we have a little bit of a loophole that allows for some um, abuse of the system. A lot of outfitters wish that it was like fully guided for the entire time, but it has to be fully guided for 48 hours. The first 48 hours of the hunt that you draw. So if you draw a hunt that starts on Saturday, then you have to be with your outfitter for two full days for the first two full days of the hunt. And, and your, your hunt, you know, remainder is five days. Then you could hunt DIY for the remaining five. But if you are approached by a law enforcement officer in the field on those first two days and you're not with a guide, you will get a citation. So in relation to how New Mexico operates its outfit industry, how important is the private land, what percentage of Congress has used private land permits versus public land permits? And if you know, do you have that idea of this is a coverage of this is the state? Yeah, so if you go back, you, there there is a slide in there that says that. It's the one that kind of towards the middle. Keep going. <coughs> that that one. That next one. The one with the numbers. Go 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 two four or two or three forward. Keep going. One more. One more after this. Sorry. Okay. Yep. Back up. <laughs> okay. So the public draw licenses that were issued in 2021 were 24,232. 21,000 roughly of those went to New Mexico residents. 2,345 went to non-residents. That is spread across the outfitter pool and the non-resident DIY, which you could kind of break that into its own percentages to figure out what the difference is. But like I said, primarily non-residents apply in the outfitter pool. So it's predominantly non-residents. Um, and then on the private land side, there were 13,897 licenses issued. 3,537 of those went to New Mexico residents and non-residents accounted for 10,000. So in elk, and it differs by species, but at, in elk at least, non-residents make up the bulk of the private land permit sales, but they're restricted on the public <clears throat> land side because of the quota. If those are, those are not sold through the draw. The private land side, correct. They're equal opportunity. A resident or a non-resident can buy them just as easily. The price is set by the market and that's why 
more non-residents purchase tags than residents do. It's just probably a similar function of any state. <clears throat> non-residents are willing to pay a little bit more than residents generally. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I got a question on <clears throat> so the booking agent thing. I didn't know about this until recently. So in in New Mexico, if, if you're a whatever booking agent name you want, um, and you put into your your draw, are they applying as an outfitter, or are they applying, uh, or do their clients go to outfitters in the state? So are they considered an outfitter? How does that work? So they're, 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 they are applying as an outfitter within the state. So it, it's still going through a New Mexico registered outfitter, but they just apply so many is why it saturates the market basically. But how it works is an outfitter makes an agreement with the agent, Epic or Hunting Fool, whatever, you name it. And, um, and then Epic or I don't know if Epic does it actually, Hunting Fool will say, gets to use that outfitter's number. And all of the hunters are must sign a uh, limited durable power of attorney to that company in order to make it legal. And then they apply those hunters with that outfitter number that they have an agreement with. And so then when the hunter draws, then they can either go with that outfitter or if that outfitter is already fully booked, maybe there's an outfitter that's like second in line and then they will make the hunter sign the hunter and the outfitter because the hunter and the outfitter must sign a release form, all three parties and the new outfitter in order to transfer from one outfitter number to the other. I know that gets a little bit complicated, but I tried to explain it simply. The, the, like, uh, the booking agent. Yeah, I would say the last, I'm sure it's been around for a while, but I think the last five years it has exploded. And I'm not necessarily saying that it should stop, but it definitely saturates the pool. And so it makes it harder for an outfitter who maybe doesn't work with Cabela's or applies just you know when cabela's is applying a thousand guys and you're you know just regular outfitter is only applying 20 it makes it really hard so to draw a hunter. just to understand this a little bit more because i really don't know. so does the outfitter have to pay i'm not going to name the company but does the outfitter have to pay that company to be on their list and then i've heard that the hunter has to basically play pay the Booking agent as well. So are they taking money off both sides? I believe so, yes. I'm I'm not sure on the outfitter side. That might be a better question for an outfitter, but I think they do get a percentage. The agent does get a percentage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Pete? So basically you have some complicit outfitters Yeah, we do have some we do have some problems with that. And I would say that if you are establishing an outfitter pool, you should probably make it fully guided. We have had problems with the original reason that the 48 hour thing came into play was for drop camps. We wanted to be able to include drop camps as outfitters because they were providing like a vital uh, outfitter resource to individuals who are hunting in the wilderness. Uh, so that's the reason that the 48 hour thing exists, but it has become a, a loophole for um, outfitters to just, you know, basically do do two days and then their hunter is DIY the rest of the time and then they charge a whole lot less. And so I think the majority of outfitters, and there are some that would disagree with me strongly, but I think the majority of outfitters in the state of New Mexico would prefer that the pool be fully guided for the entire hunt. 
but and and going back to your point about the booking agent um there's a lot of outfitters and they're not necessarily you know bad outfitters they're they're good outfitters that just recognize the um positive aspects of dealing with a booking agent like cabela's and um but they they also see that it pollutes their draw odds so they're not necessarily they they utilize it because it's there but if it was prevented they wouldn't be upset if that makes sense right right but it, yeah mm -hmm. well yeah i mean it's difficult they can transfer from one outfitter to another Well, I mean, I don't know if they market the list per se. You can get a list of hunters that are successful or hunters that applied, but it's, I think, easier to just tap in to the resource that's already established by Cabela's or Hunting Pool. They already have a long list, so why go through all of the effort of figuring out who the hunters are when you can just become an outfitter associated with that. But they, but they recognize that it saturates the pool to do it that way. So I'm not sure that you should put safeguards up against that. I'm just saying that's something that, you know, within our outfitter pool, we have, we struggle with. And it's, Is a straight lottery draw. No. Yes. Seven dollars for resident, thirteen for non-resident, and they're non-refundable. And we also charge a non-refundable game hunting license fee, which is $85 for non-residents. I'm not sure what the cost is for residents. And so such as you say, these booking services are able to be able to bring them into the drawing pool. Yeah. That's generating income for New Mexico. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of non-refundable. Plus, plus the non-refundable game license fee. Yeah, agreed. I think it just, it saturates the pool. It was my point that it's applying maybe a lot more hunters than would normally be applied in the outfitter pool if the outfitter were completely responsible for applying all their hunters. Is that a bad thing? Maybe not. Yeah, it's definitely not a bad thing for Game of Fish. For the outfitting industry, it kind of, it, you have to apply a lot more hunters to draw the hunters that you need to draw for your, you know, in order to make your business model work. So it's a supply and demand problem. Right. I think you answered my question. Actually, okay. I just wanted to make sure. So other than, than making the draw odds more difficult in the outfitter pool, the total number of outfitted licenses has stayed the same, correct? Yes. Yeah. To do that. So we're still generating the revenue associated with the total number. Of yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just think, you know, like I said, probably more hunters are applying in the outfitter pool than would normally if there wasn't one company applying thousands of individuals at one given time. That, that trend um, different than what you're seeing in increased applications and non resident applications in general in New Mexico? No, we are seeing an increase across the board. Yeah. So potentially it could, it could be like that without the booking agents. Any other so, questions? So the eighty-five dollar potential license, they only pay that to draw or just to apply? It's non-refundable. Yeah, so it's just to apply. Which, of course, they could utilize it if if they wanted to, like for small game and whatnot. Uh, but they're not. In reality, non-resident is probably not going to come hunt small game in New Mexico if they don't draw out. Yes, sir. So if, if I can summarize on your initial public land draw, 6% are available to non-resident, 10% go into an outfitter pool, 84% to residents, right? Correct. 
And then additional to that, you have transferable private land licenses for all three elk deer land. Yes. And orcs, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Other species that I'm missing there? Barbary sheep. And barbary sheep. Mm -hmm. So those are, those are transferable in there. Yeah, so in, in Barbary sheep, deer, pronghorn, uh, those are unlimited over the counter if you're a landowner. Okay. So, you, you know, if, if a hunter wants to hunt on private land, they purchase a license and then they either purchase a trespass fee from the, from the private landowner or they have a private landowner buddy or they have an, an outfitter that they're dealing with that has private land leased. And, and then, so you have basically you have six to 10 and the 84 plus the additional unlimited landowner tags for some species, transferable landowner tags for some species L. It is also restrict non-residents to apply for wildlife management units. Mm -hmm. And what was the other one? Cow elk permits, all public land cow elk permits are resident only. Oh, nice. Caught me off guard with that one. Um, so there is a proposal in New Mexico right now to completely eliminate non-resident opportunity to hunt bighorn sheep. There are 50 bighorn ram permits that are issued in New Mexico and 43 of them go to resident hunters. Seven of them currently go to non-residents. And that's basically an 84-16 split. Um, and that's because, like I said, non-residents predominantly apply in the outfitter pool. So it's basically 84-16. Bighorn sheep are only located on public land and it's primarily federal land. So um, there is no landowner permit availability for bighorn sheep in New Mexico. So we are fighting very hard right now to save our non-resident hunter opportunity in bighorn sheep. And it's also important to note that since the Bighorn Sheep Conservation Program in New Mexico was established, non-residents have funded over 97% of that entire program, and they continue to fund over 97% of it annually. So to eliminate non-resident opportunity in the draw for Bighorn Sheep would be, in my opinion, an extremely bad idea for New Mexico to do. But there is that, that proposal that we are currently fighting. It's just a draw. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Yeah. So we have an anti donation clause that prevents our Department of Wildlife, our Game and Fish, from issuing monetary compensation. I think. Wyoming, I'm not positive, but I think you guys have a program where you issue monetary compensation to landowners for damages. We don't have that ability at all because we have.
book. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> mule deer and white tail separated. No. <laughs> I mean, kind of, but not. I mean, when I, if you want to apply for a deer, do you just apply for a deer, or do you apply for a mule deer or a white tail? Yeah, you, you just apply for deer, but we segment by hunt code, and I'm not sure you guys use the term hunt code, but basically if you, like, if you're going to hunt coos deer, basically, you're going to apply for that hunt code. And it's going to be a deer tag, but you're hunting coos deer because that's the hunt code. Or if you're white-tailed deer up in the northeast, then you're applying it under that hunt code and you know that it's a white-tailed deer. Okay, thank you. No problem. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Are you ready to pull the PowerPoint back up? All right. Next up is going to be Ash Tolley from Colorado. So Ash is an invited guest of ours. He is a current outfitter in the great state of Colorado. And uh, for how many years, Ash? I don't do math well. So since 2003. Uh, and he is also a board member of the Colorado Outfitters Association. Well, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Task Force, for inviting me. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Task Force, for inviting me. My name is Ash Tully. Like I said, I'm outfitter in Colorado for roughly 20 some years, but been in the industry for close to 30. Um, I am a member of the COA and on the board of directors for the COA. Let's go to our first slide. Since we're here today to talk about license allocation in the state of Colorado, roughly in, in uh, 2000, there was no allocation and it was pretty much a 50-50 split. And around 2005, the commission switched to now what we have today and that's what we're gonna start to see in the next slide. So Colorado has 80-20 resident, non-resident allocation for elk, deer, and antelope hunt, hunt codes requiring six or more preference points. And this comes from a three-year average in 2007, 2008, and 2009. And then we have an allocation of a 65-35 resident, non-resident allocation for elk, deer, and antelope hunt codes requiring five or less preference points on the same three-year average of 2007, 2008, and 2009. On the non-resident side, we have a soft cap. And soft cap basically means that non-residents are not guaranteed the minimum percentage of available licenses. Non-resident allocation can exceed the cap if there is insufficient first choice resident demand. So basically on the left-hand side, the resident side, they have a hard cap, so they draw them first. And then on the right-hand side, the non-resident side, is a soft cap, which means up to that percentage. And the division likes to use the term up to because up to could be nothing. It could be 20%. It could be 35%. So it's just a term used rather than the term hard cap. If they did, there was conversation on drawing non, non residents first, but in the end, we ended up with the soft cap on the non resident side. Next slide. So in our state, when you apply in our, in our draw, you are received one point gained for a first choice application that is unsuccessful for deer, elk, bear, pronghorn, turkey, or if the species preference point hunt code is entered as a first choice. As a first choice. Once a first choice license is drawn, all accumul accumulated points for that species are removed and become void. Points are not used to gain, gained or lost in the second through the fourth, fourth choices or in the secondary draw. Points are also not required to purchase a license over the counter or in the leftover reissue list. Next slide. Uh, this is kind of the stats uh, of 
the quotas per, of tags and then what's drawn, the percentage uh, points, and then once they're lost. But on the left, a resident, when you apply for in the draw, it basically begins, and I just started with elk because elk seems to be the primary species. Um, resident adult cost, 57.90 for the for the license, ten dollars and fifty nine cents for a habitat stamp, and then thirty one forty one. That's a, a qualifying license, and they started that program about two years ago, three years ago. So it puts you at ninety nine ninety for a resident, and then the ninety nine ninety times the application comes to five million nine hundred two dollars. And then so on and so forth with youth, youth on the resident side, and then the non-resident adult cost seven hundred and ninety-eight dollars plus the ten dollars and fifty-nine habitat stamp, the eighty-six fifty for the qualifying license to to be in the draw comes to seven ninety-eight oh seven for an elk for an elk license seven nine seven ninety-eight times the twenty-six thousand applicants comes up to twenty-one million seventy seven hundred thirty thousand. And then so on with the non-resident youth, and I broke the youth in in both, just so you could kind of see how our our youth is coming up in the in the state of Colorado. And then on the very bottom, I have elk tag plus a habitat stamp plus a qualifying license equals cost. Cost equals drawn applicants, and that equals state revenue. Sure. Can I ask a question? Qualifying license is that some type of yeah, you, there is even applications fees, but because application fees were kind of getting out of hand and it was bouncing around, they basically just put the the qualifying license um, because they really want to promote you to come to the state. So if you apply for, instead of just applying for the license and then never showing up because the revenue when you're here is generates even more state revenue. So they added the qualifying license. So as soon as you get that qualifying license to be into the draw, there's a good chance you might come to the state. So if I apply for an elk license and don't draw, I have a general hunting license in Colorado. You don't have a general hunting license. The qualifying license, that's the minimum right there, which I believe is a small game combo. Yeah, fish. That's non-refundable. Next slide, please. And this, this is the exact same for our deer resident adult cost. Um, I put this because now we don't have the cost of that qualifying license or that. Uh, habitat stamp because once you applied and then you could reverse this in the deer if you were only applying for the deer you would have the habitat stamp and the qualifying license added to that but most people who put in for the draw will do the elk the deer and you know they'll apply for several different species so i just didn't add them in as well but you have the forty-two thousand times the 56,000 applicants 2.3 million and then the resident youth cost so on and so forth non-resident <clears throat> $420 for a, a deer license times the 16,847 applicants comes up to 7.1 million. Next slide. And this is the exact same chart on the antelope side, resident adult, uh, $42.01 times the 12,000 applicants comes out to 526,000. Um, so on with the resident youth and then the non-resident adult cost $420.23 times the 778 applicants equals, can you really see that? Can't see that one. I think you guys can see it. Next slide. This chart represents the, <clears throat> in the earlier slide, the six preference points that puts you in the 80-20 category versus 
the hunt codes in the five or less category that would put you in the 65-35 category. So in 2020, we gained two hunt codes that went into the 80-20 and then at the bottom of that, but we also lost seven. So seven went into the 65-35 and two went into the 80-20. Next slide. So the landowner preference program, um, as directed by Senate Bill 13-188, landowners receive a preference for hunting licenses to encourage private landowners to provide habitat that increases wildlife populations for the benefit for all hunters, discourage the harboring of game animals on private lands during public hunting seasons, and relieve hunting pressure on public lands by increasing game hunting on private lands. 15% of these licenses come off the top before the other draws to go to landowner preference program. The illusion and misconception is that the non-resident get the majority of the vouchers. However, during the last landowner voucher process, it was proven statistically that it was about a 50-50 split. And last year it was 53-47, uh, 53% 53 of the licenses went to resident and 47 went to non-resident. You can see that the elk unrestricted and unrestricted means that you can hunt the entire unit that for that LPP license. And then the restricted would put you solely on deeded land. It doesn't have to be the deeded land that the voucher came on, but it does have to be deeded land within the unit. So we're putting 2,450 LPP licenses out in the state every year on the restricted side and the unrestricted side and so on and so forth with the deer unrestricted 10,915 and the restricted 9,934 antelope unrestricted 3,137 and the antelope restricted 2,256. Next slide. So also we have, now we have the 80-20, we have the 65-35, we have the uh, landowner program, and then we have over-the-counter. <laughs> so elk unlimited over-the-counter opportunities for hunting, archery, either sex, and antlered elk, antlered elk during the second and third rifle seasons. Um, then other opportunity is the plains rifle elk. That's kind of based on some just crop damage is why that's over the counter in some some of the plains areas and then deer whitetail only late rifle these are opportunity tags that um don't give a it, they're not high success rate but it does give opportunity for people to go out in eastern colorado and hunt whitetail only and then bear over the counter are an add-on if you have any of the above you can get a bear add-on over the counter in the muzzleloader archery or the unlimited archery so if you if you drew an elk tag drew a deer tag then you can go get a bear add-on if you did not if you do not possess any of the above or a drawn license then you cannot go out and just buy a bear tag unless it's through the draw system and then antelope either sex archery on the eastern plains in some units. Next slide. So this is pretty much year to date elk, deer, antelope dollars and volume. So big game elk resident, 135,000 hunters generated seven million dollars elk non-resident volume 77,000 hunters for 49 million deer resident two million dollars 77,000 hunters in the woods deer non-resident 21,000 hunters 8.5 million antelope 748,000 dollars for 20,000 hunters in the woods Antelope non-resident, 746,000 
for 1800s, 1800 hunters in the woods. And that's the only one antelope that the resident generates a little bit more income than the non-resident. Next slide, please. Roughly, how does our outfitting industry survive in Colorado? Uh, Colorado does not have any sort of outfitter program, outfitter pool. Um, who knows what comes down the pipe later, but as our as it sits right now, we have our landowner preference program. That's the one where licenses go to landowners, then outfitters lease property, get those licenses restricted, non-restricted. Even if you're on public land outfitter, you can still, you know, find landowners, buy vouchers from them and use them unrestricted. Or if you're a private land outfitter, you can buy private land only vouchers on the restricted side and then so on and so forth. Hunters that draw in high point units often use outfitters to increase their success. Um, just me personally, I am in one and so it works and it works for me. I don't know if it works for every outfitter, um, but when, when hunters have, are in high draw and in, especially in my particular area, which is in a pack-in, they generally use outfitters, um, and it's about a 30% use outfitter in those high point areas. Over-the-counter units allow flexibility for hunters to plan contingency hunts when not successful in drawing licenses in other states or other units. And then over-the-counter units allow hunters to have the same exact hunting experience year after year. Next slide. Colorado license allocation, basically a case for equality. Some residents are not charged more to see golf, boat, careers, tent, cars. Beyond that, non residents are not charged more to buy the firearms, ammunition, fishing equipment, ATVs, boats, trailers used to hunt and fish in Colorado. Non residents are not charged more to buy gas, food, souvenirs, homes, or businesses. Non residents continue to be the backbone of CPW funding. It has allowed them to build and acquire the assets to create and maintain programs, employ nearly a thousand people, and fund nearly every form of operating expense within the CPW. Next slide. United States flag code. Oh, how it's diminished. According. United States flag code. Allegiance reads, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, if we have the freedoms in America that we have and go to war to protect those freedoms, how can we deny the opportunity because someone lives in another state, but he wants to hunt and fish in, or he wants to hunt in a state that he, that others fought for and died for. When they went to war for or service for our freedoms, they went fighting for their home, and weren't fighting for their home state. It was the United States, indivisible, one nation under God. That's the end of my presentation, folks. Any questions? Yeah, you're up first. On your slide that shows dollars generated, yeah. is that dollars to the Colorado Parks and Wildlife or dollars to outfitters or something? That's dollars to CPW. Thank you. Right. Ash, on your restricted elk hunt areas, mm -hmm. are those in non checkerboarded? Uh, Generally, they're they're uh, public land consumed. A lot of them. You get up in unit like unit forty nine. It has a lot of private land in it, and it's it's uh, it's difficult to get in. But though they're still high high point units because the land the private land that is there is generally outfitted and so the you know the opportunity is still there in the public land side of some of those units yes you can have a good opportunity they still obviously do good or the points wouldn't be as high as they are but basically product in demand ash is there a set voucher fee and are those taxable there is not a, there, there, 
as of I know right now, they're not taxable or they don't collect tax on them. It would probably be generated through the landowner, you know, in his process, but uh, there's not a set fee. In certain units, the obviously the better ones, they fluctuate, but there's no set fee on those vouchers. Once you get that, you might buy that voucher and you go and you turn it in, then you pay the the CPW, the normal non-resident or resident fee for that license. Yes. So probably the voucher would be on your income branch of income tax instead of Yeah. Yo, question. Um, make an interesting argument about the uh, the consumption of, of other resources um, or the use of other resources, non residents versus residents. We've talked about that, especially with the influx of. Um, our wonderful neighbors to the south that come up and enjoy Wyoming's uh, pieces. But, but is there another, I mean, so, so the, is there another publicly managed and held resource that a non-resident can come and actually consume, take with them, harvest, grab, I mean, if they can fish and, and, and game, that a non-resident comes to Colorado for and actually takes harvests, grabs, and leaves with that they're not charged differently than residents. I assume the fishing licenses for non-residents are more expensive than residents in Colorado. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm, gonna, I'm, so I'm grappling with that. Is there another thing that non-residents come and take that the state of Colorado manages? It, um, right off the top of my head, you know, we can brainstorm about it yeah. and think of something, you know, but um, yeah, it, it's our hay product. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Ash? Somebody expected me to ask if you separate your mule deer and your whitetail. <laughs> we do. Yeah, there's whitetail tags and mule deer tags. Yeah, the, the whitetail population is not a huge, but it, it is separated out in the in the hunt codes. So, so there's no areas in the state where you can hunt both species, both species? Not on one tag. Got a question, Mr. Chairman. Um, you have, and I don't remember the, the uh, acronym for where it's the private land, uh, big uh, management units. Uh, Non-residents aren't allowed to apply for those. Is that correct? All the residents. No, everything is, you can apply for either non-resident. The only place that non-resident can't apply is in our. Uh... Yeah, I can't think of the name either. Um, hybrid. Some of our hybrid hunt codes do not have a resident tag in them, just simply because they, if the, they generally give one tag for some of those high point, like it might have five tags in it. And just mathematically, they don't add that in there on the hybrid draw. The hybrid draw was basically designed um, and I didn't include it on this because it just makes things more confusing, but you can jump in the hybrid draw and go in this huge lottery draw. So they give you opportunity for that and you have to have at least five points to do that. So, but in some of our hunt codes, that, or our units that require up to 26 to some of them are in the mid 30s right now to get there. It gives us one tag in that unit for a complete one lottery draw for resident hunters. Yeah, the one I'm thinking of is, is the ranching for wildlife program and then for those 10% of the public draw. Time. Yeah, non residents are not in the ranching for wildlife, but ranching for wildlife. Um, if you join the program, it's it's basically, I don't even know if what the minimum is, I think it's 55,000 acres that you have to in order to get in it. Uh, and then once you join, join it, it gives the landowner a little bit more flexibility and control on season dates and structure um, so that they have create, you know, opportunity within the ranch, how they think they should manage. 
And then obviously in turn, there's probably either the ranch, most, a lot of them have our outfitter related within the ranch. And so whether you're a landowner or an outfitter on one of those, which there's both and either on the ranching for wildlife, the non-resident comes in on the ranch under their design and the seasons and things like that. Some of them, you know, the, the state sent gives regulation, but they can change their season dates by a few days and things like that. See, is Colorado have a damage system? Or is um, yes and no. Um, it's a process. You know, if a herd elk come in and eat half your hay pile or it, that's when they give damage out. It's like in the winter months. Um, if they come in to a guy's corn cornfield, they have that. But otherwise, if you're in an over-the-counter unit, they really push that as far as where you're going to get that revenue back. Instead of giving you money or subsidizing you for something else. If, if, if they come in and they tear up your hay crop or your hay stack in the middle of winter, first thing they're going to do is help you fence it and they'll pay for that fencing. The second thing they do if they help bust down the fence is probably subsidize the loss in a small amount. <laughs> Excited, <laughs> so, you have something? No, I was well. Roughly three hundred. So even with all this opportunity to support counter licenses, almost three hundred thousand head elk, it's still the industry is about three hundred. Right? Yeah. Has it yeah. stayed that number for a long time? Or down? Well, it seems to actually have gone down, and I think that in this day's world. We have other outfitters, even in our association, the number's gone down some. But is what we've noticed is, you know, this, an outfitter has bought up two or three permits and joined. So he, he took three out of the pool and became one bigger. Um, and we're just seeing a lot, of, a lot more of that, you know. Outfire, outfitters are a dying breed in our state. If it's operated on federal land, public land, you have to have you have to have a license and a permit. If you're if you're private land, um, <clears throat> if you're the private land owner, you don't have to be licensed. Um, but if you lease one piece of ground, then you have to have a license to our or the Division of Regulatory Agencies. Any other questions for us? Thank you, Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Si, do you want to take a quick break? Yes. Okay, we'll take a quick break. <laughs> That time of year for you. Welcome back, everybody. Next speaker to be invited to talk to you is uh, Paul Ellis. He's a MOGA member, uh, board member of MOGA, and been an outfitter in Montana for a very long time and has been heavily involved in various lobbying efforts uh, with various systems that Montana has gone through over the years. So, Paul's up next. And uh, task force members of the 100 meter, and I want to bring you some of the highlights of Montana's utilizing the technology systems in there. Could you speak up? Because I can't hear you. Can't you? I got Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Much better. Okay. <laughs> oh, 
That uh, type up there is pretty small, but I tried to hit the highlights of it all and talk to you about. Montana has a very unique licensing system. Uh, we do not allocate uh, by the number of non-resident licenses compared to resident licenses because the resident licenses are all over the counter for deer and elk, antelope, or on a draw. Um, in uh, 1975, the legislative uh, passed uh, a bill that set the quota at 17,000 non-resident big game combo licenses for Montana. Now these are intersex licenses. They call them combo licenses because uh, we have a deer elk combo, which also includes birds and uh, seasoned fishing licenses with that. And then we have a separate deer only license that they set the quota at 6,600. And that's a combo license also that includes the birds and the fishing. And then um, with that 6,600 um, gear license, there's a 2,000 quota set aside for landowner preferences that they, they sponsor uh, hunters uh, on their needed land only. So with that being said, then um, Montana has several different types of uh, additional licenses for non-residents, and uh, I'm going to get into those. I'll break those down in a minute here. Antelope are on a special draw, but like residents and non-residents compete for the same number of licenses. Those are on up to 10% of the residents' uh, licenses. So the non-residents get up to 10% of the antelope. But not Now our special draw for B licenses, uh, Montana has a, a lot of cow and, and doe tags available there. They call B licenses. And we get up, they get up to 10% of those. But generally there's a surplus and non-residents get probably a lot more, a higher percentage of those, as we'll see here in a minute. Go to the next slide there. The next one. We're looking at these numbers here. Um, this is the non resident license sales. And, and as I pointed out uh, earlier, Montana has a lot of extra non resident uh, uh, possibilities over here. I'll just read off a few of them, like uh, coming home to hunt. If you lived in Montana before and you wanted to come back and hunt, they have that. They have a lot of youth sponsored licenses. They also have some. Uh, um, um, license available for veterans and stuff like that. So all those licenses added up this year. It comes over here to 27,522. And then for elk, it's 19,112. So that is the total number of, of licenses that were issued in 2021 to non-residents for just the general A tag 
and the general elk apex, that means either sex, not the cow permits, and doe tags. And then we get down here to the non resident bee tags. Um, there were 13,556 deer doe tags issued, and there were 3,567 uh, amethyst bee tags for elk. So that brings the total up to 41,000 and uh, 22,000 from the elk. So let's skip over to the resident side now. And the residents have uh, what they call a resident sportsman with or without a bear. Basically, we can buy a license and it includes all of our fishing and, and uh, beer and elk licenses in that. Um, that right now, um, comparing, I want to take a minute here to compare the resident prices to the non resident prices. Um, Montana <coughs> residents or hunters are totally subsidized by the non resident hunters. Resident deer licenses are $16. And if you're a senior like me, you get it at half price. Elk licenses are $20. Antelope are $19. Now, the non resident, the deer elk combo is $1,108. The deer only is $646 <coughs> for a non resident license compared to. $16, $934 for the elk license where, where we get ours for $20. And the antelope is uh, $205. Um, so um, antelope, um, non-resident subsidizes their um, state residents on their licensing fees too. They also, um, they, they fund 73% of the Montana <coughs> general budget non-residents too. So non-residents are a very important part of our, our um, and it gives a lot of benefits to the residents having all the two places there. Um, looking at the resident numbers here, um, resident license sales for uh, deer are 159,000. That's we we sell a lot of licenses. We got a lot of hunters. Unlike Wyoming, I think our percentage of the honey public is, is much, much greater. And we sell 136,000 resident elk licenses. B uh, licenses for deer, we sell 61,000. Um, B licenses and elk B licenses, we sell 26,000. So you compare that to, uh, we got 221 total deer licenses sold, 163,000. Um, 347 health licenses sold to the residents. If you'll jump over to the next uh, page there. Percentage of uh, non-residents to resident deer and elk A licenses, which is the user sex licenses. Um, deer is about 17%, elk is 13%. And then the non-resident B licenses is 21% go to uh, non-residents and 13% of the elk B licenses go to non-residents and the combination of both it runs about 18 percent for deer and 16 almost 16 16 percent for for um, for that we have also have a base hunting license um which shows um kind of a unique sales position because when you buy a license for deer and elk residents and non-residents you know you you get both licenses in that price. So a lot of our deals where we have, you know, they have to buy a base hunting license. We have 175,000 residents buy that base for hunting license compared to only 86,000 for non residents, 49%. So we're about 50 50 on our residents and non residents. Now I want to go to the next page. I want to talk a little bit about how. Uh, Montana treats our outfitters, and in 2020, the legislature felt that uh, the importance of the Montana industry to our tourism dollars and stuff coming in. So we passed a, they passed a bill there in Montana <laughs> that was that was uh, where outfitters, if you hunt with an outfitter, you can get an extra preference point. So what that does is it gives uh, the outfitters definitely a leg up 
And what it is is that one preference point. Uh, we can have the outfitter clients can have up to three preference points. Not the non-resident do it yourself you can only have two. So it definitely gives an advantage to um, being able to draw our clients. Now, our system is you can't build uh, preference points in one tenant. If you don't apply consistently, you lose that point. So if you go into next year um, with two points and you don't apply, you lose them. And so that building points is, is Wyoming has seen probably, uh, especially on their goats. Because I know people that apply here. You know, these people build them. It takes a long time. This this clears them out. It keeps people that only want to come on Montana for those. Um, the outfit preference point is issued. Uh, all of our preference points are issued at a hundred dollars a piece. Now the outfit preference point, the legislature um, wanted us to be able to help contribute to access programs in Montana. So we take our outfit preference point and go to the fishing game. The regular ones do go to the fishing game in no budget. Ours goes to four different access programs in Montana. Now. Last year we sold 7,204 um, outfitter preference for this year. 7,204 outfitter preference points. That raised an additional $720,000, and that was split up four ways. $160,000 went to each one of those four. <coughs> so we are trying to give back to uh, help the public hunters in Montana um, uh, find access. To the The one thing about it, uh, uh, pushing uh, for back on this on this system here, it, you cannot draw uh, that preference point. But if you did not apply this year, like in 2022, and you're going to hunt next year, and whether you're with an outfitter or not, you can buy an extra preference point. And that's hundred dollars. So if you buy an extra preference point this year. Next year, by April 1st, the draw deadline, you apply. You can buy two more there if you're going with an outfitter. You can buy a normal one and an uh, outfitter preference. So you'd have three going into that draw. And that's your free bone. You're sure to draw that tag, that license, the general license. Um, and that happens, you can buy that between July 1st and December 31st of each year. Now, that's not just for outfitters, it's for anybody in the contract. One thing about Montana is that you know when the legislature passed this bill, they they recognize that Montana, the outfitting industry is the fourth largest tourism dollars in Montana. It's only behind fuel, uh, gas, fuel, gas, lodging, and meals. Uh, the fourth largest tourism dollar comes to Montana. So they saw the need for, for some type of preference. Now, by, how does this benefit the public hunter in Montana, the, the, the DYI guy? Um, it benefits them that if, if the outfitters are drawing their clients, those people are not hunting on the public ground. Uh, they're not hunting on their block management program. So it reduces, it reduces overcrowding. So it's a benefit to the resident hunters in that way. Uh, it does not, it does have no effect on the resident draw if we have a general draw license in Montana over the counter. It does affect some of our permitted areas, but that's a, it's a pretty complicated system. So, Like I said before, Montana, it's a University of Montana did a study and showed that the, the outfitting industry is the fourth largest tourism dollars. Um, of all the outfitting going on there, they, they, we bring in $506 million a year. 33% um, of that is fishing outfitters and 24% of that is, uh, is, is hunting outfitters. So it's a big, huge boost to Montana's economy. We're, tourism state, especially in these small communities um, up in the breaks and all these areas. So um, our clients also 
uh, are the highest spending um, to make up that dollar. Out there, clients spend more money than the resident DYI and the non-resident DYI. The resident hunters in Montana um, spend more than the non-resident DYI hunters. So, so we're the top, you know, resident hunters and non-resident DYI hunters. So it's a real benefit to support your, um, you know, the non-resident outfit clients because they do so much bring so much more into the state. And it has no effect on the, the resident hunters. And their draws the same, they still get a majority of tags. So I'll I'll stand for questions if anybody has anything more. Um, All right. well, Larry, we'll go to you and then Sai. Yeah, could you talk to us about your landowner program and, and whether those tags, how many of those tags are allocated to landowners? I know you went through a whole list of slides. But are those transferable tags? In other words, once those landowners can, can they transfer those? Or not? Okay. So on the we the main landowner sponsor tags are, are for deer. That's the two the two thousand that I pointed out there. We only usually probably only come up. They only probably have about a thousand of those units. They are not transferable. They are they're in, they're. They're uh, given out during the draw. An outfitter, a landowner, I'm sorry, out, a landowner has to get a, a, a special sponsor. They got to qualify for being able to sponsor the hunter. And when they apply, then it goes through the normal draw. They get a preference there. And then when they draw the license, they can only hunt on that landowner's needed property. They can't go hunt uh, on the general areas. They can't hunt anywhere else. And that's, that's what our main preference is on um, for for the deer. Now we don't have any real preference point or any sponsor tags for elk at all. There are some access programs. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard about the 454 program lately. I don't know if you followed that in Montana. But what that did was um, it's been around since 2001. And what they were required of the landowners is if you've got one um, license or a permit to hunt, a bull on your property you had to let four people hunt bulls. It never took off. The landowners didn't really feel that uh, that was a equitable thing for them. And so in 20, last year, in 2021, the uh, legislature uh, went to a three to one ratio where if the landowner got one bull tag, the resident hunters got to have two cow, two cow hunters. So they got to have a three to one ratio on that. And so they, those were non-transferable. They could only use those landowner tags to their family members or full-time employee period. And I know there's a lot of misconception there, but that's an isolated program. Um, we've got other access programs, but that might be what you're talking about. Did that answer your question? Yes. I'm sorry. Okay, um, <coughs> this is really important. We can take this through our public schools. So Montana politics are really similar to what I was Okay. You had to go to the legislature and you had to convince the legislature that giving an outfit of preference point, which in essence uh, allowed Montana outfitters this year to pretty much draw the 100% rate for their clients, you had to convince that legislature that that was a valuable program to allow the outfit of client to have one more point in the draw. So you got that through. How did that happen? Well, I mean, you, you, this is important. Well, we had, um, it was a very, well, you guys in politics, especially at <laughs> the legislature, it, it was very interesting. We had that's the county time. commissioners, that's other guys. Work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, politics is a very interesting thing. Um, we, we had, uh, we had a, Proposal for it um, on a SB 143. It was an allocated process. Well, the legislators really, really supported that. But we got hammered by the DYI non-resident hunters, and they 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 thought it was unfair to them. And so we kind of what happened was at the end of the legislative session, they um, passed that uh, a bill to give us an extra preference point, and it was. Um, they put it in with a 
another uh, budget bill up. And so anyway, it was it was an interesting process how it stepped down. But the main thing you got to understand is the legislators, for a majority of them, felt that Montana outfitting industry is a very very important business in Montana. It, it's huge, and being the fourth largest, I think they felt that they had to do something to make sure because last last year we would have seen the effects of a normal draw, we would have lost 30 to 40% of our clients. Now an outfitter can't sustain that. Talk about what happened during COVID. Yeah, okay. Well, in that same bill, they gave us um, that last year where our draw was so bad that the legislature and the governor and stuff felt that they would, they passed a, a, a bill to, if you had booked with a hunter, with an outfitter that you could get, um, they issued some extra, they issued our licenses to us over that because of COVID relief and because of the drama was so bad on us. Although they, they helped us out that way too. Emergency. Yeah, it was an emergency type thing. Um, All right, Pat and then Joe. So you mentioned the block management program. Yeah. So my understanding is that one time, I don't know if you do it today, but or outfitters were given a set number of licenses. Is that the block management program? Correct. Okay, in 1995, they passed legislation. That was pretty much a joint effort to try to fund them, to fund our block management program. We've had as high as 8 million acres in that program. What that program does is they uh, go to landowners, the fish game does, and they basically pay them to lease up that ground. And if, at that time, we had an outfitter set aside license in 1995. And that outfitter license funded totally. They charged us more for our licenses for our clients. And that funded totally the block management program. So 800 or 8 million acres at the time. Is that, is that still in place? It is, in fact. So, so I sign outfits in Montana. So he does a guaranteed number of licenses. No, 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 no. We did, we did, okay. So we had an outfitter set aside license and then it was market driven one year. They, they we had a, a, a target number. So they would raise and lower the price of that license. One year it was 1500, next year it was 1250 for their own year. So it, it, came, it, it came right in about the number they wanted to have us set at. But in, in 2010, the, the groups out there um, went out and had a, a, a petition, um, a ballot issue take that away, I-161, and they weren't very honest about what that did, and they passed it in Montana. So in 2010, we lost our outfitter sponsored license. Now, from 2011 to 2017, we we had a surplus license so we could draw all our clients. And keep in mind, even with that, even that ability to get all the licenses that we wanted, we did not grow in size, and the amount of acreages we had did not grow. So. You know, we're not, a, we weren't an outfitting industry without a control. And just because we could get all the licenses we wanted, we didn't go out and lease up a bunch more ground and, and expand like everybody thought we would. Also, follow up question, Ken. What time do you think I heard there was a moratorium on additional outfitter licenses in Montana? Yeah, that, that was, oh, I don't remember. That was a long time ago. Um, Is that still? Like no. They did away with it because we never actually we were we've lost outfitters in numbers of outfitters. So we uh, let's see, I think I've got the numbers here for outfitters somewhere. Um, in 2021, hunting outfitters there was 162, hunting and fishing there were 197, so that was 359 uh, hunting uh, outfitters that could hunt and. And fish also, I guess, some of them. And uh, guys, that number's been pretty much right around 2,100 guys. And then one last call. Can you apply, if I apply for a non resident health license in Montana, you mentioned something called the base hunting license. Is that part of my application? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's, that's included in the, um, in the combination licenses. So, how much would that? I don't think there's a separate, that's all in the price at 700 that I give you. And so I'm not sure how that breaks out exactly. If I apply for a health license in Montana and don't draw, 
I, I can go there and hunt rabbits or fish or something. No, yeah. like you come to Montana and hunt coyotes and do it in the state. Yeah. Do they? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I guess they do. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah, I guess they do. Yeah. The re the re I'm not real sure on that. I can find out for it. But, you know, I don't know how that base of hunting license is due to the component of all the part of the application fee. If you don't get the license, you don't have to do it. Joe? Yeah, thank you, Josh. Um, thanks for the information. Um, so one thing just for clarifying, maybe my clarification, then I have a follow-up question. Uh, preference points apply to the, the big game combo or the, the deer combo licenses, not to any limited entry. Is that correct? That is correct, yeah. So, so preference points are not on everything. It's basically the equivalent, and this is my second question, I think, is the equivalent of what would be a general license for a resident. So we can go buy as a resident, you can go buy a deer tag, an elk tag. And then on the non-resident side, those are the big game combo that do bundle bird hunting and all that other good stuff with that. How does the state determine how many of those big game combos they give give out to non-residents? So they're the big game or the, the deer combo. Okay. Tags. That is that statutorily set and that comes out of the seventeen thousand uh, I don't know if I plays over that or not or missed it, but Montana in 75 established 17,000 big game combo licenses in the 6,600 are also statutorily. Now what happened was originally when they said that in 75, you couldn't split the deer and elk licenses up. And since then the legislature allowed us to split the elk off of there. And by splitting the elk off, that split the deer off too and they put that in the genome. That's why you saw the numbers over 17,000 there. But that's just for A tags. I mean, either sex general tags, not for the B tag. That's a whole separate. Did that explain it? Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. How, so, just last year, I guess, if I heard you right, you established an ability for a non resident to get an extra out, an extra preference point if they go with an outfitter. Correct. How did that help your draw this year or hinder your draw? I mean, what has been the effect of that? Or do you know? Well, to be honest, I think it was extremely high. I haven't heard of hardly anybody that didn't draw um, um, that an outfitter plan. Now, you got to keep in mind that they have to hunt with an outfitter. They can't come back and hunt on their own for something. They have to go with an outfitter. So that also, what that, what that also does is it, it, it forces them to go with an outfitter. That means they're not going to come back and compete with the public hunters on, on public land or um, on um, on the block management area, they have to go with an outfitter with that license. Yes. With that, if you got an outfitter preference point, you have to hunt with an outfitter. You can't come back and hunt on your own. Period. Even even if you got a deer tag and an elk tag, and you only hunt with an outfitter on the elk tag, you can't come back and hunt on your own for a deer tag. Would you in subsequent years? No. Well, yeah. If you want to put it for the general draw, you didn't get an outfitter preference. You could, in the following years, you could get your own. Go on. If I understand right, you have a preference point system where the maximum number of preference points you can have is three. <coughs> yes. But two for two. two for not a regular regular GBY I hunter and outfitters get three. Okay. Because that gives us an extra. They clean those out. They won't. You can't get over three. We can't get over three for uh, for the outfitter. But on, only on the, the big game and the deer combo oh, licenses. That's correct. So there's a, there's a full another bonus point system in Montana. There well. is. Yeah. I'll, I'll go into that. We do have limited entry permits. And the reason I didn't jump into that was because it's, it's our system is pretty confusing, obviously. But uh, there are, <laughs> I think every state system is pretty confusing. Uh, but I think. Uh, we have limited entry, and the biggest topic right now is mostly on the elk permits, archery, and, and rifle permits. And those are, if you you have to draw the general tag, and then you put in for the for the permit, and those are based on uh, a 90, up to ten percent for non-residents. So you say limited entry in Wyoming, we have limited quota areas. So it's the same thing. I would assume so. Yeah, you only get a set number of points yeah. in a certain area. Let me explain why there's a big difference. Okay, so you have to put in for the elk combination license and be successful drawing that. And at the time you apply for it, you put your 
limited entry requests for the draw application. So, so the only way you have a shot at drawing that limited entry LTAC is if you first draw that general health license. So, so you're going to be able to go health license no matter what in one of those areas. And then maybe I drew this tag down here. So you're making a buy a license. Yes. The so to get a yeah. 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 Right. And the other thing too, Pat, that's different about the Montana system is this is not so good. So much different than ours. So yeah. if I have a deer hunter booked in 2023, I buy him one point this summer in 2022. So there's one point. Then when I make application in 2023, I can buy him the second point, which benefits him in the 2023 draw, unlike ours. So he can go into the draw, a DIY game, with two points. And then I can buy him the third point. So in essence, I buy him two points at the time of the application, which gives him three going into the draw. So, that's how so you, don't, you don't have any type of absent or set aside draw, you just structure the preference points to give preference, to give outfitters certainty that they're going to have plans. And it works. Thank you. I had a question. Yeah, but you must have, well, well, first of all, how many limited entry areas do you have, say, for health in that state? Boy. I mean, how much of the country? I mean, is most of it open? Or how much? Most of our state is a general rural area. So, if you so, get so that, if that's the case, then the difference between your state and our state is your residents can basically get the same ones. Correct. If you're a resident, you can go buy a general license for to hunt the general areas for deer and elk. And you can here too. Yeah. We don't put out 100% general. We have quite a number. Yeah, you guys have a lot more special areas. We don't. I would say the permitted areas, oh man, I know there's. There's um, archery along. There's about 30 general draw or uh, permitted areas for archery only, and probably about the same for for uh, rifle. I would guess they're about the same. Yeah. So if you're drawing, I mean, if, if, if your, your preference point system, if you must have a sheer number of licenses, is pretty high. Because otherwise, you're all the same place no matter what. Whether you're in ten or all you get is two. Then you have to screen, get the license. The sheer number of licenses must be fairly high in comparison to the amount of applications. So you can ensure yourself on the virtue of what the side of the two years. So, Mr. Chairman, is that the 17,000 cap? Is that still in place for the yes. state? Yes. Yeah. So that's, that's our 17. It's, it's regulated at that 17,000. We shouldn't have a, a, a substantial number of licenses. First applications, they're all the same point. One of the reasons why ours is to get since eight, ten, twenty is because it's so complex. So, Paul, I have a question. Is uh, on the outfitter draw point, the extra point? What's the enforcement mechanism of that? Okay, that's a good question. Um, what we have to do is when, and I, I apply <laughs> most all the members, and most of the outfitters do because they don't need it so complicated. Uh, I have to put my name in there and my outfitter. Name. And then after the deadline is over, I think we've got, uh, they send us a list and they send us a list that said, well, did Joe Blow, um, is he going to be hunting with you? And I've got to confirm that. And so you send that back and say, yes, you know, and it went pretty smoothly this for the first year. It went real smoothly. Yeah, they, you know, there were a couple people that thought, well, I'll just I'll put somebody out there and numbers down. And they didn't realize that they were going to be, we had to sign it out with David. Oh, that guy got up with us and he lost his license. But there weren't a lot of them. I thought we would have a lot more abuse if we did not. Well, I was just asking because I think we maybe went around the fringes on that on a on a private land only license and how you how that enforcement mechanism works. I don't you know, I mean that's anyway, I appreciate that. Thank you. Well they all, the, the department's done a really good job helping us on that. It was just Something they had to into their uh, computation system. Any other questions for Paul? Paul, thank you for your, thank your you. presentation. Um, our next presenter is going to present by Zoom. I'll introduce, I'm hopefully they're on. Uh, I 
I believe there's going to be two of them. Uh, Aaron Lieberman, who's the executive director of the Idaho Outdoor Guide Association, and then his current president of IOGA, Jeff Brennan, who's also kind of their uh, license uh, guru, uh, <laughs> on Zoom to talk about uh, Idaho system. Yeah, hey folks, can you hear me? And maybe see me? We can hear you. We can hear you and we see the presentation on our screen. So that's not that we don't see it, but that's probably more important. Well, it's for the best for everybody there that you're looking at the presentation and not at my face. So uh, let me know if uh, let me know if it doesn't come through clearly at any given point here. Um, I'm using satellite internet, so it might be a little bit uh, jumpy, in which case I'll shut off my video. Uh, but to start, um, Really wish I could be there in person. Uh, turns out it's pretty tough to get from Stanley, Idaho to uh, Casper, Wyoming in short order. Uh, my name is Aaron Lieberman. I'm the executive director of the Idaho Outfitters and Guides Association. And I do have Jeff Bitten, who is the president of the Idaho Outfitters and Guides Association here uh, because he is our, he knows more about this system than anybody alive um, and has passed the germane legislation um, around it. So to jump right in, uh, I think everybody's let off by saying, you know, that their state's tag system is unique. Uh, that's, I think, true across the board, certainly true uh, with us as well. Um, we do not have a point system, which uh, I'm also very glad we don't because that seems to get awfully complicated more so than uh, more so than our system already is. Uh, just briefly what I'll do, um, and if you could go on to the next slide here. Yep, and again, okay, so yeah, to start out, I uh, just wanted to uh, present to you all what the total breakout of uh, tag sales looks like in Idaho. And this is taken from 2019, but I think it's a pretty good indication of what it might uh, be any given year. And so, uh, as you can see, I don't need to necessarily read the whole thing across. I think the big takeaway is uh, if you look over on the elk side of things, um, framing out resident versus non-resident opportunity uh, in total. Uh, so where Idaho in general terms is a 90, if you looked at it from the outside, you'd think this is a pure 90, 10 system. Um, and in some, in a literal sense it is, uh, there's a, you know, 10% of all the tags for deer and for elk uh, are set aside, quote unquote, for non-residents, otherwise 90% uh, to residents. However, when you actually start looking into where that opportunity plays out, it looks a little bit different, and especially when we, when we drill down into the outfitted end of things. But just really briefly, uh, with elk, the total number, uh, the total tag used by non-residents represents about 18% of the total number, total uh, elk tag sales. Um, 20, 21% of the total of that total, um, in for general season hunts and 8% in controlled hunts, uh, for deer, uh, it's a little bit less. So deer, the total, uh, non-resident tag sales is about 15% of the overall number of deer tags available, uh, 16% in general season, uh, general hunts and, uh, 10% in controlled hunts. Uh, go on to the next slide there, please. Okay. And here, this is just laying out generally um, what type of, I guess, additional context for type of opportunity for, uh, for our resident hunters. Um, so they're just general over the counter and how we, uh, how we in Idaho sort of, uh, Put sideboards on that or uh, constrain that. So over the counter general hunt, uh, you have to pick your zone weapon for draw hunt, uh, and then it just lists the number there. Um, and then over the counter uh, general deer hunt, you can hunt any open season unit in the state. Um, and again, just sort of lays out the tags, tag numbers overall there. Um, and if you go into the next slide again, okay. So, and once, once more, this is really where I think it starts to get useful. Uh, this is laying out. So this and the next, uh, next slide, which we don't need to go there quite yet. The next two slides, uh, try to 
their flow chart for where these tags come from and where they go to um, and uh, reflecting the outfitted uh, component of that as well. So essentially there are controlled hunt tags and then general hunt tags. And within general hunt tags, there are really, um, even though our department frames them as more or less the same tag type, uh, they really are somewhat different. So there's just general uh, over-the-counter for residents and then uh, non-resident limited general hunts. Uh, so capped and, and sort of truly general hunts and then controlled hunts, uh, which are, you know, specified and limited by season, uh, well, season, species, uh, weapon type, et cetera. And the takeaway here, I think, uh, from this particular flowchart is really at the bottom left. And I don't know if you can see my cursor flying around there, but uh, the bottom left, uh, that bottom left little chart um, is a pretty simple indication of just, of the overall number of non-resident tags available in the state, which is 10% of the total, 25% of those are quote unquote set aside. And that term means something else in Wyoming, I think, than there has different baggage than it does in Idaho. But 25% of those non-resident tags are set aside for use by outfitted hunters. Um, and the number, uh, the number set aside specifically, which we'll get into in uh, some of the next flow charts here, are determined primarily by uh, rule, but then from historic use, uh, verified historic use numbers. Uh, next slide. So for elk, um, what that looks like, and again, this is just sort of put, putting into a visual form, what number of, what the total number of tags or what these tag numbers are and where they end up going. So there are you know, 12,815 statewide non-resident general elk tags uh, available of those roughly, um, and this is in flux to some degree, but roughly 2,800 of those or 22-ish percent are quote unquote set aside uh, for use by the outfitted public in general uh, elk hunts. And this was for the 21 season. Um, that number, to the, so that's the, the yellow box sort of there top left. Um, again, out of that 12,815, an additional 3,838 uh, went toward over-the-counter uh, order for over-the-counter tag limits in those capped zones for all hunters, so not just non-resident limited. Um, and then 5,423 is the sum of non-resident over-the-counter tag limits in zones limited specifically for non-residents and unlimited for residents. Um, Again, I think the takeaway here is this yellow box, which is that of the total number uh, of non-resident tags set aside, which again is within that 10% total, but of that total number of uh, general elk tags set aside for use by the outfitted public, uh, we're using about 21.8% um, of the up to 25% of that 10%. And uh, and that is set in rule, we can go up to 25% 25, 25 of the total. So again, uh, though there is from the top level or from the outside looking in a 90-10 split, realistically one, that split is not actually 90-10 in terms of where ta what happens in tag sales as we saw in a couple slides back. Um, but within that, uh, there is a disproportionate, um, the state is, the state is, uh, establish the system such that there is a larger proportion of those tags available for the outfitted public rather than just non-resident uh, generally. Uh, next slide. And this is a similar, similar deal, deal for deer. Uh, so I think if I remember correctly, like in New Mexico, there just happens to be a smaller number of folks that come to Idaho, non-resident, non-residents that come to Idaho for an outfitted deer hunt. Um, sometimes those, and historically those have been, uh, there's been some combination hunts, but uh, that number that currently we are at 12.8, 12.8% 12 12 of the up to 25% of the total non-resident quota, which is 15,500. Now that number can go up. So the proportion of that 15,500 can go up to up to 25%, dependent on historic use, um, verified historic use by outfitters. Um, next slide. Uh, and 
this so these following slides uh, really sort of bring it to a point where you can dive back in for any questions. And I know I'm keeping it really, really top level here. Uh, but these these uh, these next slides, starting here with statute, um, get at the structure that the flowcharts outlined. Um, so in Idaho, they've established or are uh, the industry has with you know through legislation and with the department established um, a set aside law, the outfitted set aside law that allows up to uh, as those previous slides outlined twenty five percent of the non resident deer tag uh, and non resident elk tag limits to go toward use or to be set aside for use by outfitted hunters and uh, that up to 25 set by the commission in rule according to historic use so if that number of deer tag use went up from uh you know 12 percent to 18 percent and in some absolute number then we could go back to the commission and say hey our historic use has increased to this degree and commission could choose to uh allocate accordingly and historically they have done so where have, where use has increased um if you go on to the next slide i believe this will take us into uh, the rule, part of the rules that inform and uh, enforce or implement that section of statute. Uh, so this is just the section of rule. So, so again, that uh, the actual number of tags in that outfitted set aside pool uh, are established in rule can be changed in rule. This is just uh, this is just a, some perspective on what that actually looks like presently. So four, 14,000 total deer tags, regular and whitetail. Uh, set in that or set aside in that quota 12,815 total elk tags A and B. Um, if you go on to the next slide. Some more reference to rule and this uh, really diving down into what the actual percentage of the set aside is currently. Uh, again, just emphasizing that that can that can go up to twenty five percent according to historic use. And next slide goes back to statute. Um, so it's not framed as statute, but uh, the I've mentioned historic use as a measure or as the as the mechanism uh, through which the commission may increase the proportion of tags in the outfitted set aside. So moving that say deer number from 12.8 up to 20%. And the question is, how do we, how in Idaho do we do that in a way that reflects actual demand? Um, and the way we do that is through verified historic use. So when setting big game seasons, uh, if the commission establishes limits, so any limits whatsoever to the deer and elk tags available for use in any game management area, any hunt, uh, et cetera, where there are outfitted operations that they will establish a number of deer and elk tags uh, to be allocated or to be set aside in the non or in the out, uh, outfitter non-resident outfitted pool uh, for use by outfitters in capped hunts. So there's different mechanisms or different formulas for establishing what historic use is uh, in the respective hunt types in capped hunts in Idaho. General capped hunts, uh, the commission out may allocate uh, the number of outfitted. Uh, hunter elk and deer tags based on the highest number within each of the last two years of all elk or deer tags using the services of an outfitter and controlled hunts uh, that is the uh, highest within the last two years again um, and then outfitted tag use history is through records uh, recorded by the department actual tag sales and then designated and recorded additionally by the board uh, I think the, and I don't believe that there are any more slides, but uh, maybe one more. But in any case, I think that my general takeaway here, I think if I could really impress one thing, um, it's that Idaho is a great example of a state that from the outside looking in um, seems like a poster child for 90-10. And again, from the outside looking in, that is precisely what Idaho has. We have 90% of all tags uh, go to resident hunters and then 10% available for non-residents. But as the initial slide showed, the actual tag sale data uh, is skews higher toward non-residents. And most importantly, uh, while we do have a, a strongly resident preference, strong re resident preference system, uh, we have also, the industry has also been successful and is also lucky to have worked with the department 
and with the state to establish uh, an allocation system in statute and rule that provides uh, insulation for the industry from non-resident uh, fluctuations and in particular decreases. Uh, so if, uh, if you all in Wyoming do decide to, uh, to go down the road of further non-resident restrictions or reducing non-resident opportunity, uh, I think it's absolutely critical that you consider, if not something quite like Idaho has, then a similar system that uh, provides a carve out or an insulated uh, ins or a carve out for outfitters or insulation from those non-resident reductions for the outfitting industry for all the reasons that other folks have already hit on that, you know, we are an economic powerhouse. That's just quite literally true across the West um, and in particular in rural communities. And we also, uh, we're also extremely important to the values that we all, we all uphold for, for game and fish. So for that conservation and stewardship. Um, with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. And if they get too technical, I would be happy to volunteer Jeff for any questions. What's the enforcement mechanism for the side? So is that self-reported? Or is right, that... Can, you repeat, can you repeat the question? It cut out just a little bit. You said, what is the enforcement mechanism for? For the, the outfitter set aside, is it, is it, how do you guys enforce that? Or how does Game and Fish enforce that? So if the, the, the set aside itself is, is just a limit to the number of tags or it establishes the number of tags that the commission will set aside. There's not really any enforcement for that because it's just a proportion that the commission sets. I think maybe what your question is getting at is how does the department or the commission uh, enforce or verify outfitted use, which then informs the number of tags in the set aside. Would that, sure. before, before answering, would that be a fair reframing? Yep, that's right. Okay. So there are a number of ways the department does that. The first is, uh, but the primary way is tags sold through uh, our fish and game department uh, to outfitted hunters directly or at out allocated tags purchased by outfitters. So tags allocated to them within any given hunt are automatically recorded by the department. So pretty easy way to enforce what tag numbers are. Um, and then in terms of verifying non-allocated use, so that would be use, that would, those, that'd be uh, use from tags, not necessarily allocated directly to an outfitter, but say somebody, a non-resident or resident goes, pull, you know, draws a tag, goes to an outfitter says, hey, I want you to take me. That counts as use as well, right? And so in terms of enforcing that, there's an outfitter agreement um, and, or yeah, an outfitter agreement where the outfitter has to sign off, the uh, client has to sign off and, that contract is verified by the fishing game in order to count it toward historic use uh, with a fee for the processing of that uh, verification. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Pete? Yeah, that was most of my question. However, um, what for, on the, the numbers of 21% and then it was 12% uh, per deer that are set aside for the outfitters. Does that pretty much adequately take care of all of the demand by the outfitters in that area? Yeah, yep, yep. Good. No, that's a, that is a good question. And uh, you got the numbers roughly right. Um, we are actually just in a month or so going to be going back into some rulemaking with Fish and Game to look at increasing the set aside for elk um, just moderately. But uh, that does cover the current outfitted use. And that's to the degree there can be elegance in a tag allocation system, I think that's part of the elegance in the Idaho tag allocation system is that the entire system is built around one, the notion that we do need to provide some opportunity to insulate outfitters from reductions or increases or changes period in uh, for non-biological changes in hunt tag numbers, and in particular for non-residents, um, but also that the system is built around uh, around historic use numbers and allocating or setting aside tags accordingly. So that if in eight years, uh, the tag use numbers show that, you know, outfitted or they're actually closer to say 18,000 outfitted deer hunters, 
verified outfitted deer hunters. Uh, you know, those additional from it's about 13,000 now. So those additional 5,000 just being walk up hunters, whatever they are, um, then the commission could go back and allocate according to that verified historic use, increasing the set aside, the deer, the deer set aside from 13 ish percent up to 18 ish percent to reflect demand. And then uh, another thing that I didn't really uh, lay out in the presentation, but that is connected to that question is if you drill down and look at a map of where, or look at, a, you know, an Idaho game management uh, map. So with elk zones and deer units, uh, the, that use and allocation of tags for the outfitted public uh, also meets demand across different zones and units. So if there is, you know, decreased, uh, decreased use, uh, verified use in the middle fork, then some of those tags in the set aside can be redistributed, so to speak, to outfitted operations in a different hunt. So uh, in a different, you know, elk zone or deer or deer unit where use has, in, where use by the outfitted public has increased. Um, but overall, getting to your, getting to your question, uh, I think it's, it all relates to whatever the use actually is up to a certain point. So recognizing there has to be some limit to the number, uh, to what, what the outfitted public can do versus just non-resident public that there has to be safeguard or some degree of non-resident opportunity separate from outfitted. We all get that, uh, separate from outfitted resident or non-resident, but that up to, and within those bounds, uh, that proportion uh, can best be set by historic use numbers. Does that make sense or did I overcomplicate that? But secondly, how do you handle the fact that if that 10% that number, if you have a decline in your elk or deer population, then that number declines. So therefore the 21% that's set aside of the 10% is gonna represent a lot less licenses. Do you adjust for that so that the outfitting industry is always maintaining a certain level or they they share in that reduction overall. So for any biological reductions, whether we're looking at the top level or drilling down, and really this is going to, it will would see it play out um, more by hunt realistically than on a top level. Um, because unless there's some, you know, an asteroid or whatever else that just takes out the entire state, uh, it's going to be by a different game unit or zone. Um, but whenever there is a decrease for bio for biological reasons in a hunt to the total number of tags available, uh, the outfitters are reduced proportionately. So if there are 12,000 total tags available in any given hunt and you know 10% of those tags, let's just say, uh, are currently going to non-residents and within that 50% are going to, 50% of those uh, allocated non-residents are going to outfitter operations then if there were a overall 5% decrease, everyone, every user group uh, outfitted, resident or non-resident, non-resident, non-outfitted, and resident uh, hunters would all be reduced proportionately. Does that make sense? Any other questions for Aaron or Jeff? Aaron, thank you for your time today. Yep, thank you for having me. Follow up from that side. You want to wrap it up? Or... Okay. Any other questions for for Cy? Oh, I got a follow up. I don't know. We just had one like forty minutes ago, so I, I don't want to take another break. It's hard to get us back. So this next section, um, I think we've done a really good job of uh, basically showing you all how complicated everybody's licensing systems are. Okay, we, we have a tendency to think we're the only state that has a complicated licensing system. And that's just because this is where we live, this is what we work with it. As you can tell from that, that's just not true. But another, there's, there's two themes I wanted to make sure there was a takeaway from those presentations. 
number one is the, the myth that we've been told that all of our Western states issue tags on the 9 and 10 issue. Right. How this task force is working. I think we've plainly shown that's not necessarily the case in all Western states, as has been stated. Um, and then the other takeaway we wanted to um, leave you with out after these two presentations is just how these other Western states have considered and treated their alpha industry as far as how they take care of that particular section of their economy by carve outs, uh, set asides, landowner licenses, whatever the case may be, they all have something uh, that does take care of that. So how did they get there? Um, the, the, the main uh, impetus that I hear, or main argument against Wyoming doing something similar than that is it's, it's not fair. So what is fair? Is it if you're in Colorado, do you have a different sense of fairness than a resident hunter in Wyoming? I mean, we they all have figured out a way to for the two uh, the three factions to get along. The, the resident sportsmen, the DIY non-residents, and the the non-resident who prefers to use our gadget services. They're all they're all working together. They all found a system where they work together. And that's all we've ever asked for or all we're gonna ask for today is, is a system that we think works within our current framework that allows us to all work together and hopefully uh, for the benefit of wildlife in addition to that for the benefit of, of Wyoming's economy. So let's uh let's roll this first uh, slide. And here's the proposal. So here's our request. I don't think this is anything out there. It's not an allocation. It's not a transferable landowner license. This is merely taking the framework of what we currently do right now with our licenses. We have, as you all know, you've been educated incredibly well on this. We have two types of licenses. We have a 40% issued in the special draw, and we have 60% issued in the regular draw. And when you break that down, of that 40%, 75% of those are issued to people with preference points, and 25% are issued to people with in a random draw. And the 60% is a regular for a less price. This bill was passed in 1988. Wayne and I remember we were there, and 60% uh, and of those tags are issued in a regular draw for preference point, 75%, 25% um, random. So when we passed this legislation in 1988, we asked the legislature, the original bill said that those tags would be split on a 50-50 basis. 50% would go special, 50% would go regular, and the special license at that time would be an outfitter draw. And it went through the legislative process, the legislature changed it to a 40-60 split, and they took the outfitter draw away and left it, and we started working under the system, I believe, in 1989. How's this work for us? Okay. Over the years, and, and I think that's a fair question because I obviously have been in this business for 40 plus years. So somehow I figured out a way to survive in the alpha business in Wyoming under a draw. Okay, and that's a fair question. I wanted to I want to answer that before we dive into why we need to change that. So I've been in the business 44 years, and this was an incredible help. When we got the special license, there was enough price differential between the special and the regular that it was an obvious choice for somebody that wanted to book a hunt with an outfitter and know that he could pick his vacation and have some level of certainty in the draw that he would be able to say, hey, I'm gonna pay the additional money for the license at better draws. More likely, I'm gonna be able to go hunting this fall. It worked for a number of years. And every time it started not to work, the key to make it work again was a license fee which benefited the department. There's a limited number of non-resident tags that are sold, so the department was able to raise more money. And then, in, so we've got 16 years of preference points. So along comes a preference point system. And funny to say this, but uh, Wyoming Outfitters and Guides Association proposed a preference point system several years before it was actually passed in the legislature. And the department pooped us and defeated that idea. And then about six years later, it was their idea, and they got a preference point system passed in the legislature for elk deer and elk for non-residents. Where are we at now? So that, that helped us again. So we, we went along with the draw, we had a special license, we had 
preference points, we've had license fees, and we've had this incredible ebb and flow with this system all the way through my 44 years being in the outfit business. So what would fix that? What would make it to where we'd level that thing out to where we wouldn't impact resident hunters, but we would have a more stable draw results? <clears throat> Draws are part of Wyoming's culture. I get that. I'm not asking to change that. I don't want to set aside. I don't want any other sort of system. I'm happy dealing with the draw. We know that's part of our culture. We get that. So we're not asking to be treated different. All we're asking is, is that you carve out that 40% license, the special license to the outfitted client to have a crack at drawing those tags. And 60% of the license remain in the, in the regular draw for the person that chooses not to use our system or help with us, or chooses to help with the rancher, or chooses to help with his friends in, in Wyoming, whatever the case may be. What is the definition of fairness? You know, I was raised, of course, my dad taught me very early, there's no such thing as fair. And I've carried that on my whole life. But if you were to say fair, would that be 50-50? Would that mean fair to you is a 50-50 split? We're not asking for that. We're just asking for the 40% of the tags to be allowed to be drawn by outfitted clients to the outfit of the business portal. Again, Fishari has a system set up. But we can draw and submit our applications in that draw pool. We'll pay more. You can raise that license fee. And in fact, we encourage that. Raise that license fee, more money to offset the fewer licenses. I just did the number real quick because Pat asked me this is a fair question. If we reduce the number of applications for Elk and Wyoming by 10,000 applications, that's $150,000. If we raise a non-resident elk fee by 250 bucks, that's 1.8 million. That's a fair exchange. We'll pay them. Our clients will pay them. In fact, I think our special license should be up to $1,950. We, we hope that a bill comes soon to do that because that's a fair price. When you have 30,000 applications right now coming to the state of Wyoming for 7,250 licenses, in a capitalist, that tells me you're way, way, way underpriced. If you had somebody or a truck dealer, you had 30,000 people come in to buy a Ford pickup truck, and you're only allowed at 7,250 by the Ford dealership, I'm pretty sure you raise your price. I'm pretty sure you're going to. So we, we advocate that. But what we're asking for is that nothing changes in the draw, it's just that the special license with preference points intact, nothing changes with that. Because we, we know the game of fish is making close to $20 million a year on these preference points. We do not want that to be affected. We want that to stay in place. And the, the, but the outfitters have the first crack at drawing these special licenses. Next slide, please. So, yes. 40% of the available pool, you're talking 40% of the 16%. Correct. So 40% of the 20% would turn less. Correct. Of the available pool we currently operate right now. That's, that's Correct. We're not asking for anything from the next slide we'll talk about. Let me ask a question. Sure. Because I was confused about this. Are you asking for the total 40% of special license? Yes, the 40% of the non-resident, or the 20%, the, the non-residents have 20% of the deer and animal tags, as you know, that's split into a 40% special draw, 60% regular. We're asking that that special draw be converted to an elevator only draw. So the only people that should draw special licenses are going to be folks without the higher <clears throat> And in some areas that would be the case. In other areas that would it would be the case. There's a number of uh, deer areas in particular where all the special licenses don't sell now. And you have zero draws, for example, Region A. So in Region A, if you're an outfitter in Region A, you're going to draw everybody you put in for using the special license for zero points. Okay. And then there's still the availability. In fact, what we're saying is under the system, anything that was issued, the outfitters have first crack at that draw. Any tags that were not issued to the outfitters, we don't want them left over. We want them to be sold by the department. But then they have a draw for those uh, applicants who weren't contracted with an outfitter to have a crack at draw those tags at a special price. I think that's different than you just answered me. You and I had this discussion. So 
start with what is a lot of the numbers for the year. 60% of that number. So this. You're asking about higher special fraud being dedicated to first crack. We have first crack and special draw. Up to 40%. Special is limited at 40% of the licenses. 40% of the non resident quota goes for sale in the special draw. 60% of the non resident quota. So I, I sent you a math question. I don't know if everyone got the email, but let's walk through that. Okay. Let me do quota area with 100 tags. Okay. Six L, 60 L tags go to non residents. Let's just assume, for assuming purposes, there are six non resident members. So 10 licenses are left for non residents. Assuming you have more than 40% of applications, that means four licenses would be allocated to the higher value licenses special drug. Yep. And assuming you have 10 landowners, 10 outfitters in that area trying to draw those four tags, one party application will wipe out all special yep. licenses. Correct. Yep. Um, and so nine other outfitters will be without clients that long. Yep. As they are now. Oh, that one. Okay. Okay. So, so let's let's talk, let's talk let's talk about that a lot. Let me finish. Okay. You know, I think what outfitters are asking for is certainty. That's the critical thing for you. Is it? Correct. That I mean, your proposal. I, I just don't see how it gives you any more certainty. Just like you just said, as it is now. I mean, that that's. That just doesn't, your math doesn't add up. Sorry. Actually, you know, and I'm just going to actually, potentially, it would be zero. You're saying that you're going to get guarantee you're going to get four of those in that, in that, but, but actual certainty is that it could be eight some years, zero other years, right? I mean, yeah, in, in that on, scenario. Yeah. Now, let's, let's talk why that scenario can play out in today's world and why it doesn't play out in today's world. If you're an outfitting operation, and your business model puts you in an area with only eight non-resident special milk licenses, you've already been out of business for a lot longer than So our business models don't do that. If you look around this room, you ask every one of these guys how they survived, every one of them, almost to a man, has a limited quota area in their operation, R2, and they have a general milk license in their operation, R2. I do, they all do. There's a reason that we've done that. There's a reason our industry is consolidated because that's a business model that survives. So if your business model is I want to be in a really good elk area, and I'll, I'll tell you who said this to me best years ago, a number of years ago, Ron Doobie, Pete's dad, used to say at our outfit meetings, there's two things you have to have to be in the outfit business. You have to have critters to hunt and licenses, okay? You take one of those away, you're out of the outfit business. In the, in the scenario that Pat painted, that outfitter is already out of business. And so you have a hole in there. Now, what happens with business models where people have those hard to draw areas? <clears throat> Taylor Ingham is a great example. He's in the front row here. He has a really nice camp in Elk Carry 45, highly sought after, hard to draw. He's never going to have enough hunters in there to have that operation solely his only uh, ability to survive. He also has a really nice camp in the general elk area, okay, where he takes about 30 hunters a year, tries to take anywhere from 7 to 18 in the yard, area 45. That's a business model that survives, okay, because he has access to try to draw general licenses, which is our easiest ones, and then also supplement that with a really high quality area to go after those people who have 16 points or 14 points, as Ash alluded to what they do in Colorado. So there's years he hits a home run. And he has 16 elk hunters in area 45. But he has that baseline of 30 to make a living to, to, to smooth that out. We all have those kind of business models. This, the situation that that's being doesn't exist. Let me follow up. I mean, how does this help an outfitter who has both limited quota in general areas, or what about an outfitter like Lee? I would guess that outfits totally in general area. Let me tell you. So with the 7250 cap, and let's just assume, just for assumption's sake, once again, 5,000 licenses 
go in limited for withdrawals. That means 2,250 general non-resident licenses that might be available. Right now, I mean, even if you took 40% of those, that's what, 800 or so, and put them into the special draw, you have, under today's system, you have 500 outfitters competing statewide for 800 licenses. So this, this whole idea of an outfitter set aside draw, I don't think it works. I, I, mean, I understand I, this. I mean, give you a I understand business models and all that, but the number, the math just doesn't work for your proposal. Say how this has evolved. Pre Wolf and pre elk explosion in central and eastern Wyoming, the Wyoming game and fish, we've been under that 7250 cap for years. Pre Wolf and pre central Wyoming elk and limit quota tags increasing, et cetera, et cetera. We used to issue about 5,200 general licenses a year, the rest went elk here. Okay, out of 7250. That number now is slightly over 4,000 that go in the general draw. What has happened, it's been kind of a self regulating thing. So uh, he's not here today. BJ Hill's a good example. He has five general license health camps. Okay. And that at one time was five different outfitting operations. So he consolidated. And he figured out a way to work with the wolf and stay in an area like that and with our current number of licenses and make that work for him. Okay, and what happened then is we've seen more of these tags get eaten up by the LQ system. And so Tyler has a number, I think we lost three, so three tags this year, three general tags. We ended up being LQ tags this year that came out of the general pool. It's kind of almost self-regulated itself because there's less hunting opportunity in those areas that the wolf have, have hit so hard. And the residents have been going to those areas. So what hunting opportunity is there has been an incredible, it's still an incredible hunting opportunity for the handful of non-residents going there for the DR outfitting cap. So it's kind of regulated itself. Now the reason the reason that we are are talking about this right now just happened last week. Okay. We went into a, a draw where we anticipated the general draw was going to draw three points for the special license. And it didn't. It drew 45% special license. There's a number of outfitters in this room who went into that draw. And, you know, we kind of chart that thing out. We think, okay, this is where it's going to be. It's going to be a 90, 95%, maybe 100% draw of this three point special. And we get pounded and have 45% draws because we've got 30,000 applications going into that draw. And now we have this, this wham. So now we have this wham. If we had had if we had 40% of those general licenses in an outfitter only draw at the special price, that would not have existed. We would have had a, we'd have had a level, and everybody that every outfitter client that went in there would have drawn, and they would have drawn with zero or one point. So I don't, I don't think you answered my question. And I mean, it, it didn't. It, it just, your math doesn't add up. I mean, there, there may be other. Ways to give certainty to outfitters, which I'm all for. But the outfitter set aside draw, the math doesn't work. It doesn't work. Show us. I just did. <laughs> no, <listen. laughs> all right, Mr. Chairman. I, let me. Let me. I think they're going to agree to disagree. On that. <laughs> okay, so let, let's talk about the pros, and then we'll pose this question. I pose this question to several residents. Okay, this is number one. But the last time we almost got this bill passed, if you take and you put 40% of those licenses where the licensed outfitters, the only one has access to those tags, they're going to have better draw odds. They're going to be an easier tags to draw. This unlicensed illegal outfitting activity is curved. Does it go away? Probably not. But it curves it to where the only people who have access to those tags have a license number behind their name. And they're the, their clients are the only ones that can draw them. That's a big deal. Unlicensed illegal act. Outfitting activity has always been a big deal in this state. And this is a, a big part of it. This proposal, as we outlined it, is revenue neutral to the department. The same number of special licenses are going to be sold under the system that we're outlining as, as we currently sell in the system right now. Revenue neutral is a big deal in the legislature. We just passed a 90-10 on the big five that lost the department $200,000. We haven't figured out a way to replace that yet. 
Maybe we raise it on non-resident health license fees to, to get that 200,000 back. Our, the proposal is we've outlined it as revenue neutral. This is a biggie. This has no effect whatsoever on resident quotas or resident products. This does not take one single license away from resident sports. <coughs> not one. I can't say that enough. No change in the current draw structure or application system. I'll let Jennifer speak to that. I'm sure somebody will have a question for it. A lot of you guys don't realize, but we have what they call a business portal right now. So when I go and log on to Game of Fish, Jennifer has given me a portal, and, and I log on to that, I apply for all my hunters' applications. I have a password for it, and I put everybody in the draw in this business portal. We refer to it as now for That's not what it's called, it's a business portal. Licensing systems can use, they have business portals too. And so we apply and then on a single screen, we can see what our parties are, how many points they have, and we can see our draw results on a single screen. It's already in place. It'd be very easy to modify that to where um, when you put into the special license, it's, it's tracked back to who actually put that honor in the license in, or that honor in the draw. There's no effect on preference points for elk deer and elk. We want to see the preference point system stay in place. It's 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 bringing the department in twenty million dollars, and our clients would we, we don't want that to change. Our clients would use it too, and we would have areas like in the, the situation where Pat's talking about, or maybe that one out there that drew that whole party. His clients had six points, so that's why they were able to draw those tags in a limited area, and so we don't want to change that. We, it's, it's a money maker for the department. We don't want to, we don't want to change it. So long-term solutions, stability in this segment of Wyoming's tourism industry and provide steady employment of staff and, and professional guides. Right now we have, uh, we have outfitters in our audience that drew at a 20, 20%, 30% rate. Uh, they're going to have to let guides go that, that normally have a job every year and cooks go that normally have a job every year. These are Wyoming residents that work in this industry, and now they're going to be unemployed this fall. Outfitted non-resident spins. This is a big one. Joe and I have had this discussion a number of times. This is a this is a policy decision by the state of Wyoming. Okay, a dead elk is a dead elk, but if we go kill that elk for six and a half times the money left behind in the state of Wyoming versus a DIY non-resident, which is fine, we're telling the DIY non-residents we have a place for you. Here's 60% of the tax. Here's your 60%, not 50 50. Here's your 60%. That's fine. There's a place for them. But we also have a place for that non resident who chooses to use our services to leave six and a half times the money behind in the state of Wyoming. Special license is currently already heavily used by the outlay industry. I painted that picture. Uh, we were the ones that got that passed in 1988. We, we continue to use it today. But it's close the gap. So the non-resident sportsmen, there's more and more of them that use that special license. Where now if you look at the general draw between the special and the regular, it's only a half a point difference in what the draw rate was. So it's closed and we need to wipe that gap. This will help the draws. This is a hard one. This this one is really hard for me to explain. So you're Mr. General Elk out there. You just got spanked this year. <coughs> You've drawn 20% of your hunters. What, what's the takeaway for next year's draw? Everybody that calls you on the phone, you're going to book them. And you're ready to slam as many applications as you can. And this is the way we used to operate this business. If we needed 1,600, we'd book 120. If we're never doing it, we're going to be, we've gone away from that because we haven't had to do that. Because with preference points and the current license we have now, it's been a softer flow of these highs and lows of our draw. When you got out there now, it's just got spanked to a 20 and 30 percent draw. Tell me every time that phone rings, whether a guy has zero point or one point, he's going to book him and he's going to slam him in the draw, and we're going to create our draws be worse. We're going to put him in the regular draw because we're going to take our people that say, okay, you've got four points, you're going to draw next year. We're going to put you in the special. You got zero points, you got one points, so let's slam you in the regular draw and hope that I draw some extra hunters to cover these losses that I, I anticipate. Then what happens when you overdraw on those? This is an outfitter's worst nightmare. You talk about bad customer service because you got to make that call to the guy and say, guess what, I drew your tag. That's wonderful news. The problem is I overdrew. 
So I got to put you somewhere else. You're a dirty SOB, no matter what. You just are. He, there's no winning in that situation. We've all made those phone calls. It, it's just, it's not right. I would much rather book 40 elk hunters and draw 40 in a special than book one single extra hunter and put him in the regular draw and, and have to make that phone call to that guy. That's where we're going to be next year. We don't have a choice. This has the, also has the potential to encourage landowners that are out there on their private land to seek licensure so they can enter into this draw. Maybe it will, maybe it won't, but it's it's a tax issue. We pay lodging tax right now. We pay sales tax on our hunts, and uh, it, there's a way of positive to that. Not a negative. They don't have to. They choose not to uh, chase tags and special license. No big deal. They can still outfit on their own private property. An outfitter draw rather than an allocation system, but is not fencing. It allows a new outfitter to get in the business. And we hear that word fencing from legislators a lot. And so there's no allocation like Idaho's. Idaho's would favor an outfitter that's currently in the business. A new outfitter would have a hell of a time breaking in. The reason it's not going to create an expansion in the outfitting industry, now a lot of you guys just don't realize this, but you cannot go to the Bridge or Teton and get a permit to outfit. You can't go to the Shoshone and get a permit to outfit. They are, there's the, the land use agencies placed a moratorium years ago on additional use. So in order for an outfitter to break into the Bridger Teton, he has to buy an existing outfitter and his use out from the Bridger Teton. I have two permits on the Bridger Teton. One of them has 275 use space. My use on that force can never be higher than 275 use space. Okay? And so it's it's already self-regulated. If I decide to sell to a brand new outfitter, I don't he doesn't have to prove use. He buys that permit, he buys the business operation, he has equal access to draw from those licenses at 40%. Private property is not going to expand our use on private property. I wish Adam was here today because he gets that when I said that very early. What's happened on private property is already, that ship's already sold. But we're not making new leases in Wyoming to suddenly create this new landmass that gets leased out. What's happened there is already coming on. There's so little interchange with outfitting operations on private property. There may be a guy that leaves a lease and somebody fills that vacuum, but you're not seeing it. Where the game fish is at, they, they have the same story. They've got X number of people who go and walk in programs and hunter management programs, and there's very little interchange with that. They're taking care of what they have, we take care of what we have. So that just doesn't create new outfitters. Um, but let's let's wrestle with the monkey. And that's the outfitter welfare. Okay, I love I love that chart. You guys know how I feel about outfitter welfare. It's All Will you take ready to take questions? I want to I want to I want to meet up outfitter welfare first. <laughs> okay. So so what is outfitter welfare? All that means is getting a license allows me to go to work. Okay. Welfare in the in the strictest sense of the word as I know it means you get to sleep till noon, watch the Flintstones, and the government sends you a check. That's what I understand as welfare. I'm pretty sure I haven't spent many days in my life watching the Flintstones and sleeping till noon. So there really is no such thing as welfare. What this does, it allows us to go to work. Okay? And let's talk by just how important that is, okay? So the license the clients Possession only lets us go to work. Outfitting is the only business in Wyoming that requires a lottery drawing to determine if a client can use your services or not. It's the only business in Wyoming that does that. Okay, there are no others. There are no other businesses in Wyoming where you have to draw your clients. By separating out some percentage of the now non resident licenses and outfitter draw, we won't have to compete with out of state licensing services that are currently dumping thousands of applications into our drawing, uh, which have raised, which have helped contribute to point creep and helped contribute to our inability to draw licenses. We can't compete with these people. That's good. That had a good question. So we have 30,000 applications last year. I don't know how many came from licensing services, Jennifer, Jennifer Maynell. Maybe it's 5,000, maybe it's 8,000. But if we had 10,000 fewer applications in the state of Wyoming, the Game and Fish Department would see a net revenue decline of $150,000. Let's 
which is $50,000 less than what we did to them by going to 90-10 on the big five with, by losing that non-resident license revenue. And we could raise the non-resident health license by 250, which the numbers already show we need to do because we've got 30,000 applications in for a product that only has 7,250 numbers. So we already know we're way at a price. If we raise that non-resident license by 250 bucks, the department sees 1.8 billion more in revenue, way, way, way overdoing anything that we would lose from an application revenue. Now here's my favorite. So in Wyoming, we have a bid preferential for contractors of 5%. A number of years ago, this got passed, right? And, it, and the logic behind it is sound. It's like, let's keep people employed in the state of Wyoming. Let's keep our tax dollars that we pay for these big projects in Wyoming. Let's keep them here. Let's keep them with Wyoming contractors. Okay, this was a number of years ago when this bill was passed. Bidding a construction job was different. It was a set of blueprints, you cuddled up in your room, and you drew up a bid. I could certainly see why the contractors needed that. Now that process is digital. You get a set of blueprints for a large job. You plug in your values, and pretty much every contractor is working off that same digital format. So you bid a $10 million job, $10 million job, and there's profit built in that $10 million. And, and then a resident contractor gets another half million dollar bid preferential on the job tax dollars. I'm not opposed to that. I think it's a great system. I think we need to keep it in place, but it's a great example of how we've taken an industry and, should, and have made a decision to take care of that industry and take care of those jobs that that industry supports. And I think it's, you know, when, you, when you say that we haven't done that for any other industries, that's not true. There's all kinds of examples, but that's to me is one of the most obvious. And, it's, and I, I speak in favor of it. I think it should stay in place. All we're asking as outfitters is a chance to carve our clients out in the draw, let them draw a tag, doesn't affect the resident hunter whatsoever. A single tag is taken from the resident hunter. And we're only, we're not even asking for half. We're just asking for 40%. We could say we want half. You know, that's fair, but we're not. We're not asking for the system to change. Larry, nail me. Well, <clears throat> I got a series of questions. So, but if there's other questions, I, I break it up. But Cy, a couple of things on, on the, um, number one, if I heard you correctly, the differential has changed, and I've seen that. In fact, in some cases, it's easier to draw regular, especially because even the DUI guys are willing to pay the higher price for the L computer. So if we were to significantly raise that, yeah, would that address a big portion of the problem? Based on your comments, it looks like so. Say it was a two thousand dollar elk tag. Does that solve most of the problems? It doesn't solve the problem, but it's, it's, it's that's what we've been doing for the last since nineteen eighty nine. The, the the way the industry has still you know gray hair still be here is from license fee increases, preference points, and special license. That's how we've made it to this point. What we're saying is is that we don't want any of that to change. We want license fees to increase. We've always felt proud of the fact that the non-resident guided customers when paying bills and, and, and is helping our Wyoming economy. We're totally proud of that. But yeah, we would totally be in support of the license fee increase. And, and I hope it comes to fourth. But at the same time, all we're asking for is, is a carve out of that 40% for the licenses and, and let us have our own draw and we won't compete with the other 60% in their draw to, to any appreciable level. There'll still be some people maybe you book somebody with 10 points and you drop them in that regular draw. That will happen. I can't, you know, it'd be silly not to. So I guess get some reward for building up his 10 points. So so the second question, Mr. Chairman. So Cy, we already have a quasi outfitter set aside for those outfitters that have camps in designated wilderness area. 33% of the all national forests in the state of Wyoming are designated wilderness. And I didn't ask Idaho or New Mexico because there's only one other state in the nation that does this, and that's Alaska. And they only do it for brown bears, mountain goats, and sheep. So 
how do you address that issue that gets back to being able to draw on the fact you have a wilderness camp right now, and I think almost every one of them are general license. Um, you have you have a hun almost a hundred percent access to that non-resident pool. So how does that fit into this proposal? So that's the first part of that question. And then the second part, there's also uh, an area 55, 56, 59, 60, 67, another quasi non-resident pool. And it's called type nine licenses that are way under prescribed by residents because they're all general license units. And yet those roll under the draw, those roll into that non-resident. I mean, I, again, and I'm not opposed necessarily to an outfit or set aside, but we have at least two scenarios out there right now where we have some quasi. How do those fit into your proposal? You talk about getting rid of the wilderness law, we did the 40% keep that in place because that's already a set aside. Well, it, it, the licenses, so let's, let's say you're going to go to the thoroughfare and help the wilderness there. You still have to have its general license, which is the same license that's good in Thunder Basin grasslands on, on, as a general license or on the Grays River, which is a general license not the wilderness area. So we haven't carved anything out as far as how to get that license, which allows you to go to work. As far as the, as far as the wilderness guide law, it goes back a very, very long time. Reason it was passed, and I think in today's world, there's a whole lot different reason as why it should be maintained in today's world. And in today's world, the it's it's that big brown toothy thing that our outfit industry, and I'm gonna, I'm going to speak highly of our outfit industry. We help save that bear. We continue to operate in those areas where that bear was uh, listed, and uh, game and fish and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service came to us and said, hey. You know, you guys have an option. We can either we can either work with this bear and bring him back from the brink of extinction, or you're going to be out of business. And be, maybe we have to close off this entire part of the world to all human incursion to save this bear. And that was really how the question was posed to us. And our outfitters did everything that they needed to do. They they protected their clients. They protected the bear. They they uh, complied with food storage orders. The whole nine yards. And the success story of the bear is directly tied to the outfit industry that operates in those areas. And we, we, we have very few human bear conflicts. We do have some bears do die, but there's several outfitters in this room that can attest to the fact that the way we coexist with the bear is, is a success story, and it's a higher success story than a DIY hunter would coexist with that bear. And that's just the fact. We have the equipment, the livestock, the camps to all uh, provide a safe hunt in a safe environment. Does that work in every area in the state of Wyoming where there's no grizzly bears? That's a different story. I'm just going to talk about the areas where there are grizzly bears, and that system needs to stay in place. So, Mr. Chairman, for clarification points, I, I'm sure I know what you mean, but I want you to go ahead. So you're talking about the non resident DIY guy, right? Correct. And, and Larry, you know as well as I do, the non resident DIY, you know as well as I do that the the vast majority of Wyoming's resident sportsmen have, have have vacated those areas where there's grizzly bears. And you can you can go to the game of fishes numbers and see the numbers. They just, you know, I, I showed you at the uh, two task force meetings ago, there was only 49 resident hunters that went into the thoroughfare in 2020. And and I remember <laughs> when I used to go in the thoroughfare for my own recreational hunting, there was hundreds of residents that went in there. They, and so we have use in there now through the outfitted uh, camps and, and non-residents, and residents do hire outfitters to go in the thoroughfare. It's safer. I mean, it's just, it's incredibly dangerous to go to those places if you're not uh, equipped how to, and, and have the knowledge how to do it. So I'll defend, I'll defend that. It's, it's kind of an accidental deal. That's not how the Wilderness Guide Law originally came about, but it's been a huge benefit to have it. And the second aspect of your question was, right now there's a significant number of areas uh, deer and antelope in particular, where the special licenses are undersubscribed now. They just don't, they're just not sold. So even as outfitters, we're not using a special license, we're using a regular license. And in this type of system, none of that would change. But what I'm, what, what I'm trying to do is paint a vision for what happens 10 years from now. This has been a huge source of contention between resident sportsmen and, and, and outfitters for years, this whole draw thing. 
And we, we've, we've, we're here mainly because of this whole 9 to 10 concept. That's why we're all in this room. We've been here for a year. We've got another half a year to go. That's what drove this task force. I submit to you that if we would have passed this bill in its original format in 1988, that we probably wouldn't even have this task force to talk about right here, right now. And the reason that is, is, is leaving these quotas with the commission, which I'm a, a huge proponent of, on these quota splits between residents and non-residents. If you come to an outfitting organization, say, hey, we need to cut non-resident tags, and he can see that a 40% carve-out has already been in place, and his clients are still have a better chance of drawing those tags, or 100% chance of drawing those tags, what kind of what kind of cooperation are you going to get from that industry when, when the commission comes to us 10 years from now or 12 years from now and says, hey, our, you know, our real deer have continued to tank. We're now down to 12 and we need to cut tanks. So, I mean, this is this should have been done a long time ago. We probably wouldn't even be having this discussion. That's my, my argument. Yeah, a couple more questions, Pat and Brian. Brian. Sorry. Just follow up and then I'm done. David. Okay. <laughs> So just, and I don't want to respond, but I don't know what was all driven by the bear. Montana and Idaho uh, have grizzly bears and they don't have a guide at all. And they're part of the recovery program. And then, you know, regarding, you know, the number of residents hunting in the thoroughfare in 70, 71, and all those areas, a lot of that's just driven by the elk. I mean, we used to run general seasons into the middle of November and all that 70, 71 and some of that stuff. So a lot of that's just opportunities being driven by that. But beside the real question that I've got is, so three years ago, I ran a bill in the legislature that had a 50% outfitter set aside. 50% of all non-resident licenses would have gone to outfitters and your association opposed them. What's changed now that it's 40%? So what's changed in three years? The fact that we've been given the opportunity to have that discussion in this format and flesh it out in this format to have this, this task force to have an incredible amount of weight with the legislature, that's what's changed. And, and it's your bill scared us to death. There's no doubt about it because of the cut of non-resident licenses for sure. But there was no way to have a, a good, meaningful discussion and flesh that out part of the legislature. There, there just isn't. And the fact that we've been here for a year, we've got another half a year to go to flesh these important wildlife issues out like the South Better Draw is what's, in my opinion, has changed. The fact that we were able to do this. And you said it best to me when you said it that uh, like December that you felt like anything that comes on this task force with the two past recommendations got about a 95% chance of making it through the legislature. And that, I have not forgotten that that stuck with me, but I think you're right. Legislature asked us to fix these things, to fix these problems between all these factions, and that's why I believe in this process. And I think that it's time to have this discussion. It's time to it's time to elevate this discussion. Let the residents let the residents comment on it for the next month into June. So I'm asking you to pass it out of this uh, task force for comment. Let them comment on it, and then come back in June and beat those comments up and see if, if it's if it's worth go to the next level and ask the legislature to take it up. Pat, then Brian. How many outfitters do you think are in We run, uh, that's a really good question. So we've kind of, we kind of dropped 350, which was a standard number. Pete and I were on the two, on the, on the state board, we ran that number a lot. Now we're at about that 320, 325 range. So, yeah, but some of that's been consolidation, Pat. You talk about, I was talking to you about how our business models have changed. I've acquired additional outfitters, so that's one of us personal business to make to make the business model and the numbers work. So let me follow up. If you take forty percent of seventy two fifty, that's about twenty nine hundred bucks. If I divide that, right? Not all of them. Right. Well, that's you're saying that those, those are there's some that don't hunt elk. Yeah, but what Rusty's saying is not all 320 feet, 25 outfitters hunt elk. I think there's only, I think the state board of outfitters authorizes about 40 outfitters that are strictly during elk. About 280 of them on species are elk.
Contention is that every single outfitter has taken general license, general license outfitters. That's not the case. No, I'm not. I'm not saying anything about general. I'm taking 40 percent of the total number of non-resident licenses in this. All right. Seventy-two million. So, Larry, you're the statistician. Help me out here. No. So I think we got. I, I know <laughs> Albert and Brian and Dwayne. So Albert, you had. You go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, I think it was answered. So over a five-year period, you know, what is the percentage today of outfitted non-resident? So in other words, if you're asking for 40 over the last five years, have you guys been seeing 38 percent, 42 percent? What's and do we even know that? Yeah, we do. It it, it averages around 33 percent of the non-residents draw allowing health license hire us for their services. 12 to 14 percent of the deer now. But on this, Mr. Chairman, so but on this special special permit, of course, that's the that's the deer has it as well. Is so are you are you proposing 40 percent for all species, 40 percent for elk, or 40 percent for deer and elk? What's the proposal? Yeah, the way that the current system is right now on those three species, 40 percent of those tags are sold as a special license. We're proposing that the outfitters have first draw, outfitted clients have first draw at those licenses. Any that aren't sold to an outfitted client would roll into a uh, draw that would be available for a DIY hunter. So they don't want to apply for that license. It would take a couple of years to flesh that out. But over after a couple of years, period of time, when people fall on that demand index, mm -hmm. they'd actually see that, oh, okay, there's always special licenses available in this, this animal area after the outfitter draws. So you, you would be revenue neutral to the department for sure. So Sai, do you think you thought through this on different changes and I have uh, consequences of the well this up Chris, you but 70 I'm talking only out the 7250 cap goes away. It's having positive or negative implications. Well there's always a positive implication to the non-resident draw if there's more licenses issued, but the 7250 cap goes away. Okay, here's how I envision the department would probably do that. They would look at a regional, they wouldn't just get rid of that cap and come up with a new magic number. I think what they would do is they'd institute a regional elk management plan in these general areas. So you take an area that has maybe too much uh, non-resident use in it, and maybe the residents in that particular region are saying, you know, there's just too many of these guys competing with us or whatever. You can see an area where that could possibly have a lower um, a number of non-residents utilizing that part of the world than they currently do. And that's why this is essential because that whatever that quote is, let's say that the 
and says, okay, we only want 300 non-residents there, but 40% of those tags, if you're an outfitting business, that means 40% of those tags you have the ability to draw from. So that's 120 of those 300 tags, right? And so what does that do to the, what is the benefit to the resident sportsman on his own in that general health care cut? And I, I, I sent this to you guys in an email. Outfitting operations are only profitable if they have hunters spread out every week of the season, okay? So if you take 24 elk hunters, you have 24 elk hunters, and you have three weeks of season, you go eight, eight, and eight. You don't go 24 the first hunt. You can't find that many guides. You can't, you don't have that much use of your, you don't have that many horses. So what the benefit is to the resident sportsman in that particular situation, he's going to be there the first five days. We, have, we know your numbers show that he's going to be there that first week that he's gone. Same way the DIY non-resident. So we have now taken 16 of those non-resident tags and we spread them out to the second and the third week when nobody's up there. So we've taken 16 people pollution factors out of the way of the resident heart. I don't know how that, I don't know how that's negative. I don't see a negative to that because every, every comment I read coming from the sportsman's task force is there's too many people, there's too many people, there's you know, my opportunity's down, it's just you know, everybody's there because they're all hunting the first week. And if we put them in an outfitter camp, that's not how it works. We spread them out over the entire season. We have to. Wayne, you got a question? Just uh, some comments. Um, the number one reason, go back to your slide there, uh, of the uh, the, non, uh, the illegal outfitter not being able to, to draw in that license, that's something that's not even argued. He's out of, he's out of 40% of his, his uh, possible business. And there are people that do that, believe it or not. And, and so I don't think you can argue that. The wilderness guide law, the other, one other aspect is, is I was testifying in committee, but at the time, one time when that wilderness guy thought was, was tried to uh, be abolished was search and rescue. Search and rescue from Park County came in and testified in committee and, and testified that when they had calls in the back in wilderness areas, that the outfitters by far were way better prepared to handle medical emergencies than the do-it-yourself. So those are, those are just two things. The other thing is when, when we tried to get this passed back in the 90s, we actually did a survey of the outfitters that, that hunted elk and asked them what they needed to sustain their business. And that number Coincidentally, it comes out to about 2,750 elk licenses. And that was back in the 90s. So we're asking what we've always needed 20 years ago. So what, what we're asking for, and it may not be obvious to those who don't live and breathe this stuff like we do, we're not asking for anything other than a pool license that's not affected by licensing services is affected less by point creep and a chance for us to go to work. I don't want to lay on my couch and watch the Flintstones. I want to go to work. <laughs> and that's all we're asking for. And if you if you really think about it, and to have zero effect on a resident license, I Dusty Four years here, we've talked about this. Tell me how this proposal affects you as a resident sportsman in a negative manner. We can have him do that through public comment. But, <laughs> so, I thought I'd try. Uh, no, I'm just trying. Get off your soapbox for a second. I can't set aside the outfitter. Out, take off your outfitter set aside hat and tell me about these two alternative proposals. The Montana system where outfitted clients get an extra preference point and therefore get an added chance, non resident can get an extra preference point if they go with an outfitter. We heard it worked very well this year. 
what are your thoughts about a system like that? And then I have a second question in this moment. You know, I, I don't know that we could we could actually reel our system in back far enough to what they did. So what they to explain further what Montana did. So if you didn't apply this year for license, you lost all your points. And if we did that to I mean We've already heard such an outcry now of changing the system from a preference point to a bonus point system from non residents. I don't know how we were to say, okay, if you didn't apply for a license in 2023, all those preference points are gone to these non residents. I personally, I, I would be in favor of that. So, but to the other, to the bigger part of that, and, and I think this is really where it comes from me from the heart, is I get so sick of people saying, what do they do in the other states? We're Wyoming. This is Wyoming. And we brought these other states here not to, to try to mimic their system. We brought them here to show you that these other state legislators, these other state economies put value on their industries. They said, your industry is worth enough to the state of Montana that we're going to protect it to help it thrive and survive. Mexico did the same thing, Colorado's done the same thing, Idaho's did the same thing. We're not asking for, we're not asking for a revolutionary new system. I, I would probably speak against taking and mimicking what another state does and just take what we currently do and modify it to where it works for the industry. Is it a perfect system? I don't think that their systems are perfect either. But I think, I think they tried to take care of their industry. That's all I'm asking. So I, so I, they, I get all that, but. So are you against us looking at a, a proposal like that where outfitted clients get extra preference points in the draw? No, I'm not against it. Uh, and the, the suggestion I made in my email to the task force was get rid of this stupid, arbitrary, and capricious 7250 cap, regionalize elf licenses, and let the department who's best suited decide how many licenses to issue in a given area. And I propose that those additional general non-resident licenses would be issued not on an 84-16 split. I mean, that's that's within the power of the commission. If we got a boatload of elk in Central Wyoming or Eastern Wyoming, they need to manage elk, they could issue additional non-resident licenses that where a non-resident could come here and kill a whole elk and hopefully kill three or four cow elk along the way. So I mean. What is your thought about that versus going to a an outfitter set of sets? I, I'm totally and have been a proponent of eliminating the cap for years. Now I'm a proponent of, of regionalizing our general health licenses, but it doesn't fix that area in Sublet County, for example, it's a general area where there's an ordinary amount of DIY non-residents hunting in that area, impacting those residents. This is a way of taking 40% of those licenses, no matter what that quote is going to end up like in that region, and carving them off and putting them in out there's camps that we're hiding from that, the, the pollution at the trailhead, et cetera, et cetera. We're putting them out over the whole city. So I like my idea in conjunction with what the removing cap is and regional licenses and looking at preference points, all of those. The case I'm trying to make is it's time that Wyoming lets this, lets this get flushed out. And let's it lets the legislature look at it. If we if we move it forward and ask TRW to look at it, the case I'm trying to make is let's let TRW flush this out with our help and and give it a fair hearing. So, you mind if I or you do you have a follow up? No, I'm done. Okay, <laughs> just making sure. So, Sai, uh, this this question maybe kind of follows up on Senator Hicks's is. Um, you have 320 outfitters and which you know, I mean, the, the percentage of them are here, but are we going to get to a point, I guess, you know, we'll have, we'll have this opportunity to hear from them, but we're not going to get to a point in legislature that happens with what happened with the, your bill, the 50, 50 bill, where we get there and maybe only 80% or you think your guys are all going to be on board. I mean, if this does make sense, I mean, to me, in, in my mind, it makes sense having, you guys are asking for 40% set aside licenses, similar but different than the other states, that whether it's deer, antelope, or elk, that there's a portion of these that are going to, we're gonna value the outfitters, the licensed outfitters, 
and you're going to have some certainty that you're going to have certainty that you're going to get licenses. Is everybody on board? Is what I'm asking. Wow. <laughs> outfitters. I was, the outfitters. I was absolutely shocked. There was a single resident hunter who went to TRW to testify against managing whitetail differently than mule deer. And where there are two different species, that actually caught me flat foot. I didn't, I didn't see that one coming. So I personally would say that you could get you could get that one person out there or, or whatever that could, could lobby against it. There's no way I can get 100% compliance from. <clears throat> but most i mean it, it does give certainty to the outfitters I, i'm just wondering we, flesh, we have fleshed this out as an organization on multiple occasions okay. and this is our this is our our best our best option that we, as we see it recognizing the fact that we we have a culture in this state for draws so we're not asking that culture to change this is still a draw all we're asking is and we're asking for less than half asking for 40 percent 60 percent is still available for uncle tom etc etc we're now asking jennifer to change the system to create a whole complete different system of drawing we're just asking that we have an opportunity as our clients to draw from this 40 percent pool it's going to lower our draws and general licenses we're going to be back to where we're drawing our non-resident clients with zero points and we're not going to have to compete, compete with the ten thousand applications that are coming from these licensing services that are annihilating us right now so it's that's josh yeah internally uh, and I, I can appreciate that you weren't able to get consensus on this but uh what what was the detractors of this within wyoga that weren't in favor of this i haven't heard any no. but i'm sure there. i'm not saying there isn't any out there but they haven't expressed it to us mr chairman quick question so si. how many licensed out there big game out there and i wrote it that I can't find it. It's around 320. 320? Wow, we have about 40 of those are deer to have a ball. This is about 180 operations that rely on the milk. How Two many eight. members of the white? 280. Oh. 280. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So if there's so 320 big game. How many how many members in your association? Because not all licensed South members are a member of white. Okay. So we've had, we've gone rounds and rounds of this before, but so so we run around 100 to 105 members of Wyoga. That 100 to 105 members guide 76% of the non-residents using out there in Wyoming. So the market share is dominated by those members who are members of Wyoga. Obviously, they're members of Wyoga because they have the most clues, correct? So you have about 200 plus outfitters in the state of Wyoming that are taking 24% of the hunters. And it, and it, and it, it really, the bigger outfitters are members of Wyoga because they're full-time outfitters and they're not taking 10 or 12 hunters and watching the footsteps. Any, any follow-up to that? Any other questions to say? Joe, nothing? Well, um, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. I'm trying to decide if I should wait just for our subcommittee report or not. But one, one thing I guess I'd, I'd throw out there for, for maybe clarity for the task force and um, that's got me, me thinking a little, a little differently. Just, just I, I think to be clear, what what we're interested in, I think, is preserving as much as possible the economic impact of the non-resident hunter. That seems to be weighted substantially towards outfitters. If you come and they go with an outfitter, they're going to leave more dollars on the state of Wyoming than if they come and do it themselves. So I, I don't know that that I. That, that we're trying to figure out how every outfitter has, um, has assurance they're going to get so many clients or things like that. I mean, there, there's just going to be some market-based competition that, that outfitters are going to have to struggle for. So at the end of the day, if Cy loses all, you know, clients, I don't care as long as the total outfitting industry stays robust. So that's the first thing. Um, if there's a better way to do that than taking that, that special out, you know, that's probably worth digging into a little bit more without substantially changing, you know, our system. And that's the piece I keep thinking about. But I, so I'm, I guess I'm not so interested in ensuring every outfitter has a chance to draw, um, you know, that, that, that are all have the, the, I can't remember what you said, Pat, the, the assurance or the, the certainty. certainty. Yeah. Outfitters are looking for certainty yeah. that year to year, they can have enough clients <clears throat> to make their outfitting business run. And I understand that. Yeah. I, I, I want, 
clients in my law firm year to year to year. So I can pay my overhead and I can pay my health. So I think it's certain <coughs> that's what outfitters need. And how do we get there? And I understand that. I think that's a great thing for the outfit industry, which is important. How do we get there? Yeah. I'm not convinced this is the solution. And I just want to make sure we preserve the economic impact of the outfitting industry. Um, and that may mean that, that that it looks a little differently outfitter to outfitter. That's a competitive marketplace that winery outfitters have to navigate. But if there's a different way to ensure that we have that economic impact stabilized, if not increased, and if that means we shift more of the, the do-it-yourself non-residents to outfitted non-residents, that may be a good thing. I don't think it's resident, but most people care. I haven't heard any substantial great about that but the the way we have this special versus regular you know setup in wyoming has always intrigued me because the special basically says if you either got extra money or you're willing to part with it you might get better draw odds and uh, you know i don't know what policy statement is really driving that one so using that current system to accomplish this passing on a larger portion of the cost to non-residents may make, make sense all right, Dwight, and then uh, we've got Adam Teton online to, to ask a question as well. Yes. Maybe to address the question of uh, whether everybody's going to be in favor of this. I, I can't imagine a legal licensed outfitter, deer and antelope or elk, that would not be in favor of this. I can imagine the illegal outfitter not being in favor of it. They're probably going to come out against it, but that's a different deal. It's a different ballgame. I, get, I mean, why would you not, if you're not licensed outfitter, why would you not be in favor of it? I, I don't understand. I just don't understand. Not taking anything away from the resident, not taking really any more licenses than the, than the industry has historically took for 40 years since I've been here. And I'm not a Full disclosure, I'm not a revenue outfitter anymore. It doesn't make any difference to me. But it does make a difference to me what is going to happen to this state if we don't do something for this outfit. And Dwayne, just as a point of clarification, it, it seemed to me that Cy was indicating that he didn't have consensus. And so I was just curious if there was some that were being vocal within the organization. But that that's... We, we have not received any vocal uh, against comments at all. I just, I'm just smart enough to know that there's, you can always get blind so I'm sure. All right, let's, uh, I think Adam has a question for you, Cy, or maybe just to the task force in general. Adam, can you hear us? I can, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. I uh, apologize for not being there uh, in person, but uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, Sai, thank you very much for putting all this together. Uh, I will be very honest. At best, I might be cautiously optimistic on this subject matter. And that's primarily from feedback I hear from other DIY folks, both resident and non-resident. Um, as far as the economics and free market approach to business, where I tend to choke on this idea of set asides or 40% of an existing non-resident quota, um, it, it, it's not extremely palatable in that free market, free enterprise, supply and demand conversation. It's very much uh, straightforward earmarks and guarantees an industry business. Now, I will also say very tongue in cheek, if this does go through Cy, would you please lobby the state investment board to do the same thing for private investors and state pensions and encourage the state to provide all pensions for independent financial advisors, much like myself, because I would appreciate 40% of a guaranteed business as well. So there, there's a little bit of tongue in cheek comparison there, but uh, I also feel that the outfitting industry in the state is extremely strong. And I do understand that there are some, some pitfalls with increased DIY interest, or there's some pitfalls uh, that I may not even be aware of, but I, to echo maybe what Joe said, this might be the right conversation to start, but it may not be the right solution. So I'd, I'd yield my time after that. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Adam. I got a question. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Adam, I got a question for you. Um, as a resident sportsman looking at this proposal as it is, do you see any negative 
effects on the resident hunter's ability to draw a license or have access to programs for this proposal? No, for the for the resident hunter, I don't, Cy, and that's where I my cautious optimism comes into play. Um, because for a resident, I don't see it being a bad deal, but I also know that we're not just totally reliant on resident income. And I also don't want to look at the non-resident strictly as a, a cash cow that we can, you know, continue to milk and we'll continue to provide wonderful bounty for years and years to come. That may be the case. I just feel like when the second we start pigeonholing ourselves into that approach, that we're very close to shooting ourselves in the foot potentially. Um, and I also, again, I'm not a huge fan of a public asset subsidizing a private industry. And anytime you're setting aside or guaranteeing or, and this is where I have trouble with landowner licenses and transferability there also. So it's kind of a, a convoluted uh, understanding in my own brain. But when we start leveraging public assets for private gain, and it's only a small amount of private gain, I, it's a it's a very tough uh, conversation for me to get on board with, if that makes sense. Uh, you know, let me back to, uh, you know, to my personal example. I have a cousin who comes from Colorado once a week. He always applies for special licenses because he has a better growing chance. Suddenly, that is gone. Uh, he has to just go in the regular draw. And so, you know, as a resident sportsman, I guess, let's pick my cousin out there. I think there will be some folks, resident folks, who will say, we don't like this. So I just throw that out there. I have no idea how many that is. But it prohibits, you know, a kid coming home and hunting dad or a kid that hunted so I come back and it just it puts their draw way down. Well, I don't think providing the certainty we need to give our out to the industry where we could do it different ways. But um, we would certainly take the 60% of the regular license as an outlander draw and do that with 40% special. <laughs> <laughs> just, a, just a lot. Yeah, I was just going to. I guess I have a question for, for everybody to chew on a little bit. If, if we did this, would we see would we see any difference or, or more pressure uh, on landowners who currently don't have outfitters or don't have you know that kind of a they're pretty much open to, to hunting or they may charge a trespass fee fee? Do they would we see more pressure on them to either outfit their property or outfit their area or sell, you know, their rights or their, their hunting to, to an outfitter. Would there be more pressure if an outfitter knew they were going to get more, you know, more certainty on their licenses, would they be out looking to, to buy up some more of the, of the private property or, or would, would the private property owner have more pressure on him to, to go that route? You know, Tony, I think I addressed that earlier. I don't, I don't see how. I mean, it's it's over as far as you know. These landowners that you're referring to had the ability to do this since the special license was created in 1989. They had the ability to lease their places or, or make a system on their places already, and, and it, it's just stagnant. You can follow the game of fish's numbers on, you know, their block, their their version of the block management of the public lands. Management areas, and you you know you saw that increase in the decline or the increase, and it's leveled them off. It's just they're just not enrolling for a while. They were doubling acreage every year, and it's just not doing that. Same way the outfit industry, we have the ability right now to lease these properties. It's just it was just not happening. But there's another there's another positive side to it. You know, at some point in time, we're going to have to address how we. We take care of these ag producers who are growing all these elk. And if, if a, a ranch that I'm on right now is receiving eighty, ninety thousand dollars in uh, lease fees for me, and there's two or three thousand head elk on the ranch, 
if they can continue that flow, does that, and that ranch I'm giving an example about has stayed out of applying for damages because those fees that they receive from my clients has, has kept them satisfied enough to where they don't go and participate from damages from the game fish. Never have, never file a damage claim ever. They had the game fish bring them some fence out to fence some haystacks up. So maybe, maybe that's the benefit that, that, you know, New Mexico doesn't have that much. Right? They, they figured out another way to do it to pay these landowners to raise up because they can't pay damages. But I think anybody who, who hasn't looked at this and hasn't been listening for the last year isn't paying attention if he doesn't think some, some, some ships get ready to change in the state on, on these ag producers feeding these out. Some stuff is really getting, is going to happen and it's going to be monumental. And so anything you can do to keep that damage number down, if this is the situation that's part of it, I can see that as bad. So um, I just have a little bit of time before lunch. And so we can we certainly want to take some public comment on this, but we also want to know if there's any temperature to move this to, to a for public comment in the next couple of weeks before the June meeting. And so um, what's the committee's pleasure on this? We, we can take some public comment from in here on this in the next, go ahead. Brian. I was just going to say, I think before, I think, you know, I heard some feedback after the last meeting that there was some disappointment that we made decisions on moving something forward before we took public comment. I just think it might be a good idea to do public comment first before we make it, you know, I realize we're not necessarily going to make a recommendation, but it would be a recommendation to let public comment. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I'm perfectly fine with that. Here, go ahead. Yeah, so there's, I mean, there's several ideas bouncing around, right? There's a set aside draw, there's the lift the cap, there's, you know, the the Montana thing of the bonus points, you know, and another one I've kicked around is, you know, you could go 50, 50 on that draw and increase, you know, make 50% for the special draw and increase that fee a bit. I think that gives more opportunity to, to uh, out there. And it also provides more dollars to the department. So I think there's, there's all these issues around out there, right. About, around that industry. And I wonder if, the public comment thing is just simply go out and ask the public, you know, what are your what are your thoughts about stabilizing the the out there industry? And are there things we can do? And there's been these things suggested, and then you could at least get some comment back because they all kind of fit together, right? You may not make them one, but not all. Or you may end up not doing any of them, but I think they're they're interrelated. Yeah, I think I think they are. I think one of the things that this that this proposal, because it comes from the outfitter industry itself, you know, I mean, I think they that it is interesting because it, what it doesn't do was some of the things it doesn't do is um, want uh, uh, licenses, you know, uh, transferable licenses. I think that's it's kind of taken that off the table. It's basically said well, we want to set aside, but we have a pool so we can we can draw. We're not asking for your actual set aside, and I mean your actual transferable license, and, and I think that's that's certainly more palatable to the sportsmen um, around Wyoming. So uh, I think that's really important. But I but I also think that the seventy two fifty thing is, I mean I think it's tied to it, but I actually don't think it is in a way because I I think what the outfitters are asking for is some, some actual certainty on. The business and so your stability to the outfitter industry, I think, is a great question. I mean, I think that's what what this does. It would be a very general question. I, I'm I'm open to suggestions on that, but um, yeah. So, I, how, how does this proposal stack up against 9010? So, so let's look at the crystal ball. In, in our world, in our world, if, if there is such a thing as an outfitter draw, and I'm a huge proponent, and so is our industry, of leaving those uh, quota splits with the commission. I think that has to be within their purview. We don't know what's going to happen 10 years from now with mule deer. We don't know if we're going to end up with mule deer across the entire state. Um, limited quota. I, 
I can't imagine we're not going to at some point in time. I mean, those, those poor things are down 40%. They're just, they're crashing. So we have to figure out a way to hunt that which is left. And then you have uh, antelope, but well, we're down 18,000 antelope licenses from when we were in 2018. It, it's a huge number. So things come and go. <laughs> That's why it needs to stay with the commission. That's how we define these quota splits. We have to get this in place first to understand how the outfitting industry is going to react at some point in time. 10 years you come and say, okay, guys, we're out of mule deer. We got 150,000 mule deer left in the state of Wyoming. We're going to limit a quota and we got to figure out how to hunt them. And if we haven't put this in place to where we have the ability to look at that as outfitters and say, okay, my unit's going to be limited quota, there's going to be 15 tags or 20 tags, and 40% of those are going to be the special draw. See how that affects us? That's right. I'm not asking that. I'm That's, asking you if, if your proposal, this proposal was to go with 40%, if the, the, the body or, or whatever goes to 90 10 on this version, so instead of not 80 20, and now it's 90 10, does this proposal still hold up? Is there still enough licenses to make it work? It, quite possibly in today's numbers, for sure. Today's numbers, you think about, you know, the two regions as well as I do. Well, I know animal regions. You know the animal regions. Go down to 10%, 20%, 10%. There's outfitters in the right here with themselves. And there's other other regions in the state of Wyoming, like Area 61, for example. So Area 61 right now issues 40 non resident licenses. Okay. And there's, if you check the outfit reports, virtually on an annual basis, there's no outfitted hunts that take place there. It's a, it's a max point draw. You take the DIY guy away from that pool where there's 20 or there'd be uh, 16 tags and go to the 40% draw. Now you're going to have outfitted clients in area 61 now. And right now, so you don't have a problem with the cost of the team. I think, it's, I think it, what I think it does, I'm not in favor of any kind of quota split reductions. We have to have this in place before you see us look at any kind of quota splits in the future that because we'll know how it affects us but i'm confused again i mean are you in favor of 90 10 or are you again i'm but, against it I, I think but i think it's i'm not putting words in your mouth if they have if outfitters had their certainty on those tags it's probably more palatable i mean because they know for sure you're going to get 40 percent of those tags which means what you're saying is it's going to open up an outfit and a potential outfitting in areas that normally don't. Correct. And you take the I-80 corridor, there's very little outfit that takes place along the I-80 corridor for animal because of the 14, 15, 60 points it takes to draw those areas. And then you can check our outfit reports and you'll see that the area 61, the example that Pat and I are both familiar with. On most years, there are no outfitted clients that take place in area 61. Under this type of scenario, with 20% of tags going non residents, 200 licenses being issued, that's 40 total tags, 40% of those, that's 16 of those licenses now have potential to be drawn from outfitters. So if that changes in the future and they drop that to a 90 10, there's still 200 tags, there's 20 tags there. Um, Forty percent of those would be that be eight that would go to the to the special draw. You might get a different view from the industry on how that they you know how it's going to affect them now. It's like okay, there's still eight tags to draw. You no, know, you know how much I love Area 61. I just run the numbers for this year's quota. You're you're back. You're talking about ten tags. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you are not going to make a living there. It's in addition to a hundred outfitters. Trying to get 10 decks, one group wipes it out. Do you think there'd be 100 out there working for Area 61 and take a chance on having that many holes in their schedule? Of people not around. I just don't see it. I mean, it doesn't work that way. One of the numbers your proposal guarantees each outfitter no more than 10 licenses. Our proposal doesn't guarantee an outfitter anything. What it does is it carves out 40% of the licenses that are available from the quota set by the commission to so outfitted clients to drive by the number of outfitters. Provides a possible certainty for 10 licenses. I don't think any outfitter in this room can live on hunting 10 clients. And no. we, didn't, we didn't guide any in 61 last year. We were I'm talking about elk. I'm just using that as an example. Elk is, elk is a much easier deal, much easier. 
because they come up in general license, forty percent of the general license, whatever that is. <clears throat> so that's why we have area authorization. There isn't the board of outfitters knows how many health area authorizations there are. Certainly not three hundred and nineteen. It's I don't know how many. What would you guess? General outfitters in, in, in area sixty one. How many? Probably the board probably has issued maybe eighteen outfitters that have area authorization there. And most years there are zero outfitted hunters that guy have opened it. Thirty six. The map is if you you have every outfitter in the state competing for sixteen hundred non resident general licenses. And, and that's what the 7250 cap. It just seems to me, Cy, the problem is the 7250 cap, it's point creep. You folks wanted, outfitters wanted, as you admitted, preference points, which are broken. And you're blaming this on licensing services, that they're increasing the demand for licenses. I understand you want certainty. I want to give you certainty, but I, you know, it's, it's, you, it's just, it's crazy that. Outfitters in this state are competing for 1,600 <coughs> general non resident health licenses. You've got to fix that before you figure out how to give the outfitting industry more certainty. So, so we took how many general licenses did we take last year? 1,681. So, so we take the same number. Same number. Same number in, in special draw. But draw was with zero points, Pat. That's that's the that's the crux of the argument. We're not going to take four point four and a half points next year to draw that same license because we don't have we won't have to compete with the licensing services. We won't have to compete with the DIY guy. They will be on the regular side chasing those sixty percent of the tags. We'll be in a draw for ourselves. <laughs> Chasing the exact same number of licenses amongst ourselves for the exact same number of licenses, zero points. That's the deal. Yep. So, so I appreciate that. Um, you need to go to comment? No, no I think no. we're going to eat lunch and then we're going to go to comment. Yeah. After lunch, we're going to come back in and we're going to take take some comments on here. And I apologize that, but they have food laying out there. And so, well, thank you everybody for that. Yeah, really and before, before any of you from the public leave, if you, if you want to comment and haven't filled out a sheet, be sure to do that before you grab lunch. Because as Rusty mentioned, as soon as we come back from the lunch break, we'll, we'll start right with public comment. We have one online. Is, it, is that all, Laura? Is just the one? White. Yeah, white. <laughs> okay, will you be all right with white? <laughs> we'll wait till after lunch. Let's just, let's just plan 1245. 12.45, we'll start public comments. <laughs>
First off, just want to say thanks to Adam for chiming in there. He had some good words to add after the um, help better discussion. Um, one major frustration I've had, uh, why should proponents of outfitting get so much time to stand and present their agenda in front of the task force when public hunters and their representatives are limited to public comment periods? Seeing that outfitting is already well represented on the task force, these additional speakers seem to greatly indicate an unfair bias. Uh, they're only asking for 40%. I'd like to take this time to ask for one guaranteed tag for myself every year. One tag shouldn't make a difference, right? Well, it all makes a difference in the, in the overall general fairness of the allocation of public resource. So just keep that in consideration when you, you think, oh, this shouldn't make a difference and it's just whatever it is. Uh, in recent years, one could argue that nobody has done more for the sport of hunting in terms of popularity, recruitment and support than hunting filmmakers. Their videos get people excited about the sport, encourage DIY and guided hunts, and bring countless dollars to the sport and thus the Wyoming economy. It can be tough to make a living being a hunting filmmaker and it completely depends on the ability to hunt. Why should their business, should their businesses be supplemented with tags to aid success also? If not, why should outfitting have the benefit? Where do we draw the line? Why should Wyoming Game and Fish Department owe any person a living or any commercial entity an element of their business model at the expense of public's resource. Wyoming Game and Fish Department is not a bailout program, just handing tags to businesses that can't operate in the black. This applies to outfitting, ranching, filming, etc. They shouldn't offer a public resource for commercial purposes. The more assurances, privileges, stability, and job security we provide to those commercial businesses, the fewer our everyday sportsmen will have. Wyoming Game and Fish Department shouldn't cater to any demographic based on an applicant's preference to hunt with or without an outfitter. Let's let the odds fairly sort out the demographics according to proportions of them in the draw, instead of giving preference to guided hunters by guaranteeing them a portion of the tags incommensurate with their numbers. Why do outfitters think that clients should have any benefit over other people that want the same tag? If harvest success, more money, and more even distribution of hunting pressure are the reasons, I can offer solutions that don't include outfitting, but most are inconsistent with the North American model for wildlife conservation, kind of like tag set-asides for outfitters. So I guess my question to the Game and Fish Department would be, what do outfitters do for you in terms of management capabilities and revenue that makes them think they're such a priority and entitled to special privileges built into the regulations. What do they contribute that couldn't be replaced by some other management mechanism? Um, with that, thank you. And I look forward to the afternoon session. I'd field questions if you have any. All right, any, any questions for Wyatt? Yeah, I got yep, one. Size. Wyatt, can you, yeah. not, can you not draw a general else license or your license? What was that? You said you you could, didn't have access to any licenses uh, guaranteed. Can't you go down to the drugstore and buy a health license with your license? I can, yes. I mean, there are differences for resident versus non-resident. So the non-resident, I mean, I'm saying why. Why should they have? Oh, that's what you, said. you said you couldn't. So I just wanted to make sure that was clarified. OK, yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and Wyatt, thanks for your testimony. This is not a question. This is a comment. I'm, I'm certainly if you can comment back. You know, this whole notion of, of the that we shouldn't use any public resources for any private good or for the economy of Wyoming. <clears throat> we run we run oil and gas on oil and gas and mining on public lands, federal lands, we run grazing on that for, we, we run all of our tourism industry off of our natural resources. So all of the industries, which there are many in the state of Wyoming that are, are dependent upon our natural resources. And, and yes, we do utilize those natural resources and we would not have an economy in this state if we did. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, there are, I mean, 
the federal government isn't in the business of of developing minerals themselves. So that's a business where you know someone is paid to actually get those on behalf of the public. So that's that's the fairest process for those sort of things. And that's I'm asking you guys just to consider what's the most fair. I mean, those other resources, yeah, you know, there are private entities making a business on a public resource, but I mean those mechanisms are warranted for the infrastructure that we have set up right now. Any other questions for Wyatt? No. no. Wyatt, thank you. I appreciate your, your time. Thank you for your engagement. Uh, Laura, we got Cody Brown up next. I know this is a sense. Hey, Cody is a big so so I don't know if just is he is he registered still? <clears throat> Cody, if you're there and you can uh, accept the the invite, we'd like to promote you to be able to speak. Right, Cody, if you can hear us, if uh, you'd introduce yourself, tell us where you're from, please. Yeah, I can hear you guys. Can you hear me all right? We, we can. Okay. Uh, Cody Brown, I'm, I'm coming here as a, a member of the public and also as an outfitter. I live in the Dubois area. Uh, I am a non wyoga outfitter member. <coughs> I do uh, roughly 20 to 30 hunts a year. <coughs> And I don't watch the Flintstones on my off time, so I, anyways, <laughs> just had to get that in there. Anyways, to touch base on, and I wasn't even to comment on this until I listened to Wyatt on the, the, the resident opportunity. There's more than enough opportunity. I mean, I can get, I can get four deer tags a year and up to three, you know, three elk tags, a bull plus two cow. So there's plenty of op opportunity there. But back to what I'm getting at here to, for my comment, I am, uh, I am for this 40%, this special tag pool going to outfitters, um, mainly because it, it would benefit me. That's, I mean, I want to make my business run. I want to, I want to raise my family around outfitting. It benefits our community. Um, I'm also in favor of the regionalizing the general license areas across the state, you know, just like the non-residents are for deer. I feel like that would uh, be a, a better way of uh, managing the herd for sure. Uh, but back to the, the 40%, the, the special tag pool going to outfitters. Um, you know, you guys a few months ago, however long ago what that was, you threw a bone to the resident hunters with uh, the 90-10 bill being passed going to uh, the big five species, uh, you gave them a bone, you know, why can't you give the outfitters a little bone here that uh, really isn't gonna affect the resident hunters at all. You know, it may affect a few non-resident DIY hunters, but uh, obviously you guys weren't thinking of those guys when you went to the 90-10 on the sheep, moose, goat, bison, grizzly bear thing. But uh, any, anyways, that's, about all I got to say, but uh, any you know, questions for Cody? Yeah, I'd be glad to answer questions if I can. All right, thank you for your comments and your engagement, Cody. Thanks, right, gonna, thanks for having me. To, uh, the public comment for those in attendance, uh, I, I will say, uh, please, please refrain from talking about another public comment or commenter. Leave, leave your comments uh, directly to the task force. We, we don't need to, to hear your opinion about somebody else's public comment. Uh, Buzz Hedick, we got you up first. Yeah, where do you want to go? Uh, actually, we'll have you at the podium. Okay. And we'll have to have you use a mic just so the folks that are okay. participating online can hear what you're saying. Sure. How's that? Can you hear me? Got to get it closer. How about now? Yep. Yeah, now we can. Thanks. So I'm Buzz Hedick from Wyoming, Wyoming. I'm just here representing myself today. 
So I believe the question was asked during the testimony, you know, how would this impact a resident hunter if we made this switch? And all I, you know, it's going to impact me. I have friends and family that come here to hunt quite often. And all of a sudden, 40% of the tags are completely off the table for those guys. Uh, it's going to mean I'm not going to hunt with them as often, or maybe not at all, depending on what units they're applying for. Uh, so that's how it's going to impact me. And then the other thing, too, is I don't, you know, we, we talk a lot about fairness. And I don't think it's correct that just because somebody wants to go with an outfitter, that non-resident gets to hunt every single year where my friends and family might have to wait four or five, six years to hunt. If we're going to start, you know, if it's really going to be about fairness, I think there's some other considerations there. And with that, I will take any questions. But where was the fairness when we took non-residents with 24, 25, 26 points and took away a significant portion of their licenses. There was no fairness in that. There's no, no fairness in this either. So why wasn't there a huge human cry and jumping up and down with unfairness then? There was. By the non-resident hunters, there was a ton of it. Did you complain about that? I stayed neutral on that one. Okay, that's enough. Any other questions for Buzz? Buzz, thank you. I appreciate your time and your engagement. Uh, Terry Pollard. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm Terry Pollard, a outfitter from Pinedale. Representing both myself and Southern County out there, Jared. But, uh, you know, you passed the 90 10 on the moose. I, this year, I, I do go, I got 14, 15 moose hunters, which is what I usually take. Next year, it's going to be half of that. That's going to hurt me, but that's all right. I'll, I'll survive that. If you do 90 10 on the elk deer and antelope, it's not just going to affect me as an outfitter, it's going to affect the small communities. Southern County, to all of them in Southern County, Du Bois, even Cody, Jackson. You know, it's going to affect them big time because it'll significantly cut the number of you know hunters uh, in, if you go with that 90 cm. So that's a real serious thing. You can't just put that on an outfitter. An outfitter you know. As far as the 40% uh, draw, it's not a set aside. Nobody's given us a living. I still got to compete. With the outfitters in my area for those licenses. It's still, you know, but it's like Dwayne, you know, I was helping him work on that how many years, 30, 35 years, some damn thing. And basically it's came to full circle. We're right back to where we hope to be then. I think something so I said earlier is very true. If we had got it then, we probably, we wouldn't have had to fight this battle now. You know, but we didn't, you know, that's the way it goes. But I, you know, doing a set aside, it's not a set aside. Doing a, 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 a license, a, a, like like has been proposed there, forty percent is a draw between the outfitters. It's not it doesn't guarantee it doesn't guarantee us the same thing. Now that takes questions to Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman. So Terry, I, I have a question because I didn't really understand the proposal, so maybe it's on either side. But you would still continue with the point system within within this, right? We would, because our competition between us would still be going on pretty pretty significant. So I think the point system would still be very important to us. Okay. Yeah. So the idea, the idea that there, you know, some hunter would get to hunt every year is an active right? I admire it pretty high. You know, I mean, uh, once in a while I'll get a guy that can draw every year, but it's an it's a absolute lucky deal. You know, I mean, most of my guys, most of my clients even, they'll book, you know, for every three or four years, because during that period, they can find a preference point each year and then have a, a, a pretty good chance to draw. But the draw, you know, to come every year just doesn't, at least in my area, it doesn't happen. 
Any other questions for Mr. Fowler? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Carrie Romero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Carrie Romero on behalf of the Mexico Council of Doctors. Again, I just wanted to um, reference something that I have heard kind of discussed since the, the morning, and I think that representative should kind of slow down a little bit when we're talking about the public trust resource. And um, I think Mr. Shaver, you had asked earlier on this morning, what other sort of resource do we sell? Well, we sell resources all the time. We sell water, we sell timber, we sell oil and gas. Those are all natural resources that we sell. Yes, they're not owned by the state, but that kind of gets to the discussion around the, the public trust resource. And so when we're talking about that the state owns the wildlife for the public trust, we're referencing the public trust doctrine. And what the public trust doctrine says is that it should be held in the public trust to benefit the residents. It doesn't say, benefit the resident hunters. So I think it's important that we make that distinction that it's benefiting the residents entirely. The outfitting industry benefits the residents. They provide essential economic contributions to rural communities. They provide employment. They pay taxes. They're small business owners. So they are definitely benefiting the residents through the outfitting industry. I don't think that that public trust argument, and I, I hear it get made in New Mexico all the time, and it really, uh, you know, gets under my skin a little bit because the public trust doctrine doesn't say that the wildlife should be held in public trust for the resident hunters to hunt. It is to benefit the residents. Thank you. Any any questions for Ms. Romero? Thank you. Uh, Dustin Stetter. Hi, I'm Dustin Stetter, Stetter Outfitters, Dear Boys Wyoming, on behalf of the Dear Boys Outfitters Association. Um, I think sometimes it's overlooked just exactly how important outfitting is in these smaller communities. Dear Boys, for example, and um, economically, if you look at what happens in a year like this, where a lot of outfitters suffer through this draw because it takes so many points, and you look at it, it took over three points to draw your elk hunters. What that means is there's guys who drew five elk hunters when they needed 20. Now, they'll survive more than likely, but what, what that means is their disposable income is gone. So they're not buying tires, they're not building houses, they're not doing the things that they do under a more uh, stable system, if I use that word. So I, I also would like to make a point of what clarification, which is that historically we take between 33 and 40% of the non-resident elk hunters, general elk hunters, every single year. So a 40% outfit of draw would not be a set aside. It would be us taking the exact same number of elk hunters that we take each year anyway. All this, all this would do for us would give us a level of stability to understand that we know 40% of non-resident elk hunters are going to help with elk hunters. But now we can we can have we can have some control over that pool. We can know exactly what's going on in that and it would not fluctuate like just outside licensing. Um, agency and illegal out. <clears throat> so to be very clear, it, it has no impact on residents. It's, it essentially changes nothing for the non-resident do-it-yourselfer. I mean, it really it changes almost nothing except it gives us just a little bit of stability. And to add to that, I would just say we, we understand it's not the silver bullet that's going to guarantee a successful outfitting business, but what it will do is instead of me having to go out and find 24 three point plus holders every single year if it, if it gives me 12 then i just have to look for 12. but at least that 12 is a baseline i can work with and, with. and if i only get six more that's fine so i don't know but I, that's really all i have that was answer questions dustin would it be fair if i asked you how, how your draw went this year we did we did just exactly what we wanted but we predicted um that it would take three and a half to draw. So unless one unless a potential hunter had three and a half or more points, I would not go in. 
And I understand that. Do you book your own hunters? Do you apply for the licenses for your hunters? Uh, it's probably 75% yes, and then we get outside hunters. So, for example, I had a guy with seven points that called the book this year. I probably love 10. I did love 10. Because you could put that seven pointer with other people that have less points than average of points. I could have. I chose not to because he wanted to go into the regular draw. So I just, you know, he's got seven points, so he doesn't need to spend them. Anyway, I, I try not to murk the waters unless I need to, but the, the folks that we pay, pay the points for, we certainly will do that, but we let them all know. So do you work the waters, as you call it? I mean, it's okay. I understand that <clears throat> almost everybody does it, but do you work the waters? We do with their permission, yeah. Would it be better for your business model if there were more non-resident general health licenses? Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions from Dustin? Yeah, maybe, maybe one, and I don't know if it's fair to ask, to ask you this, Dustin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've, I've heard that commented now a couple of times. I think Sai has mentioned it, that the outfitters um, struggled in the draw this year. Um, my understanding is the number of available non-resident um, licenses, elk licenses, was the same, I'm <laughs> guessing, or similar to what it's been in previous years. So what's causing the, the struggle? And and we're and, and if, if more outfitters struggle this year, is it because more outfitters entered into the mix or more DIY non-residents entered into the mix? I don't have a, a straight answer for that. I can tell you what I think. Yeah. And I, I think that a lot of it is there's more DIY, you know, COVID, we, we see this with our summer business as well. There's a lot more people want, want to get outside and we can't afford the commercial version of that. I think we're seeing that in hunting as well as fishing, climbing, all that stuff. Um, and I think another piece of it is, unless you, you know, so I talked briefly about, you know, guys who are professional outfitters, that's what they do for a living, and they live this day in and day out. So they, we, have, we have a really solid understanding of the system and the number of points and how that all works out. And, and we're able to use predictors, you know, for example, I just set up with a tanky break, unless they have three and a half points. That was really conservative compared to a lot of people. A lot of people thought they were fully focused with guys with two points because that's, that's how it's been. And I, I just want to add this real quick, which is, you know, what we have done with the with the special license and then preference points and, and fee increases, that has served to kick this can down the road for the last 20 years. And what we're what we're what we're simple in a simplified way we're asking for a solution. Piece of the solution to give a little bit of stability. Because what happens is, you know, the special license draw worked really well for about five years, and then it did. So then preference points came along, and that worked really well for about five years. And it has until now, but instead we go in to have a point every year. So in five years, if I have to find 24 people with five points to come on out with me, it's not sustainable. It's just not. So this is a this is a, a solution that we see that could potentially help give some stability. And Mr. Chairman, quick follow up to that: unless you can incentivize more of those non-residents who are applying in the regular without an outfitter to actually apply with an outfitter, because exactly. it sounds like the numbers of those that exist are increasing exponentially. It's just more of them are choosing not to to apply <laughs> with an outfitter or not to contract with an outfitter. Is that I, fair? I, I would agree with that. Okay, thanks, Tess. So Dustin, you, you mentioned that this wouldn't have any impact on the DIY non-residency. Can you can you explain that? Because it, it would seem to me that if you're carving out 40% of those total tags, that, that would certainly have some impact. So so Josh, what I, I cranked some numbers on this, and all I all I did was general licenses, but I went into the state board and I got their records for all the non-resident health centers who chose to be guided by an outfitter. And over the last three years, in 20, I have the numbers, but in 2019, it was like 33.5. In 2020, it was 40 percent on the nose. And in 2021, it was like 34 percent or something like that. Anyway, somewhere in that 30 to 40 percent range. And that's historically what we what we have found. They haven't kept track of until the last three years, the state board has not kept track of which areas. Hundreds of being guided in, so it's hard to track that down beyond three years. But the last three years has been very in that 30 to 40 percent range. What that means is if you if you accept that we're taking up to 40 percent of non-resident health centers as it is, 
then the other 60% actually the, the DIY guys are paid because now they're getting the same opportunity to tag for half the price. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did I explain that very well? Yeah, nope, that makes sense. I can connect those dots. I appreciate that. Representative Summers. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And thanks for your testimony. So that, you know, we can have all the numbers we want, but ultimately it's politics, right? Yep. And, and when we hear that resident hunters are really opposed to this for a variety of reasons, how do we bridge that gap? How do we, how do we make this a win-win for people? And how do we get rid of, you know, this has been my challenge as this has gone on with this, this whole task force. It seems like we just keep picking scabs off old wounds <laughs> rather than rather than trying to solve some real challenges out there. So how do we come together all these entities and uh, and make kind of a win-win for everybody? You got any ideas because obviously we've had testimony that to 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 some sportsmen anyway, this isn't a win-win and and we're not we're not getting there. And so ultimately they outnumber you and and in the legislature they outnumber you. And and so how do we solve that? How do we crack that I, I know that's a tough question, but I'll ask side that too. <laughs> I think the brief answer is if if people fully understood what this looks like in a real world application, I think there's just a lot of mm -hmm. misunderstanding as to exactly what it is we're looking for and how that impacts the current system. And so for example, um, if, if someone's concerned that their non-resident students may not be able to hunt in Wyoming because they're getting a smaller portion of the license, that's just simply not true. Because, you know, based on historical data, we know that we take approximately 40% of the non-resident licenses that are issued. And so that 60% of those tags are still going to be there. So I just think, and what, and what it essentially does is those guys are now going to be able to hunt for half price and have the same draw. Because nothing will change with preference points, nothing will change otherwise. And so I think, you know, for folks to come to understand what the actual proposal is would go a long way toward bridging that gap. Because I, you know, I've, I've kicked this around a bunch of times because I'm first a resident, resident sportsman before I'm an outfitter. I have a son, you know, I'm second generation business, but more in Wyoming. And I would, I would never want to do something about that would serve to decrease chances for my son to have. Mr. Chairman, just to follow up. Yep. So to understand this proposal a little bit, because I'm still trying to work on it. So does that mean that outfitters would not be allowed to be involved in the uh, in the in the in the 60 percent at all? In other words, in order to go with what you just said, that means that outfitters are not going to take a single client out of that 60%. So they'll never fit into that that smaller, that that other draw, whatever you want to call it, the other draw. If, if I'm totally honest, I think we could say that, but there's certainly no way to prevent that. In other words, you know, if let's say I have a guy with 12 points and he wants to he wants to apply to Huntville, it doesn't make any sense for him to go into the special. Does that make sense? So we can we can but, he can fly on his own, get the license, and come off the hand. There's nothing that to prevent that. But I, I would, I would, I would say that, in my opinion, most of the people that I know, the forty percent would, would, for the most part, suffice their needs. And so that would just by by the very nature of what it is, it's removed from the needing to enter into the draw. So just to follow up on that, Mr. Chairman, is so obviously a, an out of state puts in. He draws, he goes, you know, I really don't know the country I need to hire an outfit. I get that. But how do how do we ensure or should we ensure that outfitters aren't putting in, you know, groups of six into that other draw? And and, and I mean, how what what uh, what guarantee do we have that that's not gonna happen? Or if it does happen, then the numbers <coughs> aren't we used to say they are. Right. It would trying to think of the best way to answer that question. I, I think if, if you're asking me personally, either or, like, fine, we'll give you the 40% draw, but now you're not allowed to get into that. I think most people would agree with that. I think that's going to be really hard to regulate. Um, but I also just don't force 
see where that would become necessary. Just because, you know, as I pointed out, outfitting businesses are really hard to grow beyond what, you know, for example, if I have two outfitters call me, I, I can make room for them. But I'm in pretty good shape um, because I've managed my points and those things. But, um, you know, there's just a certain percentage we're going to go with. Without <clears throat> if that if that percentage is taken care of in forty percent, which I feel really really comfortable that it would be, um, then that I guess that's something that you could probably include because they wouldn't they wouldn't have access to the outfitter portal because the outfitter portal would only be those licenses would only go into the special process. So if they wanted into there, that would have to be a separate. I think that's right. That's okay. <clears throat> Currently, if you pay the extra money, you go into the special draw. Forty percent of the licenses get distributed there. Sixty percent are left, and the next draw are, is based on preference points. And that seventy-five percent of the sixty percent, and then twenty-five percent of the sixty percent drops into just a random draw. So I think all that's accessible through the outfitter portal. I mean, currently, credit. But what I'm saying is, if it changed in the outfitter portal, that would just go to that special. And you're, and I, I wonder about your your statement that this wouldn't affect DIY um, non residents because currently you're taking forty percent of the non residents, but you're taking those from three different draws. The forty percent special license, the sixty, seventy-five percent of the sixty, and twenty-five percent of the sixty. Out of all of those, you end up with roughly forty percent of non-residents. I agree with that, but I would say that because of the way it's structured currently, we are involved in all those draws because you know there's a twenty-five percent of random tag, so. Everybody makes their business differently. So let's say I've got six guys that want to go and they have zero points. And I've got room for them. I'm going to say, we keep those licenses in the regular. We've got just a good chance there. And, you know, looking forward to a lot of these guys who got burned this year, they will start dumping people into those. And that's what that, that will do is flood that. And so it will actually serve to increase the odds for the business owner where it will justify it. Tell you, I'm sure that every single one of my clients would have no problem paying the extra money to get a special problem. Let me make a statement and tell me if I'm accurate. One of, the, one of the most important factors in running your business and continuing to do it is having certainty from year to year that you're going to have points. Is that accurate? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Lee, um, I want to circle back to. A comment Joe, Joe had earlier about you know we saw the some outfitters tank and Dustin this isn't you I'm just commenting on it but with the with the drawing odds and what caused that and you know side brought it up earlier and I can't stress it enough it is the it is the application services and to me it's a little bit like the uh, the VRBO situation T ten years ago no one thought about VRBO you never thought about it well. We never thought about application services to the degree. You had booking agents. They took a client. They found the hunt that the client wanted. They helped him with through the licensing situation. They didn't just wholesale sell. Uh, you know, they've got a big, those application services have huge databases. All right. You, we can get you, a, a, we'll put you in for an elk license in Wyoming. And they're, you know, they're paying a fee for that. They're just dumping. We have seen the, the increase in that going, getting just crazy. And that's what what that's probably what tanked the draw because we, as an industry, we we apply a, you know about the same number of hunters every year because we have an idea of what we can take and and how many it takes to run our business. So we, as an industry, I do not believe added to that that the influx of of uh, extra applications. You have, you know, again, you have a lot of folks doing it themselves. They're sitting around. They've got. They've all of a sudden wanted to hunt Wyoming. They've been locked up for a couple of years. That might have had something to do with it. But I do believe that those applications, license application services, to, to see the significant swing that we saw, because a lot of folks were looking at it. We've been watching this draw. You've been watching this draw. We knew it's creeping. But, you know, three points, 
was there were a lot of folks that thought three points was going to do a lot better than it did. And, and that's what, you know, the, the huge dump of numbers in there and back to the, to the DIY guy, how this is, how this is going to not impact them or DIY um, or DUI. I don't know, whatever you want to do. <laughs> could be, but uh, you know, back to science, I made that comment. I don't know if people quite caught onto that back in the day before we had points, before we had something that was some sort of a certainty, if I needed 40 hunters, I put 80 in. If I peel those extra 40 out of the draw, they're not competing against the guy that's wanting to come here, your cousin that's wanting to hunt with you. There's that fewer people in the draw that are that are competing against the, the DIY guy. So just there. Uh, hold, hold on, Let, let's go one at a time. Sai? I want to expand a little bit. Jennifer and I had a conversation uh, during lunch. And correct me if I'm wrong, Jennifer, you said currently there's only two of these application services that are actually using the business portal, and the others are creating their own individual accounts for these clients that they're handling applications for. So they're actually disguising the ability to, to ferret them out to see how big this number is. And one of those companies that's disguising those applications and making individual accounts for each one of these hunters is Honey Fool. And Honey Fool, we know for a fact, drew 350 of the 7,250 tags. That's 5% of those tags that they drew. That right, wrong, or different, that's just the way it is. But the fact of the matter is to, to think that that's not having an, an influence uh, in our draws is, is ludicrous because for one thing, they obviously are concerned about that. Otherwise, they would go to Jennifer and say, hey, let's create a business portal so we put all of our applications in there. But rather than that, they've got individual into individual accounts. And then the other factor that you got to take into account is when you are a licensing service, it actually, it actually hurts you to draw a customer because the, when you draw a customer, he, he gets that elk license and he's gone. He's going, okay, let's decide to come back to my own. You're much better off dumping massive quantities of applications in the drum and getting that consulting and professional fee on an annual basis. That, that makes more sense. You want that person to have to try 10 years to draw a tag. So there, it's having an effect. That? So I, I asked a couple times in emails, tell me what's the relevance of these licensing services. And this is the answer I've gotten, but it ignores many things. I mean, Cy claimed in his email that these people are paying 210 bucks in application to use those licensing services. So if someone who's willing to spend 630 bucks to apply for deer elk in Wyoming, if we were to outlaw the licensing service or get that out of here, I suspect the majority of them would probably just apply on their own. So it's a, you know, it's, it's an argument that quite frankly doesn't work with me. It's a good thing Wyoming has a real demand for its elk deer and antelope licenses. That generates money for the department. I mean, it's demand has increased tremendously, not just this year, but the year before. Is it COVID? What, what's causing that? I hope it's because we have healthy elk herds and deer herds, except for the deer and, and antelope herds. Um, but I mean, they're going to do it anyway. It, it's it's a shell game. It doesn't work for them. Albert? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I think we need to ask ourselves, do these license licensing services do Wyoming any good? You know, is this something we want to see go on or not go on? Regardless of this discussion about, um, about outfitter set sides or anything else, I I just I just don't particularly like it. I think uh, I think we need to examine that as a state. And I, I'm sure the commission is or other people are, but I think we need to take a look at it. Any more comments for Dustin specific? Dustin, I appreciate you being on the hot seat. Yeah, yeah. I've got one. yeah. But do I get to it before the other questions on this train of conversation? <laughs> so what's the sequence, Mr. Chairman? Ask him or follow up with this. Your, your pleasure. <laughs> well, it's a you know this whole issue is the points going up is a supply and demand issue. It's just simple supply side economics. 
yeah, more demand, and, and, and we've implemented systems that's kind of offset some of that demand because we've waited who could participate for that demand. And this is what this is. So 15 years, you're going to have the same problem, potentially, if you're really lucky, but you've got five times the number of prescriptions on the 40% license pool, and then you can have the same discussion all over again because it's supply and demand. That's all it is. Now, as far as trying to regulate these booking services, um, it's a waste of time. They're just providing a service. They're not outfitters. And in fact, I'm curious as to if, if in fact, Huntville did this, because what they do is they book and then they have endorsed outfitters and the majority of their endorsed outfitters who pay a percentage back to the booking fee. It's a business model, folks. Um, and if people are willing for that convenience and that outfitter is willing to do that, to pay a fee for somebody else to go out instead of having you keep track of all of your clients every year, uh, they do that for you. So they've cut a business arrangement. I don't know that we need to get in there. I understand they're flooding it because it's, it's, it's a demand. And I just don't see how we're going to change that. Now back to the question for you. And my colleague over there, Mr. Senator Representative Summers, is absolutely right. We got to deal with the political reality. And from where I sit, I don't see any of these standalone proposals we've had for landowners, uh, transferable cow calf. I don't see any possibility of uh, type X private landowner permit. I don't see 9010, and I don't see outfitter set asides. Any single one of those proposals is strong enough to make it through the legislative process as a standalone proposal. So the question becomes is, is in, in our world, sometimes it's called a, a reasonable accommodation. Um, and so what's a reasonable accommodation? And I think Cy alluded to it earlier, but specific to you and your business, would you accommodate Resident sportsmen in the state of Wyoming with a 90-10 elk, deer, and antelope in the initial draw only in exchange for an outfitter set aside for you, not your industry. Be careful, Dustin, because you could get killed. <laughs> <laughs> extremely hesitant to make that that exchange only because um, we wouldn't know right now how this 40% uh, outfitter draw will affect us moving forward. Um, we have a pretty good idea. We've modeled it. We think we know. Um, but if you want to talk about what, so, and uh, that's, that's a good question. I, I, would, I would probably at this point say, no, I would not be willing to make that concession. Okay, we're not making any concessions. We're making reasonable accommodations. <laughs> Dustin seems like a nice guy, Larry. Don't get him killed. <laughs> <laughs> he is. But, well, well, I, I, I can appreciate Jeff you saying that, Dustin, because at the beginning, at the onset of your testimony, you, you really put a a strong emphasis on the impact that non-residents bring to the communities, particularly a community like yours. And so for you to remove the, the self-serving hat of your business and recognizing that that has a larger implication to the community of Dubois, that, that, that bodes well for you and your credibility to be able to recognize it. So I appreciate your, your willingness to just at this point not have a comment on that. Any other questions for Dustin? Justin, thank you again. Uh, Rachel Leinenberger. So, well, uh, this will make Rob Shaw's day. Uh, <laughs> while she's proceeding to the podium, this young lady will, I'm proudly to say, proud to say will be my daughter in law come. Okay. August 13th. August 13th. August 13th. So there is a connection. There's still time, Pat. <laughs> so, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I just would like to express my condolences. <laughs> 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 
You know, one of the great injustices in life is you don't get a pick of animals. I'm still trying to make the connection on Rob Shell. Is that your brother and he'll be your relative? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm, just kidding. I, I'm sure I'll be subject to the newsletter now that I become related to oh, it. Oh, oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to tell you, this is the toughest lady I've ever met. I only had known her for about an hour. And I took a sardine and I was putting it in my wife's hair just to see what she would do. Rachel sitting behind why? me. Why? Why would you think that was going to end? It was going to be funny, but Rachel slapped me so hard outside the head from behind and said, don't ever do that again. And I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> So, for further introduction, I'm Rachel Lightberger, Butte Creek Outfitters. Um, oh, sorry, is that better? I guess to make it crystal clear, I can't speak to the whole state. I can only speak to, I guess, wilderness area outfitters because that's what I am and the business that I grew up in. But, um, so Senator Hicks, I wanted to go back to a statement that you had said earlier about um, wilderness area outfitters kind of already have their own set aside draw, and that's not true at all. So we're still, yes, clients have to come outfitted, non-residents do if they want to hunt on the wilderness, but we don't have our own draw. We don't have a wilderness only tag. Um, we put in the same draw that everybody else gets to put into with the resources we have available. And it's a very special kind of client that wants to come on that horseback wilderness hunt in grizzly bear country. And I think everybody here would agree we're booked three or four years out on those kind of clients and they want to come and we, the demand is there, but if we can't get them a tag, I don't know about everyone else, but my phone hasn't been ringing off the hook and I didn't draw all my clients. So that tells me they're not going in the wilderness necessarily. They're pursuing other avenues, maybe they're doing yourself guys, maybe they're sitting on a general tag saying like, it doesn't matter if I eat it, it's just a general tag. If I have time to go over and hunt, great. If I don't, whatever. Um, so I think there's a little disconnect there. We're still in the same boat. Um, and I think our clients are willing to pay for more expensive tags, absolutely. But again, that's not every non-resident out there. That's a resource that, that's there and we kind of have tapped and they're booked and the need is there, but um, I just didn't like that you made it sound like we had our own special little draw already. Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. I apologize if I made the sound that like maybe I should have used the, the terminology hostage hostage clientele. <laughs> so I understand the general draw, but they cannot hunt unless they either go with an outfitter or a resident guide. Right, and that's correct. And I'm just saying that, that so a lot of my clients didn't draw this year. And part of that's because we're booked so far out in advance. We were so stable at a point and a half, two points that guys were booking every three years. So they had two points going into the draw. I didn't have anything to work with muddy waters. Um, I didn't have a lot of guys with five or six or seven points to share with. Um, and so again, I guess that demand is there, but if you can't get up points, then no elk are getting harvested in those wilderness areas by non residents. That's largely who manages those wilderness areas. Uh, not a lot of residents go back there and hunt. I'm sure we can pull the exact numbers, but I think 49 was mentioned earlier back in the third. Um, so if those elk aren't being managed by the non residents, then who manages them and what happens to that resource that's so special for our state? Ms. Leinberger, how many hunts do you normally book on an annual year? Four. Four rifle hunts. How many did you book this year? I had two clients dropped. Thank you. Out of 24. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He has a question. So, first of all, congratulations on the, the pending nuptials to, to be a fly on the wall at your future yeah. holiday. <laughs> <laughs> Some interesting conversations. I, 
don't know. So I love you even more now. <laughs> so um, help me, and I, and I don't want to. I don't want to lead you, but I, the, the comments that that I'm hearing from you and I've heard from a few others are making you think this. So so if we we had significant number increase in non-resident applicants in the Elk draw. It sounds like it's more common than not. There's either a handful of outfitters that drew absolutely everybody and more that they had, or it was tough, which means that there are more non-outfitted non-residents that happen to have drawn. Correct. They're not hunting in the wilderness. So am I going overboard by thinking they are gonna end up in my backyard in the snowy mountains in the Sierras and in the other general areas? And isn't that gonna actually make things worse for I mean, am I going to see more of them running around in the places that I like to tromp around in? Um, yeah, exactly. That's that's exactly what I think it is, and what um, what I've heard. I mean, of course, we all talk to each other, and I know a lot of other outfitters had a hard time drawing this year too. A lot of us thought three was going to get it done, and it it didn't. Um, so there's no stability there. How do we guess? I mean, it jumped a whole point last year. It jumped a whole point this year. Um, so now we can't keep up hardly. So do I push all my clients? They only get one more point. So if it jumps a whole point next year, I'm again in the same. Um, Mr. Chairman, just quick a quick follow up. Um, one of the things that's not reconciling for me is the general, because um, I happen to subscribe to a few of those hunter application services. They don't apply for me. I do all that on my own, but um, enjoy those things. The, the general tenor around the outfitting industry it seems is that if you want to hunt with an outfitter, you better be booking now because the, the demand has been so substantial. So why isn't that, why, why are we hearing something different from Wyoming elk outfitters, I guess? Because every year you want to go to Alaska on the sheep hunt, you're booking three, four years out. Those are $30,000 hunts. If you want to um, do an elk hunt in some of the premier areas on landowner tags in New Mexico, because they're out four and five years. So, so what is it that's different about Wyoming? I don't, I'm saying I don't think that it is. My next available spot was in 2025. Um, so I, I mean. Had they drawn. Had yes. they drawn. Yes. Got it. Okay. Thank you. So I, I think that the 7250 cap is completely arbitrary. I think we clearly have a ton of elk. I mean, we talked about Central Wyoming and some of those places where it's exploded. Um, I think. Honestly, both things need to work together. I think an outfitter set aside draw, whether it be forty percent or whatever it may be, um, very beneficial to stabilizing the industry as well as creating revenue for the game of fish. The tax prices, again, it, it they're going to pay it. I think that's been said before, but um, but not everybody is. Does that kind of make sense? So we can't, the people that drew general tax this year aren't wanting to pay for an outfitter. We kind of have all those type of clients booked out to 2025. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Rachel, a question. So what's the differential in your business? And I know it's going to be different from outfitter to outfitter. Right. Between drawing and booking. So I, I know up in that part of Wyoming, because they have to go into the wilderness area. There's going to be a number of non residents that drew general elk tax that didn't have a deposit down with an outfit. They're now going to be making calls that are going to go ahead and book with an outfit. Do we know what that differential is? Because I, I've got some I friends that will probably take them if they call. I, have, I would absolutely take them if they call me. I've got 22 spots open, they haven't called. I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, so, yeah. so what you're talking about, uh, Larry, is the aftermarket. And you are correct. On a normal year, there is a, a volume of calls that come to us looking for hunts in the aftermarket. People drew the tags surprising. So, oh, man, I got this license. I should find something to do with it. Those calls are virtually non-existent this year. Rachel's situation is the same as my. I, I am a big outfitter. I market heavily. I've received zero aftermarket phone calls this year. I don't know what the difference is, other than whoever's got those tags that would normally be searching for an aftermarket are people that are choosing not to book hunts with outfitters. If you ask this audience, because I've asked them, 
the aftermarket is non existent this year. Why? I don't know exactly what that is. Mr. Chairman, it's been less than a week, hasn't it, since the it, it happens right away. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the department issues this. They, so the department is now issuing an email, okay? When the draw is held, your email address is attached to your application. So these hunters are actually knowing before we do if they drew a license. They, get, they wake up in the, in the morning, there's an email in their inbox, they hit the link. That's how I found out I had got a moose license this year. They hit the link, boom, and that's what they're getting. So they know right away. In the old days, it would it would be a three, four, five days lag time before they knew the drew. That's not happening this year. There is no aftermarket this year. Why I have no idea. I would also like to add, maybe this is worthwhile to that aspect of the conversation. It's not like for general outfitters, I, you know, limited quota area is very different. So if my, if I was putting in for a limited quota area for a guy, and maybe there's 15 on resident tags available and he didn't draw, I don't go, oh shoot, that means I'm not taking anybody this year. I would send out 50 letters, just like sheep, for example. And I probably would get some response from those letters um, for people looking for an outfitter because that's a hard to draw tag with a limited quota. It's I'm not gonna send out five, four, five, whatever thousand licenses or um, letters to people that drew general licenses. Or it's, it's a much bigger undertaking, I guess. Those people probably think they can do it themselves or whatever. <coughs> you know, maybe it's a little different then. Uh, I've been dying to do this ever since I mentioned. Now I'll ask you because I think it needs a question. What's most important to you in your business model? Is certainty that you're going to have clients year after year? Is that important for you to run your business? Yes. Is there anything more important you can think of? I mean, just that I, we've talked a lot about political, and that's great, but biological is probably more important than political. Um, Lots of elk, and I think that has to be before to be lifted. Um, provide more licenses for everybody. We don't have to have the conversation about well, is it fair? Well, it's, it's not going to be fair. It's not always fair. That's right. But that's what I think. Are there any other questions for Rachel? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jim Shell. Chairman, appreciate the opportunity to visit here. Um, my mind's racing. I, I've, I've changed directions about 10 times in the five. I won't say just in this last 45 minutes or so. But bottom line, I guess I'm going to start off with saying that, like so many other Americans, I am a licensed professional. My associates out there in the audience. We're licensed professionals. We're good at what we do. We survived the roller coaster that Sai's talked about for myself, much like Sai, 44 years. We've had good and we've had bad, we've had devastating, and we've been on top of the world. It shouldn't be such a roller coaster of events as to whether we can make a livelihood for ourselves and our families and all the people who work for us. And all the people in our communities, especially the small communities that literally depend on non resident hunting dollars. And we already know what the impact of that is statewide. You know, they say that small mom and pop businesses are the, are the rock of, of the state and the nation. You no, know, we're just small time businesses. A plumber by trade is a licensed professional, an electrician, a hairdresser, an attorney. A school teacher, somebody coaching school football. They're all licensed professionals, but they are there and they continue to be in the licensed professionals because they're good at what they do. They provide a great service. They bring clients to them via reputation. They've earned that client. Now imagine if you will, you've earned these clients. By reputation, year after year after year, because you're doing one hell of a job. You're bringing something to the table that the public that needs you and wants you wants to use your services for. And then you go, well, gee, 
Well, I'd like to come and do your plumbing for you, but let's see. Let's put you in a roller coaster lottery wheel draw here and see if I get to come fix your plumbing this week. Or get your wiring rigged up. Or, well, can I represent you in the court of law? Well, let me see. Well, we've got Fred Jones here, but uh, Leo Task is not. That can't make you. Now, well, you tell me what the major difference is. If you're trying to support small business in Wyoming or in the nation, you tell me why we need to have some kind of a, as you want to call it, set aside a welfare program. This ain't welfare. I work my ass off for it. And the, the resident hunter that, that thinks it's an easy gravy train, they have not paid my bills for 45 years or even made an attempt at it. Nor have they satisfied and made hundreds and hundreds of non-resident citizens happier than pig and crabs and went home with memories that will serve for the rest of their life. So now I want to, I'll, I'll get off that so folks. This non-resident licensing service, these are not your friends and family using that service. These are high profile professional people as a rule. Not only are they a licensing service, they're a, they are, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, they're sorry, what's the word? <laughs> <laughs> doing they, rec good. they recommend, they recommend consulting. There's consultants. They don't know anymore. It used to be a real feather in their hat, like I said earlier. If Cabela's tags had SMS outfitters or rough country outfitters listed as a as a approved outfitter, it was a feather in our hat. It was a big deal because we made it the big time. We were the big boys that were going, hey, that's who you want to hunt with. They're reputable, they're good, they furnish a great product. Wyoming has a great product in their wildlife. That's who you want to hunt. <coughs> that's not the case anymore. Hunt Tool, Epic Outdoors, Camilla Tags, uh, the, the very original, George Tallman, USO Outfitters, and every other small mom and pop type that's trying to follow suit with. Develop tags are selling these application services for 210 bucks a piece. Now that's not their main income. They're also supposedly providing the contacts for this consulting work to these outfitters that they're supposed to know so well and highly recommend. That is not the case anymore. If you if you're a licensed outfitter and they've got some place to send you, they're sending you. It's no feather in anybody's hat anymore to be a, a recommended or approved out there by any of these licensed agencies. The people that are using these are strictly, uh, the profile is they're high profile, wealthy people, busy businessmen. There's tens of thousands of them across the nation. They don't have any time to do their own research. They don't know anything about nothing. And they're putting them in for four or five states for that LJ. They might end up drawing for you to see. This is not a service that's Getting your mom and pop buddies or your family or or Joe Blow DIY hunter is not using these services. These are high profile wealthy people. That's something you gotta understand. And then I want to talk about the the one deal on the uh, the set aside, as you want to call it. it. It isn't a set aside, it's a draw. But if we had that 40% draw that was outfitted only, if the outfitters get a shot at it the first time. We need to understand our proposal is that whatever tags we take out of that 40% pool, there's going to be leftovers probably, and not probably, most likely, especially when we get a license fee increase. All the rest of those 40%, whatever's left of that 40% on the special license, whatever that cost is, whether it's 1282 or 1950, they will all go to the game fish department sales on a special license price, not, not the discounted price or the regular license price. That's something we've got to consider strongly too. That, and remember, all those leftover tags in that 40% pool, special license for game fish. So, I, I mean, I've got all kinds of more things, but I, I don't want to over my time. So, I'll just stand for questions. Thanks. Senator Hicks. Where are you at on your reasonable accommodation to do 90 10 for the initial draw for elk deer and antelope? And if we implemented a 40% outfitter set aside, is that something, Jim, or you just absolutely know? I don't feel like we've had a chance to, that hasn't been our focus. 
That's not the direction we think is going to be adequate for our needs in the future. And so I, I would say no. But initially, too, another piece of history we need to all understand. In 1988, what I believe was the what year was it that we almost had the bill passed? We ended up with a special license. That was originally an outfitter only special license. And it came that close to being passed and was shot down by one of our own outfitters. For what reason? I have no idea. We'll, we'll never know that. But it was all the brain to pass. It was, it was sailing through. And you guys might be up on old history that way. But this thing has been in the works forever. And I, I submit the same as, as the rest of the gentlemen. If that would have went through in 1988, we wouldn't be standing right here today. Our industry would have been stabilized. We would have continued to contribute to the local economies, the state economies. We would have continued to serve people that are just absolutely gaga about this and enjoy Wyoming with professionals. And that has nothing to do with mom and pops and friends and cousins and uncles coming and sharing with the family. But these, these licensing services and these consultants are not, they're not our friends. And game fish is going to get all the money they need with legitimate non non resident hunters, whether they're outfitters or DIY. Jim, Jim I got a follow up to Senator Hicks's question uh, in regards to reasonable accommodations, and I I, I see the I see what's unfolding here, and, and really this is about being able to make some sort of concession or compromise. And I know we have floated the 90-10 several times in discussion, but but I'm curious if there's even middle ground there beyond that. With 85-15, is there something there that you have talked about or have thought about that could be used as a concession to, to be able to move one forward with something else moving as a bone to the residents? Josh, thank you. I, I would say to this, that absolutely, the answer to that question will absolutely revolve around the 72 pit with the cat going away and let the game of fish manage our elk herds the way they see fit, the way they need to, without some arbitrary number being put out there in the ball already. And, and um, another thing, too, uh, I want to respond to uh, Rachel, you did a wonderful job explaining your end of the awesome job. I want to just say this. Part of the reason Rachel's only got two clients is because of the three point draw this year. That's the huge part. But I will also say this every wilderness outfitter in the audience here is appealing to a much smaller crowd of potential customers each year because the fun's all gone with the wolves and the grizzlies. There's, they want adventure, but they don't want that much. <laughs> so you take and reduce the pool of potential clients by Bluetooth. The residents have peeled out, and now they're all down in our part of the world. There's a snowy range in the Sierra, all be dark. That little part of the world should not sustain a general well for much longer. You realize that probably if you're one of the men that owns it. Don't you think You're not saying you want grizzly bears down there, are you? Didn't no, say that. I'm <laughs> saying it's time for regionalized tags. I've begged for it for years. There's not a reason in the world that there's a general permit elk hunt in the snowy range of the Sierras. And you've got that for hunt bull cow rations in several of the areas. Mr. Chairman? Just a question, um, and, and maybe other folks will mention this. I, I, I shared this question with the director a little bit too. Um, so I, I, I'm generally there on the, 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 the what we call the arbitrary capricious number of 7250. Surprisingly, we just heard that Idaho and Montana both have arbitrary capricious sort of caps, which is interesting. Yeah. yeah. That uh, and, is arbitrary capricious. <laughs> interesting. So, so, what I ask the director, and I'll ask you too, is we go to regional, we still have to set a number. How do we set that number? Because that's the piece that I'm still skeptical about is how, how do we set that number? With, you know, Right now, if we have an arbitrary capricious number at the state level, if all we do is replace it with a bunch of arbitrary numbers at regional levels, we haven't really accomplished anything. So how do we set that number? I'll tell you how we set it. We don't. They do. <laughs> they don't. They, they nicely punted. Is not the legislators. I mean, they do Leave it with it general care. Not the non resident or non resident owners. Leave it to the profession, not necessarily the outfitters. But I'm, I'm telling you, we can put good input into what we know 
is good for our areas because we know them intimately like nobody else does. And if you follow Wyoming outbidding for, for years, we've never asked for more, more, more. We've always asked for conservative and, and real and good management. We're never the ones that are going, hey, we want more. As an officer, however, it's all about more for them. It's about stabilization and making it real and keeping it good here in Wyoming. So yeah, one more one more question. Uh, well, and uh, this isn't for Jim, so I'm, I'm, it was just a comment on basically something Jim commented on. The the reason that Rachel drew the way she did, the reason that a lot of the outfitters drew the way they did, is because we have we are being conservative with our resource and man, we are responsible about our resource and booking what we think we can take, and we are following a model with the with the points. Granted, it's kind of a gamble, but I didn't book, you know, I take, what, 24 rifle hunters. I didn't book 40 because I don't want 40. I want 24. And based upon what has been happening historically, that's a responsible thing to do. So Rachel's sitting there, things have been going along at this level. And we're booking, like she said, I'm booking guys into 25 right now. And you're booking them based upon what you think the point system is going to do and hoping you're right. Well. We got our ass handed to us this year. Several several people did. If we had forty hunters in there, she might be in a little better shape. But then there comes a the year when she draws forty hunters and doesn't have room to take them. By God, she's going to take them because she has to. Because next year she might redraw two. So draw two, but I haven't heard numbers compared much. Last year on a special license, which is the one we're wanting to utilize, there was two point seven six draws on two take two points. This year on three points in less in, in one season, it went down by over a point. It was two, four, five for on, on a three point draw. It was two point two forty five. Forty five percent of forty five percent points. So that means next year, like Rachel was alluding to, we've got fifty five percent of the three pointers out there that didn't draw this year. That will be in that draw next year. Now we don't know if they're going to be in the special or the regular, but you can bet your butt if they think there's going to be a little bit better draw in the special, it's going to get flooded, especially by these marketing, these consultants and booking agencies and tag submissions. So again, they're getting their 210 bucks per application they're turning in. Plus, they're hoping that an outfitter, which I've got three rules in my schedule. I had three parties of three pointers this year that did not draw. I have had one phone call from a private individual, and I have got numerous emails from Hunt and Pool and Epic Outdoors. You got room for 187? Yeah, no. You got any generals? Well, yeah, I didn't draw very good in general, so we just might be able to help you out there. But then they'll take $1,000 from me for that service. They're making money besides the it's a thousand dollar straight commission on any hunt under 10 grand. If it's 10 grand or more, it's 15 grand. So these, these booking services, licensors are making bank. They're not doing the state of Wyoming any good. None of that money comes here. So, Pat, I'm sorry. I was loving you until you said that. I mean, are you going to feed the monster? But you're going to pay, you're going to pay hunting tools a thousand dollars to get another hunter? Am I? Yeah. No. Because I think that eventually that phone call will come where I can fill that spot. I mean, it just seems to me that those those booking services, those licenses are not helping you or your friend and family draw a tag. And they're certainly not using them. They're creating draws against friends and family. And I like that Montana concept where we're coming home to hunt. That's got a lot of a lot of weight to it. I mean. How many kids go off to college and never come home because they they can't find a job with a piss? <laughs> this is a job with a piss. We've got them. We do them. The people that work for us love it. The people that come and use us love what we're doing. We've got a great product. We just need a, a license to sell it or to, to utilize that product. So, any more questions? Thank you, Jim. Jeff Smith. Chairman, no, everyone's dance the worst thing for 
when you speak, uh, Jeff Smith, I got seven J operators over at Sunday. It's one. So pretty much everybody here from Dustin and the GM covered everything I was going to say. But you know, the one thing I thought about, you know, what's what's the benefit to the DIY? Well, just for me, for example, I uh, I'm pretty big out there, one of the biggest outfitters in the state. I got eight families that you know work work for us full time. It's eight families around Sundance. The count of seven G outfitters, having owners, being able to provide a living town. So in this draw here, I had three three parties of three points didn't draw, which you know looking at people, you know, looked out 22, 23, 24, 25. We got the points lined up what we think is going to work. So you're going to have three parties that don't draw. So fortunately for me, I had two parties that we just put in, kind of just maybe fill, fill some spots during the rain. So I'm not in bad shape at all. But however, <clears throat> I look at next year, I look at 2024, I'm booked, but I don't have points to keep up. So I got these families in Calumny. There's shoot businesses around Sunday I said. <clears throat> Count on what you we spend. I'm going to flood that crawl. That's the model we're going to back to, just like the old days. I'm just being honest. I got people that count on me. That's what's going to affect the DIY guy. Because when I get a phone call now, I'm booked. Do you want it on 2026? 20, I might be able to take you in. Now it's going to be what you got. I can fit you in. So then that turns the other guys that I already booked. I dump them into random. Down into random girl. That's what this is going to go back to. How it was years ago. That's how it affects the DIY guy. Any, any questions for Jeff? Yes, thank you. Last one we had uh, Todd Stevie. <coughs> Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Let's have a vote on whether Stevie can talk. <laughs> we, we got a second oh. by the record, doesn't it? <laughs> second by side. Go, Chairman. Uh, members of the task force, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm an outfitter from Pinedale. We run four camps there. Uh, Rachel, I feel your pain. Uh, I've been there, done that. This year, I can't. I could not have handpicked a better draw than what I had this year. But trust me, there have been numerous times you guys watch the Flintstones. That's not even funny. <laughs> when, uh, when we paid all that, we've done all that. So, but next year, just like Jeff said, I have to now because I'm not going to be able to outrun this point system. I looked, I have I have a file, 36 clients booked so far for 24. Okay. Because they probably couldn't draw on 23, so I have a book for 24. It should have sailed right through. So now I'm going to call every one of them and say, hey, let's take a swing at the draw for 23. Because I have to stuff every random honor, every application I can get in that draw. This year, we overbooked like 20% and hit it. I could not have handpicked a better draw. If none of it would have gave me the computer, that's what I'd have punched out. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and answer your question straight up. All 
I'm not interested in talking about 9010 on prairie dogs. But this is a, then I think we can talk maybe quote splits. But until this proposal or something along these lines, and this is me talking, I'm not speaking for Cy, Wyoka, nobody else, I'm speaking for God's TV. I'm not interested at all. And another thing that you brought up that I took a note on was the wilderness guy law. As an outfitter, I'm not just sure that helps me, don't hurt me, but as a resident sportsman, which is what I am first and foremost, it gives me a place to go to get away from the impacts. And as an outfitter, resident sportsman, whatever you want to call me, I will fight to keep that wilderness guy. Law. Any questions? <laughs> Senator X, you started it. <laughs> so I'm curious because you're about the third or fourth uh, outfitter that said you're going to flood to draw. So yes, sir. I'm, I'm confused as, as where you're going to find all these tens of thousands of new clients, or have you not been booking them and just telling them to buy points, or you've just actually been telling people don't apply to Wyoming? I'm confused as to where all these masses are going to come from that you're going to load the system on. And not to say that they don't exist. I don't understand what's going on now that all of a sudden you're all going to put them in the draw. Otherwise. I, I don't think that, I think every author in this room will agree with me when I say selling an elk in Wyoming right now is not hard. I can pick up the phone dial the wrong number in Georgia, probably sell an elk out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, when you guys call and the yeah, I'm gonna book them, I'm gonna get their booking deposit, but they're gonna be three years out. Okay, and they know that going in. They know that going in. So some of them will say, Oh, I'll call you next year. Some of them do, some of them say, Okay, book me in the book. Some of them you never heard. But this year, I am going to book every one of them. That has no points, one point, or yeah, whatever they have. I'm booking everyone that'll send me a check and I'm putting him in the draw because I have to. I have to. So, yeah. Mr. Mr. Chairman, just to follow up, I still don't understand how that's going to work because um, of a 75 25. So, you can put them in the draw, mm -hmm. but they're automatically just going into the random draw because <clears> they don't have the, the, the point system. So, you're not flooding the point system because those are only the top point holders to get 75% of those permits. Oh, yeah. So the, the, the only real impact of doing that is under those random tags, which is the fewest number out there. And, and that potentially will have an impact on the DUI or DUI, whatever. Would you DUI. say DUI, DUI, DUI guys? DUI guys. DUI guys. DUI guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but so I don't see that it's going to change anything on that. 75% preference, whether you're special or regular anyway, because they ain't gonna have 70 or 15 or 16 points. So it doesn't change anything. So and it might not in the preference one deal, but the random deal is gonna really wreck for sure. He's, they're just it's, trying to get as many people in the random but, so you can hopefully yeah, get some Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Here's how it's gonna also work, <laughs> Senator Hicks, is, is up until last week, I, I considered myself booked. So if a guy called up and he said, I got six points and I want to hunt this year, I'm going to say, that's great. Call Stevie, call Rachel, call somebody else, but I don't have a spot. Now, if he calls up and says, I got six points, he's in. That's where that's where I'm going to start impacting the, the, the point system. But at the same time, as Todd was saying, anyone that calls up, I'm going to, whether they got zero points or not, I'm going to put them in. The random draw, so we'll flood the random draw. But you will see the preference point draw. I'll start stacking some people in there because you need to. Because I have guys, I'll have guys, they call up, and if they got 12 points, I'm grabbing them doing something with them. But if they're in that five, six point category right now, I just say, I don't have room for you. I'm going to book you in 24, 25. They call, if they call tomorrow, they're going into, into 23's draw. So, and that makes a little sense. Mr. Chairman, you ever follow up thing, and, and I think maybe this might get to the, you know, that we're not asking for more, we're exhausted. You're a permittee on the National Forest. They set the number of use days that you can do. So even if you had a bunch of guys said, hey, I've got a permit, max points, if you're already booked up, you can't take them anyway, correct? In some areas, you're correct. So then uh, they go over to somebody else. 
still find somebody that still has them available. We've been pretty fortunate that our chorus says, hey, if you can book them, book them. I mean, you, I mean, if you go 50 days over here, a lot of days, they're probably going to spank you. If you go 25 over, they're probably not. You know, and they, and they don't yeah. make a living. We'll work with it. So, Mr. Chairman, that, and I don't want to get into it, but that gets into a whole other discussion with the 7250 cap as far, as far as it gets into particularly forest service. Uh, that cap a lot of times doesn't have a lot of implication. That's the forest service that puts the amount of use space that is out there uh, for all the outfitters. And that, that's a cap that they have on top of. I'm just wondering at some point in time how that plays into the 7250 also in the general license scheme. That's a much longer convoluted discussion, Mr. Chairman. I don't think we ought to get into it right now. I agree. Pat? Just a comment. Um, Todd Stevie sitting in butter made me throw up in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any, any more questions for Todd? Laura, Todd, do we have any of the other task force members online that have any questions? Just okay. Todd, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, looking at the agenda, we're, we're of course, uh, you know, some of these issues, they just, they, they need a little bit more discussion. And uh, so we, we recognize that. Let, let's take a five minute break, be back at 2.20 and we'll, uh, we'll begin with Jennifer's license. <laughs> Jennifer, before before you start, look, if, if you would look at your agenda, because we, we're going to move some things around uh, Jennifer's presentation. And then we've got on here uh, Senator Hicks to discuss a letter. We're going to actually move that to later on in the afternoon. If not, uh, Senator Hicks, you'll be here tomorrow, won't you? Yep. There's a chance we may have to move that to tomorrow on the subcommittee reports. Um, that'll tie in with a lot of what was already discussed this morning and early afternoon. We're going to move Joe's discussion to the top and then Adam and Senator Hicks to follow. Uh, the one thing that we want to try to be able to get to today, knowing that uh, um, Mr. King is going to be gone tomorrow, is the what's scheduled at 3.15. So that we're going to try to get to before this evening as well. So um, Joe, if you're okay, we'll have you present on the subcommittee report first, followed by Adam and then Larry. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will note that uh, Todd posted that, that report from our subcommittee. It's on the task force site, but it's not printed in your materials. So some of that electronic means may want to look at that. And we'll, we'll maybe pull it up on the screen if, as you know, we'll walk through that. But yeah, happy to do that. Terrific. All right. Jennifer, the floor is yours. I, I don't know Up that it is. a little closer. Try that. No. No. Yeah, that sounds better. Okay, so good afternoon. Um, I'm going to present a few of the updates that I was requested to present last time. You mentioned these comments. But before I start, there's been a lot of conversation about the 2022 non resident oak draw that just occurred and draw results were released last week. And so I thought it would be a good idea just to give us a little bit of an overview on that, just so everybody in the room is kind of on the same page. And I actually pulled up and put a summary together that I prepare each year when we release draw results. And so I'm just going to quickly walk through that. Um, it's not in this presentation because I hadn't planned to give this report, um, but I can get it to you guys if necessary if you want it. 
So in 2022, we had 29,345 full price elk license eligible applicants. This was an 8.39% increase over last year. And when you look at that compared to the year before, the year before we are, had a 25% increase. So in 2020, we had 21,619 eligible applications. And this year we had, as I mentioned, 29,345 eligible applications for that 7,250 licenses. And looking at how that breakdown occurred, we talked a lot about the special draw, which is the 40% of that 16%. And in 2022, we had exactly 1,000 additional eligible applicants than last year at 8,630 applicants. This was a 13% increase over the prior year. As it has been mentioned, there has been a lot of talk about the general application, so the issuance of general licenses. In the special draw alone this year, we had 4,039 applications in the special draw or general. That's a 23.52% increase over the year before. And as previously mentioned in the special draw, it took three points in the special draw to draw a general elk license. And that only gave you a 45.53% drawing loss. Last year, with two points in that special draw, you had a 22.46% chance of drawing a special general elk license. And so with that, if you had any questions, I have some, a little bit additional details, but I just kind of wanted to put that out there before I got started on this presentation, since there had been lots of conversation and comments about that. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, Jennifer, I'm, I'm, and I, I know you probably don't know this, but do we have any idea of this increase, how many might be related to these licensing services? Do we have any clue for that at all? So this year in the uh, business account that's been talked about, I have two outbidding services that are set up in the business account. And this year they submitted 620 applications for ELF. The one that does not use the outbidding business account, which is previously mentioned as hunting pool, they set up individual accounts for every one of their clients. And this year, in looking at ELF alone, I was sitting over there pulling some numbers. Um, they put in 175 applications for special and 342 total applications. So just to follow up, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I guess my question more is, what is there an increase? So do we know what the increase, because you kind of showed an increase over time, right? I'm wondering if the trend is higher with them or if that's been consistent over the last few years, or if that's, that's an increase in trend or not. So in 2021, Hunting Pool put in 318 elk applications in total, and this year was 342. Um, I did not pull the numbers for um, the other two outfitting services when I was back there running queries for what they did for 2020. Mr. Chairman, yeah. Matt? Jennifer, so I was adding quick, and I'm not good at math, but when you add up those three totals you gave us, I come up with 1137 applications from licensing services. Which, can you tell us how many were in 2020? Yeah, I guess you can, so I won't ask that. But, so, those licensing services submitted 1137 applications in 2021, but our total number of applications increased how much in 2021? So between 2021 and 2020, we had a 25% total increase in applications. So in 2021, we had just over 27,000, 27,073 total applications. And in 2020, once again, we had 21,619. So almost 6,000 additional applications in 2021. Correct. Of which 1137 were licensed. If I add it, yeah. How many general, non resident general health licenses did we issue this year? 
This year we issued 3,868 general health licenses compared to 4,016 in 2021. What's attributes to that? So as we increase limited quota licenses that the commission approves, and we have applicants to support that, the non-resident general health quota will automatically go down because of the 72 50%. So the more limited quota you issue, the less you issue in general. Thank you so much. And I do have a slide that was one of the follow-up questions that I had that I will provide on here, but this is just some additional detail that I thought I would go over since there was lots of conversation about it this morning. Jennifer, real, real quick, just as a clarification, the 25% the increase from 20 to 21, and then an additional 8.39 increase from 21 to 22. So for over two years, almost 35% increase, correct? Correct. So over the, we went from 29,000 this year, and in 2020, we went 29,000. Thank you. And we've also, just a note, increased every year. Um, in the recent past, our application council. Mr. Chairman, yeah. quick question. You just said something that kind of sparked uh, something in me that I don't think I thought about. So you said with an increase in the limited quota permits available and the applicants, that actually brought the number of non-resident general that were left to allocate within that 7250 cap down. I think I heard that correctly. If it were to go the other way, would that actually increase the numbers of non-resident general health takes then that could yeah. could be issued? Yes. yes. If we dropped if we drop limited quota licenses with the commission approved low and not, then yes, that 7250, the general number would not get lower. Because at the end we have to issue per commission regulation 7,250 non-resident health takes. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, so I'm thinking I heard Sai say that could outfitting business model is not to depend on limited quota, but the general health thing. So in that case, actually 9010 might benefit the outfitting industry. Hmm. If you get you well, know, if you chain in. Or if you remove the cap. That's the same thing. It's, but have I told you that the cap is arbitrary? <laughs> <laughs> to what degree? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions on the 2022 non resident health drop before I get started? What I was asked to come through. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, we thought that we had this work so I can then So what I was asked to come back and talk about was landowner licenses um, with the approximate um, public land percentage that I talked about a little bit last time, party applications and non-resident elk licenses. So I don't have a lot to talk about on the landowner licenses with approximate public lands. I had sent uh, a PDF that showed every hunt area with the breakdown of the landowner licenses issued in 2021 with the approximate percentage of public lands. And so if we would like to go over that, we can. Um, I do have on here the slides that I presented at the previous meeting, but it's really hard to take that PDF document and put it in slides. So we can walk through this if you want. Otherwise, I can just skip over this unless you guys have any questions. I wasn't sure how to put this in other than I wanted to make sure everybody had that PDF document that I talked about. We all have it. Any questions for Jennifer on that? The only one that I had is she found this before we even started the meeting this morning. I had her because area 123, which was there were some folks that asked about that at one of our meetings. Area 123 only has a type one license every other year. So there wasn't a 21. So she pulled in 2020 and there were 84, 84 tags issued. 
type one and 17 of those were land only tags. So whatever percentage that is. So last time I was asked to talk about the number of party applications that were unsuccessful in the initial draw and how many of those individuals came back and applied in the leftover draw. And so I've done that breakout in 2021 for resident um, antelope, deer, and elk. So in the resident antelope draw initially, um, unsuccessful party applications, there was just under 8,000, 7,938. Of those unsuccessful, just as a note, there was 41% of those that did not have a second choice. All of the remaining had a second choice in their application. Of that, 7,938, how many of those came back and applied um, in the leftover draw? And we had 246 applicants apply for 257 licenses. And the reason I point out that difference is in the leftover draw, you can apply up to your license limits, which for antelope is two full price antelope if they hadn't drawn previously. So we had 246 applicants, but they did apply for 257 licenses. So that's 33% of leftover applications from unsuccessful party applicants. And so how I get that 33% more on the next slide is that number comes back to that 777 we had previously talked about of what percentage of those, so that 246 or 251 licenses were applied for by unsuccessful party applicants in the original draw. When looking at deer, we had 6,698 unsuccessful party applicants in the initial draw for deer. Interestingly, 61% of those did not have a second choice. And of that, we had 45 applicants come back in and apply and submit applications. In this instance, one for one for 45 licenses, or 20% of those initial unsuccessful party applications applicants came back in and submitted applications in the leftover draw. And that's using that 229 resident applicants first choice draw. And looking at resident elk party applications, we had 11,269 unsuccessful party applicants in the initial draw. 50% of those did not have a second choice. <clears throat> About 11,471 applicants came back in and applied for 482 licenses or 37% of those initial unsuccessful party applicants came back in and applied in the leftover draw. And that's using that 1,316 licenses. <coughs> So this was the request that I had to look at party applications who were unsuccessful in the initial draw. How many of those came back and applied in the leftover draw? As I previously mentioned last time, it's only a snapshot of the picture because if an unsuccessful party application didn't have a license available in the leftover draw, they probably didn't come back in and apply. So it's only a snapshot of if there was available licenses they were interested in, those are the only ones that I can capture. So I can't capture how many of those unsuccessful applicants would have came back if all of the licenses have been available. So that's just a snapshot of those who came back in were unsuccessful as a party applicant in the initial draw. They found a corresponding leftover license that they were willing to submit an application. Any additional questions on the initial draw party application to leftover draw applicants? Okay, so now I'm going to talk about non resident elk licenses, and this is kind of a tag team um, presentation. So I'm going to present the licensing information and then I'm going to turn it over. I'll stand for any questions and then I'm going to turn it over to. 
Rick came to present um, information on hunting. So this top part is the graph that I showed last time, <clears throat> talking about resident gen resident general health licenses and non-resident general health licenses. So as I mentioned in 2021, I did not update this chart up here for 2022, other than down here. So in 2021, we issued 4,016 general health licenses in the non-resident of drug to fully subscribe to 7,250. In that same year in 2021, we had 26,418 residents by general health licenses. If you calculate into that total using setting the resident general at 84%, the total general would have been 31,450. And if you take 16% of that, we would have been issuing 5,032. If you did away with the non resident health quota of 7,250 and just did it straight 84, 16% based on what residents had taken. Another way to look at it is a question, five Jennifer, on, on that 84%. That, that's that's just general, or does that because it says total with resident 84, total general. <laughs> Is 31, but I'm confused because up above it says 26,418, and now you're 31,450, which is general. So, so if you set, so in order to calculate the general non resident general, I have to have a total number of general licenses. So if you use this to back calculate, to calculate into a total general license of setting 26,418 at 84%. That total is 31,450. So if you take 31,450 times 84%, that will give you 26,418 resident licenses. Conversely, at that, using this total, 16% of that would have been 5,032 licenses, would have been the non resident job. If you look at the five year average of general using what we issued, under a 7250 cap from 2016 to 2020 to determine what the non resident general quota would have been for 2021, the five year average would have been 4,436. And we issued 4,016. One thing to note, and this gets back to the conversation I had earlier as limited quota licenses available in total go up, this number will go down. So Looking at what we did in 2022, if you take the five year average of what's displayed on the board right here, the five year average of non resident general would have been 4,324. We issued 3,860. <coughs> but as you can tell, we had an increase in limited quota licenses approved by the commission in April. Well, Mr. Chairman, yes. if I may, real quick question for the department. So on the limited quota, they pretty much follow the 1684 distribution resident, non-resident non resident. So there's 100 limited quota. They're based on the 84% the resident, 16% non-resident, correct? Correct. On the initial draw. Correct. That is correct. So when we get the commission approved quotas, the first step we do for the non-resident health draw is take 16% of all of that initial quota for limited quota. We also calculate what this number has to be going into that draw so that we can issue set up to issue 7,250 when we start the draw. We walk through, as mentioned here, the landowner licenses, the special draw, the regular draw issuing, all limited quota licenses, and general health. At the end of the day, we get done. We haven't issued 7,250 licenses. So we subconvert all of those undersubscribed limited quota licenses to general and run a second pass of generals through the special draw. And if there's any left over, we run that through the regular draw. But as this number goes up and as our application counts have went up, we are issuing less in that subconvert to general. And so that accounts for a portion of why these numbers have went down. So the other thing to point out, one benefit um, of doing away with the 7,250 cap from a licensing standpoint is this would simplify the draw for the non-resident health draw. Because as I just mentioned, we have to 
calculate a quota that will go into the non-resident elk draw so that we get the initial 7250. And then at the end, there's three steps to convert quota to issue the 7,250 and those two additional steps to issue that quota. So removing that 7250 cap and setting a quota for non-resident general that would be approved by the commission, just like all of our other seasons and quotas would simplify the non-resident outdraw. So Jennifer, just a quick takeaway. If we got rid of the 7250 cap, say it didn't exist in 2021, we would issue just roughly a thousand more non-revenue health licenses in the general pool. Is that is that correct? Thousand and sixteen. Well, it depends on what quota. If you were to use this as the quota, then yes, we would have issued the difference in there. As I said, if we just did got rid of the cap, we did. 16% non residents, 84% residents statewide, that would have resulted in a thousand more non resident general elk tags. Using this formula right here. Yes. That's correct. Or using this formula, yes, we would have issued about a thousand more. And those, um, it's not a question for you. Anyway, not a licensing question. It's a hypothetical word of those thousand. Non residents go, Joe. <laughs> they going into a wilderness area. Maybe 22 would. Mr. Chap? You can keep saying using that formula. Are there different formulas we could use? Well, this is the formula. This is the two formulas we use. So, this is the formula that was the department used to calculate because everybody, all the comments we've heard is to maintain an 84 16 split on general between residents and non-residents. So this utilizes that 84%. This is the formula that the department used for the 9-10 calculations that went to, um, that fed into the fiscal note when the 90-10 for all species was taken to the legislature. This is just a different means of doing it because I've also heard it in the previous five-year averages and setting a quote. And yes, Commissioner Crank, you had provided me a note of a different calculation which depending on that was about 6,000. If you look at limited quota, taking 16% of the limited quota and calculating the cap. And, and I don't know if my note is a correct calculation. Can you, do you have an opinion on that? Or? This is the quota that this is the calculation that we've used because we felt this best represented an 84 16 split and looking at how we issue limited quota is taking a total quota and issuing 84 and 16. And here we know exactly what residents took as a resident general issues the prior year and calculating into that what the quota would be. And so this is the number we chose to run as a department, those calculations. There's not another model. I know what you use, but is there another way to calculate that that is accurate and, and it splits at 84 16? I, I, so this is this is how good Jennifer is. I gave her this horrible note last night. I mean, do you have any opinion, Jennifer, whether this is the correct way to calculate it? <laughs> She did. She just said it nicely. Yeah. She just said it nicely. Be honest. Yeah. No. This is the one we're using. <laughs> no, but thank her. This is also the easiest to explain to our customers <laughs> and constituents who are asking. But the other thing is, is in my uh, once this quota, if you chose to either set the, it this way or this way, it would just be a quota that goes to the commission and is approved every year after that. And depending on what happens with elk population, this quota could be adjusted. Okay. All right, let me ask this question a different way. If you calculated it, there's so much my privilege to know it. How many non-resident general elk licenses would be issued in 2021? 6,632. Versus we issued? 4,600. <laughs> So would it add about 2,000 more general, non-resident general health licenses would have been issued. That's correct. Mr. Chairman, for those of us that are out of it, can you explain the, the method you're 
Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I, I can don't explain. ask. No, this is really simple. Larry, write this down. And Joe, write this down. <laughs> you're the math I, I think the way maybe, uh, one way to calculate the number of non resident general health licenses are you're solving for the, that number. Non resident general health licenses equals 16% of the total resident health licenses minus the limited quota non resident health licenses. And that'll give you a number. And what when Jennifer calculated that, that is wow. say that again, Pat. Total number of non-resident limited quota general licenses equals sixteen percent times total resident health licenses minus limited quota non-resident health licenses. I got a D in high school algebra, so. Still, you want me to write it down? Yeah. At least you didn't have to take it. You're the statistician. Did the, you're the guy that has all the brains for math. Obviously, you don't need to know math to pass the bar. Sorry. <laughs> Come on now. You're, you're, you just need to know how to screw people. <laughs> your resident license is included, resident limited quota. Total, yeah, total resident license. What troubles me about that, I'll just tell you, is you're, you're mixing apples and oranges. You're, you're taking total resident licenses minus limited quota non resident licenses. And I don't know if that's right or not. It's not. Okay. Gotta do better than that. Is. <laughs> so, this is also similar to how we calculate into a number of general. We have to set a total general every year when we start the draw. So, we calculate a general output into there so that when we take 16 percent of it that total plus 16 percent of all of the limited quota adds up to 72 minutes. so this calculation is more similar to how we calculate on this general yeah. so maybe i can help you that so because <laughs> limited quota is done biologically by ontario you have to take that first and make it completely separate from all the general areas i got that and the way that's the way Jeff and you can't, you cannot know, you can't look forward because we don't know how many residents will buy general health licenses. Okay. So you have to look backwards and do an average, which is what Jennifer did down at the bottom. Okay. So right. this is at the bottom, just a straight average. So you just took, because I heard that, well, you could just take the last five years of what we've issued in non-resident general and average that. So that is strictly taking these five years of what we issued as non resident general and taking that average. So in 20, 2017 to 2021, the five year average of those five numbers is 4,320. But you can also do the same exact thing on our table above there for the non resident general that fourth line down. That's what would have been issued if it was at 8416 for general. It wasn't Correct. though, it was based on a 17. Yeah, that's what I said. Correct. I mean, you could have taken those <coughs> and averaged those as to what it would have been and set the five year average of that based on what was issued for actual resident general licenses. Is the 5,036 was the Is that without the cap or with the cap? I said without it. Without it. That's how it naturally worked if we had got rid of the arbitrary capricious 7250 cap. Right. right. And these numbers are based on actual numbers of limited pro licenses approved by the commission, as well as actual resident general licenses. And if you take the five year average of these five numbers, that's approximately 5,004 licenses. No. Jennifer, real quick question. And so one of the takeaways from me, if I'm an outdated, which I'm not, but if I look at this, and so as we continue to see this increase in health populations in eastern Wyoming, 19, 7, 6, and 7, those are all limited quota areas. And so as you continue to increase those permits over there, they may be good if I'm an outfitter over there. But if I'm a general license outfitter, that's really bad for me because you're just shifting the allocation of limited 
for those non-resident permits from the west and those general license areas to the east of these limited quota areas. And that wouldn't change whether there's a cap or not, because it's still going to subtract out that limited quota license out of whatever the total. Now the cap, I mean the 7250. Under the 1684, that scenario, that trend still happens, right? It does, except no, it actually it doesn't. It does. They're completely. That would be. Yep. Yeah, they'd be each one of them be separate. Yes. They'd still get their 16 percent non-resident general licenses mm -hmm. under that proposal. And when, then, if you take it a step further, if you regionalize, it's it's probably a very similar thing. You just have to just be a little bit tweaked based on the region. It'd be a little different in Southeast Wyoming than Northwest Wyoming. The 8416 is set by commission regulations. So if the commission chose to. So 9010? They could, they could choose 9010. Um, or they could say, we're going to list the issue limited quota at 8416. That avoids taking away limited quota <coughs> tags from resident hunters, but they could set a different percentage for non-resident general licenses. And, and I, I think that gives the commission and the department an important management tool because if you regionalize and you say you got, we have two <coughs> times as many elk as we should have in the Iron Mountains or in Eastern Wyoming, they could then issue more non-resident general licenses in places where the, the access is, is, is governed by private landholders and, and leases by out there. Just gives them an extra tool in their toolbox. But that tool has no effect because you can't control where those hunters are going. So most likely, if they're not going to go over there and pay for uh, an $8,000 elk hunt when they can go hunt public land for free. So it's a tool that probably wouldn't work because you can't take those increased hunters and make it a hunt in area six or seven. Unless you do range. Yeah, yeah unless you do range. range. Well, yeah, or, or just statewide limited quota for non resident elk, well, either way. Okay. The other thing with regionalization that would make a difference is if you took any region of the state and looked at the percentage of the ground or the percentage of the number of hunters that are general versus limited quota, it would change around the state, which would change the way that that was allocation to me. So while, we're, so while we're on this discussion, I, I'm really uncomfortable with this whole, whole regional health license. And, and until I see something from the department that shows me what that means, because I don't know what it means, does that mean Western Wyoming and Eastern Wyoming are two different regions, or is the uh, is, is the Bighorn Basin rolled in with, with Jackson Hole and the Wyoming Range? If you get too big, you have no ability to control. And I'm, I'm getting back to the hunter crowd issue, particularly if you increase a thousand more non-resident general licenses. And your regions are so big, you can't control where those guys are going. And I think we're going to exacerbate that crowding in certain areas, and there'll be a backlash associated with it. So I need to understand when when the department talks regionalization, is, is that just area, say, 70, 71, and, and 60? Is that a region? You know, the thoroughfare and the snake, upper Snake River. I mean, what are those regions? Because yeah. if you get too big, you just can't control where all those extra hunters are going to end up. So that if if you're done asking licensing questions, <laughs> <laughs> we'll Thank segue you, into Rick's question. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this this information. Also. Um, I hope everybody looks over this really well. So as Rick is getting ready, I got to brag on your team. I misbehaved so bad at last task force meeting. He showed up at my office, chewed on me, 
and I apologized and promised to be in it today. So he's like John Wayne that he came and just said, knock that crap off, Frank. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so is he the one that renamed your last name there, Pat? Cranky? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I like Pat's version of that story better than my own, so we'll we'll go with that one. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk about elk regionalization with you. Uh, I, I think I can answer a bunch of questions, or at least stir up some more. I think that's maybe what I'll do. But um, I'll just go through this pretty quick. I'm not I'm not going to kill you with PowerPoint. There's only a few slides here, but um, non-resident elk regions is a concept that the departments talk about several times and back in uh, oh, 2011 through 13 we did some work we we developed a white paper which is on the task force um, materials tab and, and that white paper is called an assessment of alternatives for allocating non-resident health licenses that's a, it's a great report we finalized that in 2018 and essentially what i'm going to present today is just a summary of some of the options that we identified in that report. So a couple of reminders, which we've already talked about, but the number of non-resident general <coughs> health licenses is an artifact of the number of full price limited quota licenses minus 7250. So if, if you're an attorney type, the better word is arbitrary. I, I like to put back. Ar ar arbitrary and capricious, yeah. Um, but a, a, a non-resident uh, license holder with a general health license can use their license in any hunter uh, with a general season. So next slide. So I, I apologize, this is a little blurry. This is right from that white paper report. In that white paper report, option four was non-resident um, elk licenses issued in a regional manner, just like we do with deer licenses. And so at that time, using 2011 to 2013 information, we, um, let's see, I don't know how to get the pointer going here. Anyway, we drew some potential regions. The, the, the white hunt areas are limited quota, the gray shaded areas are areas that have a general license. And so the lighter gray areas have fewer non-resident general license holders exercising a, the hunting opportunity in there. The darker gray is uh, a more non-resident general license holders hunting in that those hunt areas. So you can see south of Jackson, uh, quite a few a higher density of non-resident general license hunters going to those areas, fewer in the east side, basically the snowy ranges we talked about earlier today, uh, pretty pretty dark gray, a lot of non-resident license holders using, using their general license in those hunter days. Uh, next slide. So at, at the time when we evaluated this option, we, we took a three-year average again from 2011 to 2013, we took the average of uh, the number of non-resident general license hunters that were hunting in these potential regions with those groupings of hunt areas, and we just came up with a potential quota. Again, this is from older information, but what I wanted to do today was just give you an update based on more recent uh, information. So next slide. So uh, again, this is the, the white paper um, outlines all this, and, and there's a good discussion in there. I think the, the authors of that white paper did a good job talking about pros and cons. I'll summarize a couple of them here at the end, but for a more detailed review of the pros and cons that we identified, that, again, that white paper's got uh, a wealth of information. So next slide. So I, I have Will Schultz in Cheyenne, he pulled up uh, our most recent information. So using 2019 to 2021 average participation of non-resident general elk hunters, we, we redid that map that we had previously done. 
we we use the same regions that we had sketched out basically kind of clumped areas uh by region and kind of light kind of areas for the most part um, you, you could make an ar argument that this grouping is a little bit arbitrary but um, it just shows an example of what regionalization could look like and i think one thing that's pretty interesting is you can see there's a little bit of a shifting you remember in the 2011 to 13 data there was a lot higher uh, density of darker gray in this neck of the woods and that's kind of faded out some of it shifted down here a little bit this still remains a popular area for non-resident general license holders uh let's see if you can go to the next slide So Will created a table and, and we just compared and contrasted that 2011 to 13 exercise with, with current information. These are the, the regions that, that we utilized in the hunt area groupings. And, and we just compared and contrasted and you can see there's some pretty big shifts from some of the hunt areas in terms of where non-resident general license hunters are, are hunting. We talked about it earlier, but uh, they're not using those Jackson hunt areas like they were 10 years ago. Um, and they've shifted to some other places like that Green River 105, 106, 107. Those areas have increased in popularity for non residents. And again, under the current system, non residents can go wherever there's a general license. Um, so I think we'll stop there. But again, uh, a couple of pros and cons. Um, the 7250 again is one, one of the limitations for us is that every time we make a change in a limited quota season, like we just discussed, it does impact the number of non resident general licenses that are issued. So, decoupling those could, could provide us an opportunity to tie non resident general licenses more to a biological need versus just being an artifact of having those two coupled together. Uh, regionalization, just like it does for deer, could help us distribute hunters or regulate that distri distribution better than we currently do. Um, it, it could allow for drawing outs in some parts of the state to, to go up. We, we talked that in eastern Wyoming, access is the, a big driver. And if we were had the ability to regionalize non-resident general elk licenses, we could probably see um, more licenses issued over there and, and increase drawing odds. Um, some of the cons for a non-resident, it takes away the flexibility that they currently enjoy. Right now, if you're a non-resident, you draw a general license, you can go in any general area in the state. So regionalization would, would uh, curtail some of that flexibility. You know, there's always, every year we adjust the deer, non-resident deer regions, uh, we adjust those quotas up and down, and we've seen a tendency in Western Wyoming with those deer regions to be much more conservative, and that certainly could happen if we regionalized elk licenses, but again, that would be the purview of the commission uh, based on the department's recommendation. Some There could be more annual variation in some of those regional quotas. That could be frustrating for some. Um, but I, I think that's that's probably a, a general summary of some of the pros and cons that we've identified. Again, there's a more exhaustive uh, description of some pros and cons in that white paper, but I think I'll stop there and, and answer any questions you might have. Any questions for Rick? Mr. Chairman, just a yeah. quick one. And I, I think you covered this, Rick. I just want to make sure. So, so when we think about the specific criteria the, the regional analysis looks looks solid. Um, when you, when, with regard to specific criteria, which you think the department would use to sort of determine what's the appropriate number of, of, of tags, and maybe that's overall in those areas, is it it's population certainly and how you want to manage that population. And then is it resident hunter density and access to land? Are those the three primary ones? Are there other criteria that I'm not thinking of? No, I, I, I think that covers it pretty well. There'd certainly be the biological component. What kind of harvest could we handle? And then the social component. 
what's a crowding like, what's access like, et cetera. So those those are the components that would go into setting a regional COVID. One more thing that's important to note here, we're only talking for the most part about bull licenses. So the bull ratio is a big, that's a big factor. How many bulls are available? It's not as much about populations as it is about overall numbers. Any other questions for Rick? One, one more, please. Sure. I, and I, I feel almost guilty asking you this, Rick, so maybe I should ask the director. If you, we move to this, give me the magnitude of the changes in, in your opinion, the magnitude of changes in non-resident general licenses. Uh, up probably in the eastern portion of the states, maybe in some areas in the northwest, down in other areas, or? So I'll, I'll go ahead and throw out my opinion, and, and Director Nesbitt can uh, take care of me later if, I, if I'm way <laughs> off base here. But you know, I, I, I think what the exercise that we went through back in using that 2011 to 2013 data was essentially to just to take what where are hunters going now, and and limiting it there, and then making adjustments up or down based on needs. I would say in Western Wyoming. I'm going to say it's mostly going to be stagnant and eastern Wyoming and private land areas where we have general seasons, the number <coughs> could go way up. So, Rick, I'm assuming if we did this, then, then you're going to have to basically the regions became a limited quota, per, no, no different than we do with deer right now. You're going to have to apply for a region, right? And so, I'm just thinking back to a lot of the earlier discussion that we had about how many points it takes for an outfitter to draw one of these general licenses. So it, I'm just thinking off the top of my head here, back to our license prescription services, those 1137 people that use a, uh, uh, a licensing service for us. I think it was one of the gentlemen earlier talked about, these are your high-end clients. I guarantee you they're not interested in shooting four-point bulls in the Sierra Madres. They're just not. What they're interested in is hunting those really high quality areas, either in Laramie Peak in those regions or Northwest Wyoming over there. So it would appear to me that if we go down this road, it's probably going to take a hell of a lot more points to draw a general region in the uh, Let's call it the Cody 55, 56, 59, and 60 general license. It's going to be a lot more demand for that than there currently is under both the statewide allocation. I mean, just knowing the nature of what's growing this, the number of applicants and these application services are doing it. So those units that I would say have a little higher trophy potential, it's going to take a lot more points to draw those general licenses than it is for somebody that wants to hunt in a Sierra Madres down there and is more than happy to hunt for very young age class of bulls. And so those may actually increase and drop down to two or three points to draw. But these general license units are going to get more difficult. Am I wrong in that assumption? But the only thing I'd offer up, and I, I don't know if you're wrong or not, but if you look at um, again, this is just where non-resident hunters were going between 11 and 13 and then 19 and 2021. So this isn't us telling them where to go. It's just where they want to go. Uh, Cody, for example, we saw a decrease in the number of non-resident hunters that are, that are going up there. That may indicate to me that demand is dropped in that place versus um, Sierra Madre's the number has gone up slightly. So I would say demand is, is up there. So if you just look at that comparison, I think this could give you an indication of what the drawing odds may be right now today. Um, I just throw that out for consideration. Mr. Chairman, one, one, one factor to play in, it's just because I personally know it in, in the Cody area, we saw Area 55 went limited quota and it wiped a big, big chunk of general hunters out. I took them. So that's that was a big chunk of those. Yeah, very good point. Some of this is due yeah. to a loss of a 
Yeah. Potentially lost the down season. They did. Yeah. 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 So, Larry, I think the other, I, I, don't, I don't know if we can answer that question, but I think one thing we need to think about when we're pondering that is currently a general area outfitter in Cody is competing for 4,000 gen, non resident general tags statewide. Yes, so as 4, you 4,000 potential clients. As you net that down, and it depends on how the game and fish sets the quota for those regions that would, that would really dramatically affect the drawing. So, back to Rick's thing, though, if we use that as the first time, it's so let's just say, for instance, that's the quote would be higher enough. Well, that's actual hunters. That's not actual success. So, that, so let's say those were so those were quotas, and I just look at that, and, and I just I you know there's going to be some unintended consequences that spin out of here that when we do this that I think people just need to be aware of. There's going to be a lot higher demand for those better trophy quality units, those regional permits. I think maybe there won't be. But I think that's what's driving these license services. Those guys that pay for those prescriptions and can pay $200 for somebody to just log on to the internet and, and, and license for them are not interested. I'm just telling you, they don't want to come to the Sierra Madres. And so I just wonder how all that's going to, you're taking a subset of that 7250 and you're going to focus them into those regional areas. And I, and I don't know, I'm just hypothesizing here that that's going to change. You know, if the, if the real discussion is, is it took five points to draw this year and you're in the thoroughfare or the South Fork or you're over there on the Buffalo Fork or someplace over there, that, that it's going to get tougher to draw those general license hunters. If, if you gave an extra 5,000 permits in the thoroughfare, it'd probably get easier. That's what I'm saying. If, if it's not a dramatic increase in licenses, you're right. So there's, in Larry, you're right. There are so many different factors floating around in here. Um, if you, you might see a lot of these, a lot of these numbers of DIY guys looking at Northwest Wyoming and say, well, I'm, I'm not putting in there because I got a higher an outfit, right? You know, majority of it's wilderness. So you could see them looking at some of these easy access areas and saying, yeah, that's, that's where I want to, I want to go because I can get a tag there and I go hunting myself there. Another factor that just kind of on a side note that would play into the difference between 13 to you know, 11 to 13 to 19 to 21 is at the same time when we went limited quota in 55, we took 10 days off the thoroughfare. So you lost some general season opportunity there. So I think I, I understand what you're saying is. Yeah, the reverse might happen too. Yeah, but you're going to see, I think you're, you could possibly see again, these these DIY guys going, hey, I can draw a tag over in eastern Wyoming or wherever there might be some easy country. Go to the Bighorns. I don't need an outfitter in the Bighorns. I don't have to get chased by grizzly bears. So, no, I think that's a possibility too. And that's exacerbates Joe's hunter crowding yep. issues because they actually, in, well, but if it's a, if it's a limited quote on a regional permit, it's still a set number. It is. Albert? Yeah, yeah, so okay, so <laughs> licensing services 1100, but we know there's yep. substantially more than that out there as well. And so, I'm wondering this is just a question because I don't get it. What's what's driving this? Is it the movie that goes on the internet that shows the big buck or the big bull being killed XYZ and then everybody rushes to that, you know, or is it more regional? You know, so I look at I look at Pine Hill, Green River, West, Green River, East, and I see all, I see a lot of increase there. And I think about the population increase coming out of Utah, right? I mean, you think about all the people, how the front of that whole Salt Lake area is blown up. And where are those people going to go hunt elk? Well, they're going to come to the place where they go fish, right? Which is, is those areas. Is that's but that same thing doesn't seem to be happening out of Colorado. I don't understand the Laramie West versus Laramie East. Why is one dropping so much and one increasing so much? Unless this is driven more by what's being shot on TV and what people's perceptions are. So do we understand anything about uh, why these areas are more popular by out-of-staters now than they were? 
Thorin, could you go back to the map? You know, I think there's a, there's a lot of different answers. I'm not sure that I can tell you for sure. I think if you look at the darker gray areas, again, that's a higher density of non-resident general license hunters. That's very much associated with pretty good public land access. I think that's that's a big driver. It, it's uh, places where folks have access to hunt. Uh, that that's that's big. Um, there's definitely some you know social media gets out. And, and a place is labeled as the hot hunt area and, and folks are, are driven to that. There's certainly some of that plays in as well. It, it'll be interesting that that area two up there will be being general this year. That'll block that whole Eastern area up. Stampede. <laughs> Well, it's it's, base, it's it's for the most part inaccessible. So, any other questions for Rick? Rick, thank you very much. I think what uh, Brian, what's interesting about that map is, and about that chart is that you know that, that example around in northeastern Wyoming, for example, there's only been. There's been basically no change in the amount of, but a lot of it is inaccessible or it's, or it's private land, but the population of elk has, I mean, it's on this word trend, just like, just like a lot of other places. So there's just not a, you know, and, and there's those folks that haven't had elk before and now all of a sudden have a hundred or 200 now, and then they might have them for a month and then their neighbors have them. And then, you know, how that moves around and out there difficult for them to get somebody to hunt um, when it takes three preference points or four preference points for a you know a general you know, somebody from out of state to come hunt that so it's an interesting mix generals too like in the black hills where they have access that's not a small piece of ground right. so moving in and out all the time all right, we're going to move in and transition into subcommittee reports. Todd, if I could, with you and Laura, could I just check in to see if the five task force members that that aren't here today are, are some of them still online? Adam, Jamie, and August. Okay. All right, terrific. All right, uh, we're, as I mentioned before, Jennifer's presentation. We're gonna we're gonna shift some of the subcommittee reports. We're gonna start actually with uh, uh, Joe Schaefer's report, and then we'll move to uh, Adam's report and then Larry's report. I, I think a lot of what uh, Joe's gonna present will will provide some segue back to what we talked about this morning and after, shortly after lunch. Perfect. Sorry, are you able to pull that subcommittee report document up on screen? We've got we've got a computer or a device that's out on our task force website, and if you were following along, I'm going to try to. On the screen. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. Just to get started, so uh,
game and fish department. Um, what happens when we start shifting um, allocations of those limited quota permits with regard to application fees and license fees and all of those things? And then the, the second one is the overall economic impact to the state's economy. Um, we've got you know, some of the data from Wyoga on the, the outfitting side. Uh, that there seems to be or are recognized, and we've heard that there is economic impact on individuals, uh, many property owners who are able to outfit on their property or take trespass fees. Um, you know, there's there's other economic impact that we just don't have good numbers on. I can't really say, but but recognizing that when you do quota shifts, there's going to be some economic impact there. Um, so those are two overarching concepts with our report. Uh, the, the one thing that I think we all agreed on, um, uh, although may, maybe not after hearing some of the comments, but I thought we agreed on, we're, we're, we've got four concepts in here. And the thing I think we were pretty much agree on is that you take any one of these concepts in and of itself, and, and, and it's going to either have limited impact or it's, it's going to die politically. Um, by themselves, there's really not a lot of, of, of weight there. Together, though, there's probably both the possibility to get to the, what did you call it, Senator Hicks, reasonable accommodations, um, but also have a, a more significant impact. And so um, one of the things I think we did agree on as a subcommittee was, is if, if the task force decides to go down this road, we just caution just grabbing any one of these and saying, we're just going to do outfitter um, set aside. We're just going to do 90-10. We're just going to tinker with the, the unsubscribed licenses, or we're just going to do leftover licenses. So keep that in mind, because that is the one thing we, I, I think we felt pretty, pretty consistent on. So the first concept, not surprisingly, is the, um, the limited entry quota splits at the initial drawing to 90-10. Now, you, you heard from our presenters this morning, that states, it, it is true that states, even like Idaho and others, don't have a Pier 9010 at the end of everything. And that's the important, the important distinction here is after all licenses are allocated, after you do all that shuffling, or after you throw in cow calf, whatever, like it says, there's probably not a 9010. What we're talking about here, what this is specifically 9010 at the initial draw only. So that's the first time that we apply for a limited entry unit. 90% of those licenses available to residents, 10% to non-residents at the initial draw only. And so we tried to capture some of the pros for this. Um, so one of those being alignment with, with other Western states, you saw that in the, in the handout from previous meetings. Um, looking at the, the data, just on type one and type two elk, deer, and antelope, this would move about 4,800 uh, permits into residents' hands, and if you're a resident hunter, that's a big number and a, a big deal. Um, and and in some units, draw odds would increase substantially um, based on some of the the data. I think that Jennifer provided a long time ago, or maybe it was from the 9010 bill. Um, there'll be 15 elk areas that would have a greater than four percent increase in draw odds. 32 deer areas greater than 5% and 46 areas that would have greater than 5%. Those are pretty significant shifts for a resident in a limited quota area. Cons of the change though, um, significant uh, negative impact on revenue to the game and fish. And, and as I understand, depending on what happens to undersubscribed licenses, um, that could be at the lowest end, 1.2 million of an impact to game and fish revenues at the high end, $4.5 million impact the game and fish revenues. Um, in, in some units, another con is that draws don't change substantially. And in fact, there were a few elk units, I think, where there was a decrease in draws that, that we, we guessed was a result of landowner tags. Um, but there are um, you know, 62 elk areas that would have less, less than a 4% change, uh, 29 areas in deer that would have less than a 5% and 29 antelope areas. I mean, so, so in some cases, draw odds aren't going to change substantially, even if you go to a 90 10, there's it's just not enough there. Um, and then the, another con of doing this, depending on how unsubscribed resident limited entry licenses are handled, fewer non residents could pick them up, which could decrease um, access to, to property to kill game to you know generate uh, trespass fees and revenues and things like that. So, um, those are the pros and cons of the first concept. Um, 
The second concept that we had quite a bit of conversation on was a waiting period after drawing a high demand license. Another way to basically remove demand off of a limited supply is say, if you draw an, a, an opportunity in a limited entry area, um, you sit out for a few years. Um, and you're basically taken out of the pool for a few years. Uh, the concept we advanced was specific. It says that, that basically you would look at the high demand units so that would be those with a 25 percent or less drawing odds based on the rolling average of the previous three years you draw one of those um and and you you can't apply for another one of those for three years it just takes you out of that that pool um to do that so the pros of doing a waiting period like that is you could remove a significant number of, of applicants especially residents out of the demand side for a limited entry unit um, as, as you go and if it's like a three year waiting period you do that three years you can pull a significant number of, of applicants out which would increase the draw odds in those areas. Um, and it could also uh, reduce some of the resident frustration with that perceived inequity when you hear the guy that threw that 61 animal tag three times in the last five years or whatever it is um, to, to do that. The cons of doing this is it adds a layer of complexity. The game and fish is going to have to figure out how do you calculate which limited entry units would be low demand or high demand. Um, it could add a complexity that could confuse the, the public even more. And probably the biggest con I think that would require some conversation is um, if I'm out of a limited quota, limited entry for three years, and I still want to apply for a limited quota, I'm going to go to the other areas, which could actually drive the draw odds for areas that have been historically good down. So where, where you set that differentiator is you could shift applicants who end up drawing, which means the draw odds in areas that have not had bad draw odds could, could uh, decrease substantially. Um, the third concept is this unsubscribed uh, licensing drawing. So I know we got feedback about we should call them unwanted. We've called them leftover and all those things. Uh, I, I think the subcommittee felt that the best term is unsubscribed. They're just ones that nobody bought. Um, so unsubscribed uh, licensing, and there's sort of two, two thoughts here uh, that, that we outlined. One is if, if we want to give resident hunters preference over the unsubscribed ones, um, then, then we can set a system up and give them preference over that. As I understand it, or as we think, that would require us to kind of move away from what we're currently doing and have a, a resident unsubscribe draw and then a non-resident draw odd. How you handle which amounts go and where, it, gets, it can get complicated. But if we want to give residents a preference, we could, could do that. The pros of that are, especially if you don't, we don't adjust anything in 90-10 or do a limited entry, is that it would give resident hunters something that would show a, a preference or an increase their way. Um, there, there's a bunch of cons of doing that, um, you know, as much as, as we like the concept. Um, you know, if we, if we do those two things, you, you have leftover limited entry licenses that, that are unsubscribed because of lack of public access. And if you give them to a bunch of residents who don't have a place to hunt, we've had this conversation, you don't kill the animals, and there's some other issues that happen there. Um, unused, unallocated license could, could hurt our the game management issues. It's likely where we would hear from landowners that, you know, if, if residents pick up a bunch of unsubscribed licenses that have historically been able to be picked up by a non-resident, five of those non-residents have come to my ranch every year and have given me a thousand dollar trespass fee. And that can start to get significant there. Um, would require Game and Fish to do two draws, uh, could delay delivery of non-resident licenses, um, and, and then would also um, could could make some interesting things with the resident non-resident party applications and the, the leftover draw. The other concept with drawing then, um, uh, if especially if we did a 90-10 and a, a waiting period or something like that, there's something that would shift licenses away from non-resident to residents would be to actually have all unsubscribed um, uh, licenses go into a single draw and residents, non-residents compete. And I think that's what we do right, right now for the most part. Um, and doing that could mitigate revenue loss to game and fish. It could, you know, still sell those licenses, pick them up. Non-residents could, can still get access. Um, and the con of doing that, of course, is there could be resident frustration that they feel like they're on the same uh, playing field as, as non-residents uh, with that. And then concept four, I won't go into it in any type of extent, but concept four was really the outfitter draw, the 40% special licenses. 
again, based on the understanding is that if we move, um, move licenses more heavily to residents and we want to somehow minimize the economic impact to the state, um, if we can ensure or find a way to get more non-residents using a, a licensed outfitter to do that, we'll probably be able to preserve that. So whatever we can do and to incentivize non-residents to contract with an outfitter um, seems to have a significant number of, of increases. I know it's a very emotional thing, but I think the one one pro that really does kind of kind of jump right out is it really has no change on the, the, the resident available licenses. Um, uh, with that, you heard a lot of the other uh, the other uh, pros uh, with that as well. Um, cons, of course, the negative perception, this concept that, that there's this outfitter welfare. Um, and then, you know, downstream, I suppose there's some concept about, you know, maybe losing access to private land if outfitting becomes too big and, you know, and, and we lock that up. But, um, but that's the fourth concept. And I breezed through those, I, you know, because probably should have conversation on them all. But, that, you know, we, we tried to just weigh the pros and cons of these, bring them together. We did not tackle the 7250 or the regionalization. I know that plays into this. Um, but but really wanted to focus on that limited entry opportunity conversation with that. And as I said, you know, we went back and forth. You know, you, you heard from sign some of the the outfitters in the room. We're not going to talk ninety ten until we get an outfitter draw. And I told Sai, I'm not going to talk outfitter draw until we talk ninety ten. So I mean, if we start pulling these out and say let's just do one at a time, I don't I don't think we have much much shot of getting any of them. So I'll, I'll pause there and. Sai, Tony, Josh, I mean, you fill in our conversation and anything you want to add. Yeah, so. I, I would I would just echo what you just said. And I think that's recognizing that uh, the need to do some of these efforts in concert, that they're so tied together, that that's probably something that has to be at the forefront of how we move this forward. Um, I, I heard Senator Hicks earlier mention that uh, I just don't think individually any of these could grow any lakes under them and have some momentum. So, so I, I was going to have, oh, go ahead. You go ahead. All right. So, Joe, on number three, I'm just looking at concept number three unsubscribed licenses. Last meeting, I know Jennifer had talked about being able to timestamp those entries. So, if there was a 24 hour window that, that, gave residents a 24, that first 24 hour window, same time, same draw, same everything. That first 24 hour window that residents had a preference in those, those unsubscribed licenses. Did you guys talk about that? I mean, that wouldn't change anything, but one of the things I see in here is a con. Yeah, well, okay. one, of, one of the other things was to potentially see if that date could be moved forward to May 15th to provide that additional time that uh, the department would need to in processing. Oh, gotcha. But anyway, one of the things that I, I've seen in my area of lots of leftover licenses, and we'll see this year, I don't know that there will be a whole lot of leftover licenses, we'll see. Um, but when it says uh, the resident will purchase license, they will not be able to, from what I've seen, the resident person that's going to purchase one of these leftover licenses is actually the one that's going to have is more likely going to have access. And so where I see that as actually a pro and not a con um, in my area. And that, that, that's just, that's just what I see on that. Um, but other than that, I mean, there's, it, it, it's, with all private land areas, you just never know. Yeah, I, I would say we've heard, it, it seems like we've heard more that we've got residents who are picking up or applying for area permits that they just, they don't have access to. And I think that's one of the concern, you know, it, it compounds it. That, if that's not the case, that's great, but it compounds it. If a resident picks up a tag they can't use, can't kill that animal to manage the herd. And if historically a non-resident had and actually provided some economic stimulus to the economy, that that's the, the the con we were sort of thinking about is making sure that we get tags in the hands of people that can actually use them and i know there's a lot of other strategies how we put the little disclaimers on and, and doing all of that but i think the biggest thing is is one we need to sell the licenses and in some areas we need to we need to kill the game just in the populations if there's a way in that second concept to still give preference to to residents then that's that's a win-win we just didn't get into the nuances of the, the draw Rusty, you had a question. For... Oh, hold on, Tony. Pat, you... Sorry. Pat, and then uh, Tony and Lee. 
Go ahead. Oh. Well, I just wondered, I was just going to ask Rusty, when a, when a, is there a difference in your country with those antelope permits between uh, the landowner charge and the trespass fee for the non-residents and, and, and no fee to the resident that gets the leftover or, or have you noticed anything yeah, so, like that? So what I see, and in, 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 uh, we are talking about a handful of tax, you know, maybe upwards of 50 years or something like that, of, you know, but those are the ones you hear from that they're the ones that send in for potentially three really hard to draw areas, just like 6,000 other people do. And then there's a leftover and they, they want to get that, or they're trying to get their second buck tag, which is probably for another conversation um, because they know they're there. And they think that they should get a second buck tag before, because it's in that allocation of, of the of the percentages, they should be able to, because they're a resident. And they're, I mean, there's, there's a conversation that we had about that too, that they should have two buck tags inside that allocation, then the non-resident should be able to get their first buck tag. And so those are the ones we're talking about and they, um, they have a place to hunt. They just, that's, there's always leftover tags that has been for forever. And, um, and so they don't, they don't put in for it on the second or third choice. They put in for who knows what other, or they're, or they're one of those very few that put in for, um, they put in for a, a party and don't draw. And then during that other part, um, I can tell you that as soon as the draw odds come out, um, myself and Erica and all the other game and fish, Becca and those guys, all the game and fish people up there and they just, and the chamber of commerce just get inundated with phone calls and they're 100% non-residents that just drew the tag and they don't have a place to hunt. Economic development on that. I mean, economically they come and they drive around and they knock on doors and, you know, that's great for buying gas and some hotels, but I don't know if some of them find a place and some of them don't, but it, it, you just can't give a hundred people the same number. You might have a few, but there's not a database to get those folks to the places they need and they're buying you know, in there, and so it's a it's a difficult situation. It's it just is. Sorry. Oh, no, sorry. Pat. Pat. Maps. Yeah, Pat. I'm gonna, I'm gonna push back on this grand bargain idea. Larry's mentioned it. Joe mentioned it. I mean, there's horse trading. That's how this call it. I mean, there are people who want ninety ten. The outfitters want that. The outfitters are set aside draw. I don't know if that's what we're about. You know, the big issue that drove the formation of this task force is should we switch the allocation from 80 20 to 90 10 on deer out commando? That's that's the issue, it's a standalone issue. Um, outfitter set aside draw wasn't even mentioned at the start of this process, but it crept in. But I, I, you know, and, and so we're going to fail if we tie 90 10 and the outfitter set aside draw together, what I heard today, the outfitters want to set aside draw because they think that benefits them, and it does. But they're not gonna commit to 90-10 until they get an outfitter set aside draw and see how it works for a while. So we're not gonna be here three years from now. I mean, I, I've heard significant frustration that we're not moving forward. I, I think we throw Today, we throw, I don't know, I was trying to move this forward, so we throw outfitter set aside to draw. Is, is there enough support on this task force to put that up for public comment and maybe make a decision two meetings down the road? 9010, is there support to change that allocation? And someone put that for public comment and make a decision two meetings down the road, but we gotta move. And we can't now be tying concepts together that are just put together to buy support on this this task force. That's, That's right. I think it's just real quick on that, Pat. And I, I I hear what you're saying. I think everybody hears what you're saying. I will tell you, there's been significant. I don't know about. I mean, there's been people that say you guys are moving way too fast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, anyway, I mean, is yeah, we've seen it, you know, and and, 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 and I and I'm like. 
<laughs> well, today certainly we've we've crept that back, right? So, but uh, but anyway, I, I I get it. You know, we don't nobody in this task force wants to fail. Um, the conversation alone and having this stuff, I, I I'm gonna I actually agree with you on those concepts. Now I may vote no on one because I want the other one to pass first. But you know, I mean, it's I don't know how that's gonna that's gonna juggle out. But I mean, I think there it's worth it's worth trying to move something forward and having that vast conversation about it over the next and taking as much public comment as we can on it. I, I mean, I'm okay with that. But anyway, go ahead, Cy. So uh, as a member of that subcommittee, what, I, what I'm most proud about the work that we did is we, we fleshed out the photos and we fleshed out the ponds irregardless of our positions and how we felt on each of us. And I think Joe did a really good job of encapsulating our discussions. And so, um, when you read that, it, there was no recommendation that came from that subject work. It was merely a starting point to try to move the discussion along as we got, we got here. That'd be fair to say what we did. So, um, one of the things that we did discuss uh, in depth was this leftover draw. And there is a part of that leftover draw where, where a lot of this rub comes from. And I think if we eliminate this one item, then the vast majority of the discussion about this leftover draw goes away. So the 19, let's see, let's see 2018, 2018, compared to now, we issued over 18,000 more animal licenses for the operation. Right? So down to about 30,000 or about 28,000 in 2018. We had a time when we had just phenomenal amounts of animal. We're trying to figure out what the hell to do with these licenses and could get animal killed. So we allow people to, to draw a type, a second buck tag. So I'd like to make a motion. I move that we recommend to the commission to limit all hunters to a maximum of type one or type two, or maximum of one, any type one or type two, any animal types. So we just take that off the table. There's not enough opportunity out there. It's just going to read, it's good. It's going to make it to where we quit picking that scab. That's where the scabs come from on this leftover draw. Not enough resource out there to let somebody shoot two bucks. Let's just let's just do the right thing and say, okay, you get to shoot one buck and you don't know, get the opportunity to do two. Right. Second, third, fourth. <laughs> so I want to a question. Go ahead. So how does this motion differ than than whether we shoot cow moose or shoot doe deer? I mean, is this this is, is this, this is specific to antelope. This is specific to antelope, right? I mean, this is. I get um, that, but isn't this the same? Yeah, this is more about how you only get the opportunity. It's not really the biological situation. The commission's going to issue so many licenses based on the biology, but the recommendation, as I understand it, is just who gets to use that opportunity. I give that litmus test out to every single one of them. So, anyway, I'm not. And so we don't get in trouble. Side so here, your motion is that the task force recommends that we do away with that, but we're going to take public comment on that and finally act on it the next meeting, correct? Correct. That's, that's, that, right. that's the process. Yeah. Yeah. And then, did you, who seconded that the first time? Okay, Pete. <laughs> 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 All right. And so we'll move this. Okay, so any more discussion on this? So the motion was, and you have that motion written down. Basically, it's to it's not allowed, not allow uh, more than one type one or type two antelope tag in a year, in any given hunt season. Um, any more discussion on that? I think Jennifer gave those numbers to us, and I had them in my other book, and and that number has gone certainly gone down over the last four years. With populations really have. Any also so 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 just as a clarification on that side this is after the draw and they're unsubscribed this period yeah you, even if it. there's leftover type ones or leftover type twos and you already drew a type one or type two okay. you know, okay you're not eligible to buy a site right. you know one thing i have and I've, i mean i've watched the commission make changes to this more more often with no farm based on what's needed for wildlife management Bugs. But you know, if we bet if we ever the commission's gonna react to 
of the changes on the ground. If we got back to a position, let's just say this goes forward, if the commission makes the change. If down the road we're back in the business of having a lot of animals again, the commission is going to react to that and the commission is going to add. If we're not selling all of our licenses, which it's not that long ago we weren't, we weren't selling all of our technical licenses, the commission will, will move back to. You know, and, and to that point, I think that's, I think that's great. I mean, I think that's where we should be, right? I hope we, I, I think everybody in here, this whole room hopes that we get back to that in a, in a short amount of time. Um, but is it is it helpful? I mean, right now the department could do that. Is it helpful for us, it's helpful for the department for us to make that motion for you guys to act on? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I don't see any harm in it. I think what's gonna happen is the commission considers this, they're gonna want the department to do a little deeper dive about exactly what the impacts might be. If there's going to be places where we won't be able to sell all the licenses, I think that today, after we just cut 12,000 of them, probably in a lot different position than we would have been four years ago. And then, so I just throw that out there because there could be, the commission may consider information that this task force is not just because we haven't presented it yet. Sure. Even if, go ahead. Even if we soften the motion to recommend as a game of fish to take a hard look at that or to, to look at the current biological or current situation at the end to make that that change and make that you can go back the other way in the future. I mean it's not something to be set so I just don't think it's necessary to recommend a change to the commission. We're never Is Rick King going to come yell at me if I vote for this part? Nope. <laughs> I can only hope. Call yeah. 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 Call the question. Call the question. All right. Okay. Uh, the motion's been made, seconded by, they're made by sign, seconded by Pete. Um, all in favor, raise your hand. All right. Um, can all three online. okay, so you, all three online are also a a high <clears throat> vote. So, can I make another motion while not? No. <laughs> so that motion, so so that motion passed to to, to go to. Uh, we'll put that out for public comment, and we'll let that public comment go through. Is this a real short turnaround? We'll let that public comment go through July to the July meeting. We'll bring that is. Yeah. So that's that's not what we voted on. I, I'm all for get public comment, but I think that what we just voted on was to actually make the recommendation to the commission, not take it out of public comment. No, no we, we were voting to put it up. Yeah. We okay. have to make so sure that's what we have to make three days. I thought I heard side say recommend. Yeah, but we would we still have to take that out. All right. Yeah. Okay. Or is it going to go into public comment? All right. And if you're okay with it because of the short turnaround, by the time we get it out, it's going to be very little time to have public comment. We'll just move it to the July meeting, put that on the July to, to take take or not take official action on that. Um, okay, go ahead, Cy. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. <laughs> I was ready to write it down. Uh, Cy's making motions. I got to make a motion. I I'd say we take a, a straw poll on what the commission thinks about 9010 changing that allocation. So committee, motion, committee or commission? What? You said commission. This committee. Is this out. committee? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I guess to make a motion, my motion would be that um, we direct the commission not to change the current allocation from 84 or 8020 for deer and antelope or change the current elk allocation from 84 to 16. So we leave it alone, basically. Second. Discussion. Second. <laughs> just, so discussion? By, just by itself. Oh, so yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, discussion. I just want to make, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, there were just two points, not really taking a position either way, but I wanted to. Joe brought these things up, and I think it's important information for folks to consider. Number one, 
He's exactly right. The impact financially to the department of any kind of change in allocation is real. However, I mean, that's fixable. It was proven when Senator Hicks wrote his last bill. He sat down with Greg Phipps over there and the boring. And they figured out a way to put to change the fee structure to make it cost neutral. So, so there's a way to fix it. The issue is, is that you got to get the, in this case, the legislature. On my motion, there's no change, so there's no financial impact. But I think it's a, he brought it up. I want to make sure that, that people are clear yeah. that if it, if it doesn't, if they vote against it, that the financial impact is, is not something that it, should stop somebody from not supporting this. Yeah, but that's the financial impact to the department alone. That's not the financial impact to the state. And that leads me to my second point. Okay. This issue for landowners is real, and I'm that concerned. I mean, I've heard more from landowners about this issue since this task force started than almost any other landowner licenses. So I don't have a position or a solution or anything else, but I will tell you the one landowner is just one. That's a real question. What did they say? That those folks that depend on bringing non resident sand and running their ranches for the last 20 or 30 years are either important to the way they run their ranch or are a source of revenue. So they would be supporting my motion. Yes. So Mr. Chairman, discussion. Oh, yeah. Senator Hicks was first. Yeah. So I would disagree with Pat's analysis. So let's let's examine this. So I'm just gonna tell you how it works in the legislature from my experience. And so we we deal with this all the time. Uh, I've dealt with fishing fencing issues that the ag committee came up to real estate. Uh, folks went crazy, and so. They come in and they bring a fight into the legislature. And you know what happens? Only two bad things. Nothing, or it's a win-lose situation and you have enemies. And that's what you create them. So routinely, what we do is we say, you, you, and you go get in the room. And you figure out what you guys can live with, not what you want. And then you come back out if you want legislation changes. Nine times out of 10 when that happens, it's successful. So you get what you can live with, not necessarily what you want. When you bring these battles in there, and, and, and quite frankly, we're very adverse in the legislature because it, it strains relationships, it strains your ability to function. And so quite frankly, because you're gonna pick a side, you're gonna either be with the winners or you're gonna be with the losers. And it creates a lot of hard feelings. And that's one of the reasons that we're adverse to doing that. So Pat's motion. So if we look at what's currently on the table, and we just take this off and say it's done, we're not going to do it anymore. We're talking about removing the cap. That's potentially a thousand more, depending on use your formula, two thousand more non-resident health licenses. There's a perception out there that's going to lead to more crowding in general license areas for residents. Now we talk about the 40% allocation for, for uh, outfitter set aside. Personally, I think those conversations are great to have. I think we need to figure out what works. If you just take this and say this off the table right now, what you basically said to the, to the resident population in the state of Wyoming, we don't care what you want, we've already decided. But yeah, we're gonna keep these alive, Pat. We're gonna keep landowner licenses, we're going to get transferable for damage compensation, we're going to get rid of the cap. All of those things do what for residents? Not a damn thing. You take 9010 off the table now and just says it goes away and that there's no grand compromise and we can't find a reasonable alternative and stuff. Quite frankly, I don't look forward to the battle on anything. It's not our research. And so here's the political reality. Well, I would agree with outfitter set asides. I agree for some level with DOFON transfer of landowner permits. I think we have to compensate those landowners. I'm also very cognizant of who elects me to office. And the reality is, it's the most of those are resident Congress officials. And so, by Pat, by your motion, you just take this off the table. You just drew the line on the sand to bring any of these other proposals to the legislature. But you just made my job almost impossible. And so I'm still looking for what is a reasonable 
solution, not what you want. What can all of the parties live with so we can get done something for landowners, we can get something done for resident hunters, and we can get done for the outfitting and guide. Your proposal destroys every bit of that, in my opinion. With, with all due respect, Senator Hicks, I disagree. I know you do. I mean, <laughs> you're not the guy that's going to be voting on these proposals. Well, but I mean, the last time 9010 came before the legislature, it failed. And 9010 destroys a significant part of our, our economy. I mean, we need bathrooms, we need the revenue. So let me just stop you right there. Just, just one clarifying point. That 9010 bill that came for a legislature resulted in an $8 million increase to the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. You took care of it. It had a 50 50 set aside for outfitters. So it didn't do what you just said it did. So let's be clear it failed. What failed the legislature? And the outfitters, you said this morning, came in and opposed the 50 50 split for the for the um, outfitters. Larry, when are, we gonna, when are we gonna achieve something in this committee? I mean, they're not gonna agree to 90-10. Hell, they couldn't even agree to 90-10 on the big five, which was a no-brainer. <laughs> we took four or five months to answer a no-brainer question. And then there were, there were members of the outfitting community who fought it bitterly in front of the legislature. We have to do something. We can't sit around for five years and wait for a grand bargain. Okay, I believe, it, hey, I believe vote on your motion. I believe 9010 is a bad idea. So I'm making a motion. Let's take a straw poll. Let's see what people think. So, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, thank you. So, I don't always agree with Larry, if that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I do agree with Larry. I mean, I think if we can't, if we can't cut, and I'm I'm not for 9010. Um, you know, I, a lot of this stuff is not even on my side of the state. But if if there's a way we can craft something that does work for everybody, it's like that, I said that that win win. Is there any win win out there? And I think we're getting into that hard discussion right now. And I think every group has to look at themselves and say, is there anything I'm willing to give a little bit on to be able to get a little bit? And, and it's so unfortunate, we've got to the point where people go to the mic and they run down landowners and then they run down resident hunters and then they run down outfitters. That does not breed problem solving. And if we want to solve this problem, we are going to have to yeah. And if not, then we just pack it in, you know, on some of this stuff. I think, you know, I think there's still some of the, some of the landowner, tag, you know, landowner tag stuff, you know, whether you cap and have a landowner draw that, we might get to some of it. But this big issue, if it's not packaged together in something everybody can live with, it ain't happening. It just ain't happening because Larry will bow his neck or I'll bow my neck if I get back in, whatever the deal is, right? And it just doesn't happen. And we get into this all this recrimination thing where we start pointing fingers at each other. So if we if we can't find some meaningful solution that we can all agree on, I just I just don't want to take it, I don't want to take it peacefully. Mr. Chairman. Vote, vote me down. Let's take a straw poll. I call for the question. If there's more discussion, go, go I, ahead, Joe. I, I call go ahead, for the question. Joe. And I think it's worth having discussion. I mean, Pat, Pat said it to start in his, his comments. One of the primary reasons this committee was formed was to discuss and resolve these, these long standing issues with license allocation. This is one of the biggest ones for us to advance a recommendation to do nothing just to say we're moving forward seems, seems to be sort of at odds with, with what we've been called to, to tackle. In this case, and, and I have yet to hear, other than this, the perceived de debate that there's somehow this economic impact to the state by doing this, I've yet to hear a valid reason why we would treat, at the initial drop of limited entry things, why we would treat our residents differently than any of the other Western states that have been having these conversations as well. 
especially when there are solutions to mitigating the economic impact. And that's why I you know, would caution us when we start to unpackage it, call it horse trading if you want, Pat. What it is is good public policy. And when you take all these interests and you find the common ground, like I think a good representative was saying, yeah, not everybody's 100% happy with it, but that's where good public policy comes out. And, and just picking one thing or the other, we just kill everything if we say we're just absolutely not doing this. And so, so I'm, I'm certainly opposed to the motion. I think it's actually shirking our responsibility of a task force to try to address this issue. I mean, I, I appreciate you advancing the recommendation. It is a status quo. It's an, it's an option. Um, I don't think it's the right option in this case. All right. I, and, and I would say that that at this point, voting down Pat's voting this down doesn't do anything for what that continues the conversation forward. And, and I think we're going to do that whether we put it up or put it down, honestly. So I don't think we could stay away from it. So um, go ahead, um, Cy, and then Pete. I haven't been on soapbox since this morning, so um, you know, let the record reflect that the outfitting industry came to the table to fix issues. And I think it, it showed when we made movement on the 90-10 to pick five, that was not just a really, really decision. It was painful, it was hard to do, it was done with absolute intent of showing the rest of the task force, the state of Wyoming, that we were here to, to find solutions. I did not come here to leave this room, face Mr. Hicks again in the session, in one session away, and have another battle. Came here to fix this thing. And our industry came here to fix this thing. And Larry and I have been at odds, we, but we actually agree on more stuff than we don't, which is really weird to me. But <laughs> so the fact of the matter is, is I think there are solutions out here. And I'm not ready to give up on finding those solutions. I really want to hand something to my, my grandchildren and my children that says we fix this thing, not for just a year or not just for a meeting, whatever the case may be, but we fixed it for a long, long time. But I also want to everybody in this task force to understand that we got to quit just talking about 90-10. We've proven to you today that 90-10 is a myth when it's placed in a, an argument that it exists with all of our Western states. That is not true. And, we, and so why are we hung up on saying the word 90-10? You and I have had this discussion. It's quota splits. And so, and why does it have to be a hard and fast number? Why can't it be a number that possibly works different in different areas? And why do we even have to address it at all if there's other things that can can peel off more licenses for residents to take advantage of, such as waiting periods, the landowner uh, caps, et cetera, et cetera. So I I'm not ready just to quit on this issue and, and just just to walk away. I didn't come here to quit. I didn't come here for just to come up with something that a year later you have to go down to Cheyenne and beat up beat up all very again. I just not here to do that. I'm here to find a solution. And that's that's just me. Pete. Uh, I'm not gonna vote for the and, and try to support 90 or 80 20 or whatever. I just think it's too big an issue, but we have to discuss it a lot. We discuss a lot of other things, but I think they're much more mind than this whole issue that people want to talk about. <clears throat> much as much as uh, I I just think it, we need to discuss it more. We owe the public that there was a decision that was cash and all that. We may still come to the same the same decision that we feel right now about it, but we know it to the public. Last comment. I mean, all we've talked about for a year is how to divide the pie. Divide the pie. Sai wants more preference for landowners, or for um, outfitters. Larry wants 9010 to give more tax. The residents, um, we've done nothing on habitat improvement, public access, the, the really critical issues that face our wildlife and truly drive what's important to residents. And so I'll ask all of you, if you vote no, that's fine. I've been slapped down a lot in my lifetime. I'm going to call for the question, but um, where does this end? You really believe the band of black hats and Todd Stevie and all of them back here are going to think of how hard it was to talk to them about going 90 10 on the big five? My gosh. 
my phone ran off the hook. So we're going to just kick this can further down the road, not address the real critical issues this task force should be looking at. And sometime, maybe months from now, Joe and Larry and Sai will come up with some magic grand design and we'll vote on it. We'll all sing Kumbaya right off into the, into the sunset. Ain't going to happen, guys. We need to start moving issues. Last comment. I, I will call for the question. Any other comments? Okay. If you're in favor of, uh, of leaving the uh, percent allocation of deer, antelope, and elk the same as it is right now, raise your hand. Okay, that motion online. fails. Oh, uh, what do we got online? May raise your hand. Uh, Jamie has her hand raised. Uh, Adam has his hand raised. Yeah. Adam has his hand raised. and Lee. And Lee makes five. For eyes and the rest of the rest nose. What's the count, Mr. Chair? Five, two. We're down two. Is that right? Yeah. So there's three on one. So we would be. 11, 11, 5. All right. You yeah. want to continue to the, yeah, go Mr. ahead. Mr. Nope. Chairman, I, I said the first meeting that if we couldn't get a unanimous agreement, I would be a boy for anything. And I pretty much stuck with that. If we can't agree on everything. It just doesn't work. We're, we will be, we'll likely end up back at this position, but maybe it'll make people think about some unique solutions. So so I have a question. I mean, I, and you know, we have all these different things thrown out there in this grand bargain of of sorts. Um, I guess my question, Sai, and, and because you guys had you know a lot of time today, and there's that there is a, a very large economic impact with outfitters, and and what is that number? I mean, maybe it isn't ninety ten, and we know that in the other states it isn't it isn't ninety ten at the it isn't ninety ten at the end. It is but 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 to but to Joe's point, it actually is 90-10 to start. You know, I mean, it really is. And so, you know, those 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 coveted tags, 90% of those coveted tags at the beginning do get allocated, but then they move other things and here and other things here, and it, and it gets to a 80-20 or whatever, you know, close to that. And so what is with what is 40%? What is what's the number that you that, that outfitters across the state need? And, and I can tell you that, that during all of this negotiation, and we'll just put it out there right now, I think we all know that loser is going to be the do-it-yourself non-resident. You know what okay, I mean? so, so we'll just put it right, right out there. Let's talk about that being, being the situation. So, so it, this whole 90-10 concept is about putting the resident on it first. I mean, I've heard that a lot. Mm -hmm. And so why is it so bad to put the guy who pays the majority of the bills not first? Why is that bad versus the thumb guy? I mean, well, that well and that's not, and that's why I'm saying I think, Sai, why, why do we owe that? What, 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 what about the guided, your, what the, the allocation? You know, if we just went back, if we just took away the percentage, what would be the, what would be the numbers? You know, what would be the numbers? Okay, so, you so if you're talking about the industry, you're talking about mm -hmm. where we can get the most bang for our buck. For the residents, was going to draw additional tags, which is what we have to be looking at. Is Tony and Josh and Joe know what I said about that. If we don't fix those draw pots some way for that resident sportsman, their their frustration is not going to go away. And just just because they got three percent better draws for area seven because we go to the ninety ten, they're still going to have to, they're not going to be happy. They're still going to be frustrated. So the waiting period has to be looked at. It has it has incredible amounts of, of valuable ability to fix draws. And it, you can't ship those hunters. So if a guy draws one of these coveted type one licenses, he has to be out of the type one draw because he should not be allowed to go ship and beat somebody else's draw if he wants up. That's happy being in a 90% draw area that doesn't care about very So we need to look at that. We need to look at fixing the draws for these guys. But I've never understood why in the world that, that the commission has always looked at this as, as a complete statewide quota. 
Okay. Why have we always looked at maybe 20 statewide on the non resident license? They have the ability to pick areas and say, okay, this animal area here is, is, a, is a high demand, high public land area, high value to the resident sportsman. Why can't we take that animal area and make it a 90 10 and peel off 40% of special licenses to the outfit industry? You know what happens if you do that? We, we stamp that as approved. Done. That's what we do. And, it, and you don't, have, I, we've always taken I, this approach that we have to look at everything statewide on this 8416 or 8020. And in reality, in Eastern Wyoming, we don't say it, but we have more like a 80 20, 80 license, 80 percent to non residents and 20 to, to uh, residents. So why don't we just do that? Why do we pretend? So what that I we feel like, that yeah, when that's what we do. So I think she has the ability to look at every single unit, area by area, and put a, a formula on that. What we're saying when we throw this proposal up as outfitters is get our buy in when you don't leave us in the cold. You actually increase our market share when you when you let us have some of that special license. We're probably not as far off as, as Pat thinks, to be honest with you. Go ahead, Joe. I, I just wanted to ask a side question. So flip that over. Would you be comfortable with the Board of Outfitters and the, game, the commission looking at area by area determining how many outfitter licenses are available. Sure. And that information is all there. No, yeah. how, how many how many you would get versus another outfitter versus another? Do okay. All... okay, Joe, here's the deal. We're not going to play the allocation game. We're not going to pit each other against each other. We are totally capable of competing with each other in a, in a draw, in that 40% draw. We're not asking for an allocation. I do not want anybody to have to slice up the state and say, all right, we're going to give S and S 10 of these tags because, you know, it's side. And we're going to give this person two tags because, you know, it's him. That's not what we're asking for. We're asking for a special license so that he can learn to draw. And it eliminates that discussion of what you're saying. Now, the State Board of Outfitters can show you the numbers. They can show you how many people are currently taking or go back for our average 20 plus years and lose the people him it's parse that out and, and si i'm not disagreeing with that i'm trying to make a point that if you say but we should look at regions in the state to determine region by region how many non-resident tags we give over here versus over here you're doing that predominantly to benefit either the outfitters or landowners okay so so why not do why not just keep it global across the state and, ha and have it be 90 10 if you, you want to be 88, 12, whatever it is, why, why, why not keep it global? Because if there's areas that have a higher value to the resident owner, which is we literally have 10 filters that have caused this whole Google rock. Not all of them, just 10. You look at the draws and all the rest of the areas which you have, and most of those areas are very easy draws for residents. It's like 10 areas. Same way with that. You take the IG corridor, and that's where it's a sum of different draws. But you go up to northeastern Wyoming, you go to Amalfari 17, you plus the Casper Watch, I don't think it's significantly in it, but it's all it's super easy to draw for the other apps. We have to not just look at it, we have to be willing to look at it area by area across the whole state. Otherwise, we'll just throw our hats in the big six group. We don't want 9010 if you're just if you're not willing to give it an honest look at it. And I think we can do it. That's just what I do. The commission has it, but they have so um, we're going to take a couple more comments and then we're actually going to let everybody stew on this all night. <laughs> and, uh, and then we're going to, we're going to get to something that uh, is a little bit further down the agenda that, cause Rick's not going to be here tomorrow. So uh, did you have something late? Did nobody, nobody had anything? Everybody. Okay. Brian. We're going to stew. Just one thing. So I brought it up. Joe brought it up. I, I do think that there is some real merit in us looking really hard at this whole idea of waiting period. So the reason is, is that it's, it finds some middle ground between where we are now and resident preference points. And that's one thing this task force has got to tackle is resident preference points. Not because we need to, it doesn't matter in my view where it ends up, but it needs to be studied. We need to be able to tell the public and the sportsmen of our state that we studied it. And this is what we think is best. And again, I know, the waiting period, of, I've thought about this a lot of different ways, and I think it has a lot of merit. If I had to make a decision today without any further study, that's the road I would go down as a, as a waiting period for arbitrators. 
So, Mr. Chairman, okay. just so we can advance the ball based on Pat's motion failing and the discussion here, people want to continue. Okay, to move. This <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Mr. Chairman, if there is a grand compromise out there, at least to advance this discussion, what I would recommend right now to stew on for and I'll make a motion tomorrow based on it. Because again, maybe we need a subcommittee to continue to advance this. Now we've got the, we got all these proposals out here that are singular. Let's see if we can't start to craft what may be a reasonable accommodation that, that we can create maybe a win-win. Not everybody's gonna get what they want. Do we need to do that as a subcommittee? I wanna keep this discussion going and keep this issue moving because there's really four issues that are hanging out there that are all tied together, in my, my opinion. How do you guys want to move forward with that? But if we leave here without not giving somebody a job to go out and start to flesh this out and start to bring something that focuses back on what we can do, we know what we can't do. Keep but, but how do you want to handle it? Yeah. Well, I'm curious, the subcommittee that the presentation Joe made, that was essentially what that effort was, was recognizing those four issues and putting them together, recognizing that there had to be some compromise, give and take, and to use your wording, a reasonable accommodation. But we just kind of, Joe presented it, and we've kind of moved into type one antelope licenses, and <laughs> that, that just kind of went by the wayside. But that, that's what that was. Well, Joe said there wasn't a recommendation. I no, no, there, it, there wasn't. But it wasn't. <laughs> and, and by design, because we were all over the board on any one of these things. And that's where at the end we said, you know what? What we realized, I think, and I think even though we'll, you know, we'll, we'll argue, I think at the end of today, call it horse trading or not, but good public policy is going to have to find that win win that you talked about, Representative Summers. And that means you got to pull all these things together. I think if you want to move odds in some of these areas, you got to look at waiting periods and, and allocation. You want to save some of the economic stuff, you got to talk about how you shore up the outfitting industry. You want to talk about how get, getting the, all the licenses sold, and you got to talk about the unsubscribed or leftover draw. You just can't. I, I don't think we, if we start parsing them off, I mean, I, I don't think they get anywhere. And so maybe that's where Pat was going. Let's parse them off, vote them down, and then get on to, to habitat management mule deer. And maybe that's where we get better better traction. But But... But I, I would be, I would say we could come back with recommendations on these. We wanted to start it with, hey, let's just be objective and say, here the pros and cons. Where do we want to land? So I think what, at least we haven't talked really good about when we were making the agenda that, that we left some time for tomorrow to, to continue this discussion. I think we can, we can continue this discussion tomorrow um, after everybody thinks about it and be a lot of thinking i know but i i think it's going to continue to i think we need to we owe it to the people that put us on this task force to deal with these problems to to dig into this more i really do believe that so brian i, I got a question for you in regards to waiting periods do, do you think at the same time that that conversation could also involve or should involve the reduction of party permits in hard to draw limited quota areas from six to, to maybe two or three? Yeah. I haven't really thought about it. Um, yeah, I think we should discuss it. I guess, you know, at the end of the day, it's still, it's just about all that question is, it's not about more or less licenses. It's just about as to whether, how big a group you want to let all draw or all fail. You know? It's, so I, I don't know. I don't have to know. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and, I, and I, this goes back to something Cy said. And, and I'm one for more authority to the commission than less authority, which puts the monkey on their back, right? But I mean, there's ways to look at this that I don't, I'm asking the subcommittee if they look at this idea. So, you know, you could give the commission a range, right? Okay, 90, 10 to 80, 20 in any given area region. Um, and then you can go up to 40%. You know, this is legislation, right? up to 40% um, set aside for uh, outfitters and the non resident. And then you allow some of this negotiation and whatever else might 
need to be in that package. But you allow some of this negotiation to take place at a more regional or unit area to decide to decide these things. And I know that's no, you know, there's no confidence in that for President Hunters. There's no confidence in that for outfitters. You know, the you know, it's but is there um have, have you guys looked at anything like that? And the reason I asked that is you kind of brought that up, right? But, you know, I, I'd say in fairness to the work that we did as a task as a subcommittee, uh, in the amount of time that we had, I think we get a we got a couple amount of work fleshed out, but we were just scratching this, just getting started, started in essence. And what we were hoping to do, in my opinion, was bring back the work that we had fleshed out to you guys to show you what you know, so we weren't beating up the same pros and cons, and then send this back to the drawing board to really work again. Am I wrong? How do you do you, you that? Yeah. Larry, why did you bring a bill? As I read the regulations, this is all commission set. Why what? Why did you bring a bill to change the allocation to 90 Mr. Mr. Chairman, that's three years old past history. We need to move on. I mean, I, I'll, just, I'll just discuss that, but I think, you know, Pat, that's a discussion between me and you. That's, I mean, I don't want to waste half an hour time when we've got this issue. I, I really want to get this issue of this subcommittee and the specific recommendations. Of, so I'll talk to you later, Pat, but right now I think it's more important we continue our focus on this. Mr. Chairman, I think what we really need from the subcommittee is to come back with three proposals. One that may be weighted a little more towards industry, one may be weighted this way, and one may, and maybe it's a combination. I just know we don't have an absolute concrete proposal in front of us. Or maybe they bring one proposal and then we work on the edges there. But I would like to see what what what's the concept of a grand compromise. What, what's that look like? I think you've got the framework, you've done the pros and cons, but you know, just we need to move this issue. And, and I would like that group to come back and say, here, here is a, you know, whatever you want to call it, horse trade in a reasonable combination, compromise. I, I think Pick the that, terminology. Yeah, yeah I, and I, I appreciate that. And I think that I think that's the direction you're gonna get. I I my, I think I'm not gonna get into what Pat asked, but sort of. Is that is this recommendation you're bringing? Can it all be done at the department level? No. Okay. Uh, Dwayne, one one comment I'd like to make. I, I voted for Pat's motion. Thank you. I know that I know <laughs> I the you, I know the impact it's going to be on the outfit right. industry, and I know the impact it's going to be on the landowners. But probably one of the biggest impacts is going to be. The communities in this state that are going to be affected by that kind of a change. And that's not represented in this room. And somehow we need to give that um, well, it, representation. Yeah, and I think that there's, to, to your point, that, that Pat's motion failed isn't because it's not because of the motion, it's because of the, no, just kidding, not the bringer, no. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> it actually, is the conversation that we want that that at least at this point we're going to try to get something bigger together because we know that they're they're all tied together it has nothing to do with we don't agree with that statement because i think that i agree with that and i've been to a lot of these small towns as we all have and we all understand that so i think that there's there's a way to to, to work through some of those things and it may be it may be uh it may be a little bit more complex than we think but I don't, I don't, I think the intention of the, of the committee is to, to find a, a, a more grand compromise that, that maybe does take into account, um, certainly takes into account industry and small communities. It takes into account hard to draw areas and it, and it takes into account, um, you know, maybe a waiting period, but, but maybe more, uh, I would say management in some of these areas differently. Like I said, and, and like like Joe said, I, I mean, there's probably ten areas in elk, and ten areas in deer, and ten areas in antelope that if you carve those out, they would be probably where you guys want to be. Probably fix the whole thing. Yeah, 
Exactly. But so, and I think the other part of that is that you, you hit on it, Dusty, the, the complexity of this. You, you move forward on a couple of these issues and then you, you still get back to the type X license, the removal of the 7250 cap, the, the transferable type six licenses. And those have direct impact on all of these things that we've just been talking about. And it changes the dynamics of all of that. And, and I think that's exactly where you were headed with this is that they are all tied together. And to just flesh one out, I just, I don't think that's wise. Who's on this? Me. So myself, Joe, and Tony. Um, how about throwing Adam on there or a sports team representative and do exactly throw Larry on there? Uh, they don't want a bastard step stepchild on there, Larry. Um, throw, throw another member on there, have him do it. I, I don't disagree with what Larry suggested. But let's let's see if a grand compromise is available. If not, let's move on and look at half the path and other issues. Tony, from my standpoint, with you know when we went through this, I mean there there's some huge. You can't just say, well, we're going to do this. We recommend you do this when there are so many different factors tied together, and that's why we went through with with the pros and cons of the of the four factors that we identified that needed to be discussed and discussed in detail and, and from my standpoint i didn't feel comfortable by saying i want to see the 90 10 regardless or i wanted to keep it as is regardless or uh i wanted to you know i mean i thought you know we, we talked about all of these things and i thought you know the the waiting period for area seven would be a great thing it would be a super thing to solve a lot of the problems with the elk hunting in Area 7. You wait three years, I don't think too many people would complain because there's people who, you know, they don't get a bull permit in 30 years. So a waiting period would be a good thing. And then we, then we thought, well, you know, maybe a con would be if those people that didn't, you know, they're in the waiting period, they're going to maybe go somewhere else and cause a change in the, the draw odds in a in another hard to draw area. And so maybe that's a that's kind of a consequence that, that could happen. And so we, we thought we need to talk about these things and flesh them out and get some get some feedback from everyone here rather than the four of us. Well, three and a half, I'm the half, but you know that that's why we did it the way we did and didn't come up with you know some grand scheme. That we're just going to throw out there and have everybody you know we thought here are some things that we want to address let's take a look at them let's hear from what everybody thinks let's get some feedback and and then go from there and that's that was the purpose of, of what we did and why we didn't just come up with you know four or five or six different proposals that we wanted everybody to to look at we, we thought we'd hear from everybody with what we had this you know what we wrote down and and came up with and then go from there. So I mean, we don't we met not to come up with a grand scheme. And I, I you could put seven or you put all of us on the grand scheme. And are we going to come up with anything? Mr. So. Chairman, I don't want to see my colleague here on the task force undersell himself. He's three and three quarters. <laughs> I'll try it out. <laughs> well, well let, let's move forward with this. Uh, Brian, with the hey, idea I just want to make of, sure, Brian. Just a quick one. I think it's important to, you know, to say publicly, look at who Donald Casper is doing. And I think that, you know, he mentioned that we need to make sure we're representing the people that are impacted in small town voting. I mean, we've got four legislators here that are from the smallest towns in Wyoming. And then we have three county commissioners that are elected. That are from bigger towns for the most part. Well, well I'm a small town. He's a small town. But, you know, we got Gillette and Cove. And then we got Bags, Shell, Devil's Tower, Pinedale. So, I mean, I think that um, the members that got here have an opportunity to really think about those local folks, small town, Wyoming that are impacted. Obviously, you do. You live in Matizzi, <laughs> not even really in Matizzi. Yeah. And so I, I just don't want to short sell the. The ability of this group to be able to look out for those other folks that are that. You, you know, the one thing I'm so struck by, and I knew it coming in, but is how different Western Wyoming is from Eastern Wyoming. I mean, it's just like night and day. I mean, it's yeah, just 
totally different issues, totally different fights. It's uh, amazing. Yeah, and, and there, there is no one size the fits all. There, no, there is. Not all. Oh. Yeah. The, I would also encourage you, we saw all the other states there, and you know, we all thought, well, ours is so complicated. Ours is the most complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was probably one. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we shouldn't try to make it so complicated that we try to solve every single problem. Because we're not going to be able to do that. Sometimes we have to be more general. Some of going to be winners and going to be losers no matter what we do. But we're going to hamstring ourselves if we sit there and, and worry about every single thing. It's not that we have been able to fix. You know, every single area we're going to have to adjust because it's a whole small kingdom. I mean, we can't do that. We have to understand that these people applying for these lights, some of them, the reason they get these services is because they can't understand it. So I just think we have to step back a little bit and when we're thinking about solutions or whatever, and just trying to be more general and simple and, and not so picky on every single subject. We're never going to get anywhere. Okay, we're going to move on. So, um, thank you all. Great conversation. So, we're going to we're going to move into um, the horn hunting discussion regarding the permitting and philosophy because Rick's not going to be here tomorrow. So, we're going to let him give an intro to that, and then um, we're going to take some public comment after this. That might be interesting too. Um, but uh, and then we'll we're going to call it a day. Well, as long yeah. as Rick's not horn hunting tomorrow, that's okay. <laughs> but if he's out there horn hunting, we call it that. We clarify Go that. ahead, Al. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, the, re the reason I brought What's this up uh, is because every year after the first two days of the season, hey Albert, will you hold on a second? I don't, I don't think I people can hear on that. On that. Oh. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you. The reason I brought this up in order to hear the words every day after, or every year after the first two days of horn hunting season, I get calls on on issues, and it's mostly the influx of out-of-state people into my, into our area, and the overcompensation for horns, and who owns the horns, who doesn't own the horns? Is there anything we can do? The, you know, the idea was brought to me. Can can we delay? Can we delay the out-of-state season five to ten days? You know, um, should should we be charging for horns? Should we be licensing? All these things come up, and so I just wanted to have an understanding of what what's what we're doing, what's available to us, and, and hear uh, a little discussion amongst this group of what we might be able to be getting in. And I'm sure Josh, where he sits, sees. The same cars that I see on the. And I would like to be able to ask, just ask the question: Do, do you find that this has worked over the last few years? Because I, the, the consensus I have gathered is, we already had the tools in place with the winter range that we have, and that there are a lot of areas, particularly in southwestern Wyoming, where it's very hard to enforce. And do we find that it is worth it? And is there ever a point where we say, boy, this really is a lot more than we thought. And maybe this wasn't a good idea because that concentration of people all at one time, especially a couple of years ago, coming out of a bad winter, it was probably far worse of an impact than what we were trying to alleviate. So I think, I think those are some of the considerations that we should probably take into consideration to discussing more. In short, I will just tell you the places where it's been implemented. It's worked to decrease a whole bunch of people out there harassing big game animals and you know, it's worked for that. It's come with a whole set of problems. And I was right, there's a lot of complaining and, and people that are concerned about you know, people that are cheating. Yeah. Um, being overregulated, we hear that. Um, but in general, I mean, I was there before, I was there after, and it's changed. We don't have people running all over, like masses of people running all over the winter range south of the in the middle of the winter when those critters don't need all those people up there. And you know, the thing, Rick's going to talk about some of the history here, but the thing that people confused a little bit in a lot of the past discussions was that it was focused on targeting people who were out there intentionally harassing big game. There were already laws on the books to, to deal with that. 
it was mere presence that was displacing game that was creating um, situations where they were using biologically it wasn't good for them because they were using more of their fat reserves than they needed to during the critical part of the year to that you know this where we've done it it's it's been good do you think this line west of the continental divide has worked? That went away. Yeah, that, that's not the outside 25. However, and Senator Hicks is still mad at me about this. It doesn't, <laughs> it's, we haven't implemented it everywhere where we could. Um, let me just say this, the Bitcoin base is there is uh, not a tremendous amount of public support for Regulation. Um, at least we haven't seen it at this point. We've taken it out and have it. We got places, the legislature gave us the authority to go everywhere west of essentially west of I 25. Just the one other thing I want to reiterate something that Brian said. You know, before there was any regulation, there were people with uh, snowshoes and dogs hunting horns and moving deer in the middle of March when those deer didn't need to be run around. And it would be, if you went back, it would be even worse now because people picked up this horn thing. And so you'd have people from Salt Lake coming up there with horses in the middle of that winter range. And just, I just, people have no common sense. <laughs> that, that's really the problem. <laughs> So yeah. one of the things that's exacerbated down in our area is that once Wyoming implemented ours May 1st, it used to be no season in Colorado. So all of them were down in Colorado down there. Once <coughs> Colorado implemented a season two, we're seeing we're seeing more people come and camp out and stay in motels. And as all the states kind of start to narrow the season, you can actually walk hunts out. Or cons, it concentrates these guys a lot more, it seems like. And also, the walk with me, we talked about trying to, to coordinate with the states to surround the state of more. That's something we have brought up. Right? So, we all open at the same time. We don't have people chasing different areas. We have to just change it with less pressure. But I don't know what that's going to be. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. You guys covered a lot of ground that I, I'll just uh, reiterate several things that have already come up, but um, thanks for the opportunity to just uh, kick this discussion off. So by way of some background, which we already covered for the most part, but the, the department and sports persons really um, started to see a lot of folks on the winter range, uh, clear back in probably really beginning in the mid nineties, especially that's when it seems like antler hunting really started to boom. Um, the, the, the price of antlers was pretty significant. It, it was kind of a growing trend to be out there and pick up antlers. And in the 90s, the department and, and sports persons saw all those folks on the winter range all winter long. And we put together a committee, worked with our constituents and, and discussed the issue. And we went to the attorney general's office and in 2003, actually, Mr. Crank provided an attorney general's office opinion to the department uh, regarding shed antlers. We we initially uh, thought for how to use the word. I'm sure it was. I don't remember. At, at any rate, we well, one of the things that we really focused in on in those discussions was the fact that just the presence, like Brian said, of all those folks on the winter range all winter long was a significant impact to wintering big game. And, and so we looked at what authorities and abilities that we have to reduce that disturbance on those winter and big game animals. And like Brian mentioned, we have harassment that's already on the books, but we didn't have anything to regulate the collection of shed antlers. Went to the attorney general's uh, office, got an opinion from them that the, the commission at the time did not have the ability to regulate the collection of shed antlers. That was in 2003 that uh, we got that opinion and then over the next several years that the discussions continued the the pressure on the winter ranges continued to climb and in 2009 the legislature uh, created a statute that gave the commission the authority to regulate the collection of shed antlers 
and then in 2010, with that authority, the commission promulgated a rule, Chapter 61, uh, for uh, the, the regulation of um, uh, collection of shed antlers. There's been a few modifications to that regulation and the statute since then. Um, in 2017, our trespass statute was modified to include, in addition to being a violation to hunt or fish or trap on private land, it also became a violation to uh, trespass to collect shed antlers on private land. That, the legislature made that modification in 2017. And then in 2019, the legislature expanded the, the portion of the state where the commission has the ability to regulate uh, the collection of shed antlers. So I'll, I'll read you the current version of the, the statute. It's in um, 23.1.302. So it says the commission has the ability to regulate and control the collection of shed antlers and horns of big game animals for the purpose of minimizing the harassment or disturbance of big game populations on public lands west of I-90 from the Wyoming Montana state line to Buffalo and west of I-25 from Buffalo to the Wyoming Colorado state line anytime during the year. Um, so that, that's the current version of the statute. And right now our, uh, Laura, can you go ahead and put that map up? So right now our commission regulation prohibits the collection of animals uh, collection of shed antlers on public lands uh, from January 1 through 6 a.m. of May 1. We internally we've had a lot of discussions about how this is working and I think as Brian, as Director Nesbitt mentioned, in terms of keeping people off the winter ranges and disturbing big game animals, I, I think it has helped. Now it does create this great big giant mess on May 1 where there are a lot of people that are ready to go May 1. But, but really by that time, for the most part, critters have moved off the winter range. So all that disturbance that happens on May 1 is more of a, a social uh, problem than, than, a, than an issue with wintering big game. Our, so this, this map that we just put up, that, that current red line is the area where chapter 61 is in place, but the statute does give the Commission the authority to regulate from here up, up to the state line. West of that. West of that line, correct. correct. So um, enforcement wise, it, it's a it is a big work demand on our folks. You know, from the time amber start dropping until 6 a.m. on, on May 1. Well, actually, till about the next day, May 2nd or so. It's a huge workload for our folks to respond to. To calls about people picking up shed antlers and, and to try to try to stop those folks who are out there on the winter ranges illegally picking up antlers. Huge workload. Um, there's a lot of money involved in, in antlers. I, I was going to throw us a picture, but it, it didn't come through. But uh, at the antler auction this past weekend, there uh, a, a moose paddle, just a, a good nice moose paddle, that was was going for 250 on up to 400 bucks. That's just for a single side of a, a moose shed. So there's a lot of money involved. A lot of folks are motivated by that. And, and that, of course, makes the enforcement effort for our folks pretty tough. But for the most part, the enforcement effort is right up till May 1 or May 2. And then once once folks are out there and can legally pick up antlers, the, our workload in that regard drops off. And our, our concern for the most part largely drops off because critters have moved off the winter range. Um, uh, just a couple other things I'll throw out and then I'll sit down and, and let you have the discussion. You know, there has been talk about uh, charging a fee. Uh, this, this would be a good question. I, I think that the legislature never really intended for the department to collect a fee for licenses. This was really about minimizing disturbance to, to the big game, but, but of course, so the, the statutory authority is not there for us to charge a fee. And, uh, Again, I think if, if some kind of a license uh, was required, I, I think the workload and concern and the expectation from the public would then be that that, that would be enforced by our guys. And I think that would extend that workload way past May 1, which um, is just something for us to, to consider. So I think with that, unless Director Nesbitt, do you have anything else to add? 
there's two things. One is, is that I don't remember the year 12, 13, somewhere in there. Um, the Board of Land Commissioners approved it to be a law on the regulation on state lands. And then, you know, the, this whole discussion in Alabama about ownership, legal ownership of a bone, once it falls off, it will lie down. The, the position that we've taken at this point is that it belongs, as soon as it hits the ground, it belongs to the landowner, whoever that landowner may be, if it's the federal government or a private landowner, then they own that. So I, I think that's that's important. You know, we manage live wildlife. Um, parts of wildlife once it falls off, unless it's on a school plate. Um, this whole, I, I don't have a good answer as far as the, we have to probably seek an attorney general's opinion as to whether it would be legal to um, have a resident privilege for the season. I don't know, it's, it's mainly federal land, so I don't know what the legalities there would be as far as being able to say, you know, create a warning statute that says, if you're a resident, you get to hunt antlers starting May 1. If you're on resident, you can't start till May 10. Rick, has there, has there been any overlay of migration corridors that are known and designated uh, with to how this map is? And, and my concern is that uh, folks have figured out in my country, like where the tables and steamboat is, that they know right where that line is. And, and certainly for the intent of this for big game wintering herds that are still vulnerable, Folks, they, they know exactly where they can be and where they can't be. And it's right in the middle of that. Yeah, so I would say that, like Director Nesbik said, we, you know, the area where we're currently regulating the collection of shed antlers isn't perfect. But in the past, when we've taken this out to expand it more, we get pretty mixed results. I, I'd say the public, some, some members of the public would be very supportive of us expanding that area for regulating shed antlers and, and others are, are not. It gets pretty complicated. This uh, this uh, current map that, that we're operating under in the regulation, I, I think has really good general support now. It doesn't say we shouldn't revisit it, but right now this has very good public support. One thing I'd say is for the most part, our folks on the ground feel like the locations where the antlers fall off most of the critters are gone from there by May 1st because they're losing, you know, especially here, they're losing them in winter, January, February, somewhere in there. And by May 1, most of them are not sitting in the middle of those winter ranges anymore when they drop those antlers. Now, that's not to say that there aren't any, you know, deer further up the migration route that shed some antlers there. Now, the, the tail end or the furthest south deer are now moving through that area. But, you know, on most years, that's not a significant. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I guess my question is, is can you seek an attorney general's opinion on, uh, on whether you can delay that out-of-state rush? Because it's become enormous. It's just we can. Yeah. part of that, we ask whether we can have a, a, a fee charge, <coughs> a license for that, and then a differential fee for that. Assuming if we could charge anything. But what I deal with down in my country is what I call the professional horn hunters. And these guys go from Arizona to New Mexico and just work their way up, you know, work the edges of the national parks, the Indian reservation, the migration is crucial, whatever. These guys do it for a living. Checkerboard. They know yeah. the checkerboard. You know, they're out on the checkerboard still in April. You know, they've got their GPS, everything. While then, so one of the suggestions was is if, if they're truly just profiteering on this, <clears throat> say the vast majority of residents are recreational horn hunters and they find them. I mean, they're, they're out there for the money, but they're not professionals. They've got jobs. This is a weekend warrior type of activity. There is a, a professional industry in the West that does this for a living. And, and the, the question I keep getting all the time is, is well, can we charge?